Yo, yo. What up, chat? How's it going, guys? Hello, hello. Happy Friday. Hold on one second. Had to dis disable the preview monitor. What's up, everyone? How's it going? Hello, hello. Nimi, good morning, status. Hello, hello. How are you guys? The Hutry, what's up, dude? Nix, hello, hello. Bruno, what's up? Cowface, dude. Hello, hello. Exni, ex, ex, Exni, oh, gosh never say your name right eggs nihilio i think <laughs> hello hello how's it going guys what up everybody hello 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 i don't know what that is oh i see i see i see uh yo what up cran how's it going buddy willamock how's it going flying wookie z what's up guys suiji bruno how is everybody i immediately am being told to stand so let's go ahead and do that word we're standing you know i should make it so like it, it auto re it auto resets <laughs> you're just making me have to like keep apply or uh keep accepting your your emotes cran i got some tea over here I'm trying to get my tea ready i like spilled half of it all over the fucking house while i was trying to walk over here the ladder wasn't even an emote yeah that's true you're not wrong. I don't know. Twitch's mod is sometimes weird. But what is up, everybody? How's it going? Hello, hello. Happy Friday. I hope you guys have been having a good week. Kicking week. You know, not too terrible. Um, Yeah. What's up, Z? How's it going? Uh, Does not... Does it not like the word troll? I guess not. Yeah. I guess not. I'm not sure. Late night with a client last night, the migration to the cloud for their app failed because they didn't test the login feature. They didn't test the very first. <laughs> hey, man, you know, we all make software differently. That's all I can say. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to say about that one. That's uh, unfortunate. <laughs> and seems like they probably didn't write much down of what they actually wanted to accomplish. If that's the case. But I'm sorry to hear that, bud. That's uh, it's never fun. Is it plugged it? You mean is it plugged in? Is what plugged in? All right, guys. So for today, I have a lot. I uh, I have a lot for us to do today. So uh, from last stream, uh, you're fine, Wookie. You're fine. Um, from last stream, I sat down and I really analyzed everything. Um, I messed with Tecton a bit more. Uh, I I messed with Temporal a bit more and. You know, I'm not going to lie. I'm I'm super interested in seeing how Tecton works out. Uh, all right, Bruno, have a good one, buddy. Good luck with your meeting. Um, but I I am super I am super interested with just like the progress I've made with it so far. Um, so let me let me show you guys um essentially what what I've done. So uh, one of the things is is we need to finish implementing our new recording pipeline CLI tool and integrate it within Tecton pipelines uh, and integrate it within Tecton pipelines. That's essentially what we're doing today. So to give you guys a little bit more detail, uh, recording, hold on. I fixed it. <laughs> All right. So let me show you where we're at. Okay. So um, I think last time I made a chart that kind of shows uh, what we're trying to accomplish here with Tecton. Dude, thank God I didn't actually have to write Tecton in today's go live notification on Twitter. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have asked. Did I wait? Did I say Tecton or did I say Tech Talk? Oh, thank God. <laughs> I was about to be very embarrassed. Okay. All right. In the agenda. Did I say it in the agenda, dude? 
Oh my god. Why do I it's it's just because it's so a thing now, you know what I mean? Portal work. <clears throat> Today. No, Tecton. What agenda? Oh, you mean oh, you meant in the agenda that I'm writing. Oh, okay. I see, I see. Okay, so uh where did we last leave off? So last stream we talked about how we could use Tecton uh, for generating all of our pipelines and things like that. And the main, one of the biggest goals of using Tecton was uh, to be able to lean on the step-by-step -step process that it kind of naturally supports, right? And we said like, okay, well, you know, we want a Tecton pipeline that runs the following tasks, right? Every pipeline runs a convert, it runs an archive, it could potentially run a clean or a verify or things like that. Um, and this is all running in our own, you know, in our own infrastructure. Oh, that's hot. Um, and so on our own Kubernetes cluster, right, we install Tecton, uh, we set it up, and then we uh, also create uh, what are uh, tasks and um, not just tasks, but also uh, pipelines that contain those tasks that we want to run. And so the whole idea is, is that uh, we have two main processes. We have our Tecton processes, right? Everything that runs the jobs and does everything that we need it to. But then we also have our cron, right? Now, the cron is entirely the entry point for all of this scheduling, right? Um, we have to ask ourselves the question, if I'm doing some type of, you know, pipeline-driven automation, uh, what's going to trigger that pipeline, right? Like something something has to trigger it. If we weren't using pipelines and we were just using like Rabbit, right? Then then in the same sense, something would have to trigger Rabbit to to render these or to, to convert these or do whatever, right? Hold on one second. Let me throw away this tea bag. So yeah, so we need some type of entry point, right? We need some type of entry point to be able to tell our pipelines what they're going to run, right? Um, and so this cron is designed to run like every, you know, night or at two out, whatever, like whatever it's meant to run, it's it will, it will run. Um, and so what will happen is this cron will, at a certain given time, go out to the production chair right? And then it will look for any type of uh, convertible files in a path that we give it, right? So we're going to make it so that we can configure this cron and tell it, hey, you know, you can either look here, or you can look here, that that part is customizable, right? So we're going to make sure that we have a customizable path that we can give to this cron. <clears throat> Once we give it the path, the cron starts, and it checks that path for any of the files. If it has any files to process, Right? It's not going to just process them right then and there, but it's going to schedule Tecton pipelines for each one of those, uh, each one of those to process. Right? And so what's going to happen is, is the recording pipeline is then actually going to go out to the Kubernetes API, right? and it's going to say, hey, I've got an N number amount of files to process, right? create pipelines for those. Now, this is all driven by Kubernetes. So there is no like queue system, right? And we talked about how we don't want to fire off, you know, tons of different tasks uh, or, you know, basically we don't want to just flood our network uh, because we have like 20 different things that we want to process. So in this case, what we also are going to have to do is, is we're going to have to create a reporting pipeline operator, right? Now, the difference here is, is this would be like rabbit, right? Like, again, if we weren't, following through trying to use Tecton, this would just be rabbit. Like this would be rabbit, this would be rabbit, this would be rabbit, and then these would be like rabbit workers, right? So it's it's not super off in the sense of like how we're doing things. It's just we're doing things a bit more Kubernetes centric, right? Yo, Ambulant Bunny, hello, hello, how are you? Um, and so yeah, um, the main goal here is is that we want to try and create an operator that's going to do really what um what rabbit would right and so we said that we have like hard limits on things we want to be able to only run three of our 
uh, three of our conversions at a time, and then three of our uploads at a time, right? And we could actually probably run more, um, but that's just to make sure that we don't like DDoS the shared drive or things like that. Uh, I'm good, glad I could catch a stream. Well, hey, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, I hope I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> I hope you do. Um, and so yeah, um, once we hit the Kubernetes API, this recording pipeline operator is going to watch for those changes. Now it's only going to watch for the changes regarding the specific Tekton recording pipelines. But in the future, this might be something where this is actually really more of a uh, Tekton pipeline operator. And maybe maybe we even call it that. Like maybe we don't maybe we don't do that. Maybe we say, all right, well we'll make this Tekton centric uh, and then we'll make it so that it knows how to handle recording pipelines in it. But the TLDR is is that to prevent us just spamming our infrastructure with a bunch of different pipelines at the same time, right? Again, in this circumstance, this is like we just published like, or we just upload, or uh, we just, you know, uh, uploaded like nine files that we want to convert, but we don't want to convert all of them at once, right? We don't, we don't want to convert all of them at once. Um, and so, what's going to happen is, is once we send all of them to the Kubernetes API, they're going to be set in a pending status, right? And the idea behind that pending status is they're not actually going to get started; they're just going to be pending. It's going to be the operator's job to then set them to running. So. This is why I'm saying this is essentially kind of like what we would be doing if we were using Rabbit, where essentially we send the messages off to some place and then it's able to just process those messages. It, you know, it, it takes care of all of that stuff for us. That's really what this operator is giving us. Um, now, you know, again, I'm like, I'm still, <laughs> even with what we're doing right now, I'm, there's still parts of me that are like, oh man, I hope, I hope this works out. Um, there's a weird smell, I should say, around this implementation, which is at some point, we're probably going to have to make this scalable. Right now, the way that we're building this, we're building it so that it's entirely focused for us and our needs. Um, but in the future, uh, we want to potentially give other people the availability and the, the, the option to do this. Um, and so part of me is like, do we... Do we do that now <laughs> um, or or do we wait? Uh, thanks, Hamlet Bunny. I appreciate that. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. It's just, it's like, it, this is more so like, am I going to make a decision that's going to save or save me five hours or waste 60? <laughs> oh, that tea's good. Uh, did you wire your own rack or did you have someone wired up for you? I wired everything up myself. Yeah. The whole network and like everything that we have here is, yeah. Uh, the scalability bottleneck is in the file. Yeah. Yeah. It's in the file share. Yeah. Technically, Suiji, it's just one VM, right? And so because it's just one VM, uh, it, you know, it only has the throughput of the VM network interfaces on it. Right. And so we i highly doubt we could ever get gigabit out of a, ne a virtual network interface um so you know it's that yeah and, and stuff like that what's the point if you don't wire it yourself exactly exactly you gotta you gotta you gotta have the wires in your hands man uh oh hold on i forgot to mute my phone one second chat <sighs> do, 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 do. they're the best feature i ever I ever saw on any phone is on the iPhone and it's, you go to your settings, you scroll all the way down to phone and then you tap on silence unknown callers and you turn that on and then you don't have to care about anybody who calls you again <laughs> because if there's somebody you know they're the only way that they can contact you is if you're in your, if they're in your phone book. That's how I bypass scam calls chat. Uh, couldn't you pass dedicated network controllers to the VM? I could. Yeah, I could. I could. I'll, at that point, though, I will say, Calface, dude, I'll probably just run hardware. You know what I mean? Um, I'll probably just run, like, at that point, like, we'd get, like, an actual hardware NAS, you know, or something like that. So if, uh, if you point the parts of the pipelines at volumes, could you abstract? Oh, uh, could you? So, Suiji, the, the thing that we're kind of missing here, or that you're kind of missing here, which is fine, is we use vSphere, right? vSphere is an on-premises cloud solution. 
right so we have as you know right we go to let's go to technology click our pinned messages you know we have this as our service now to be fair it doesn't look like this anymore it actually looks a lot nicer we've got new ubiquity nodes like this is an old 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 picture um but those are essentially our servers right uh and so um those servers also handle uh shared storage right so because we're using vSphere we have six servers in total one two three four five six but these top three are all for data that's why you'll notice that we have 14 terabytes <laughs> we have 14 terabytes of uh of shared storage space and to be fair this is not just shared storage space this is multi-tenant highly available replicated 14 terabytes of shared storage space um, and the reason for that is, is because we're using something called vSAN now vSAN enables us to create uh shared storage across these nodes uh they're all ssd uh and then it like takes basically just like takes care of all of that for us right the problem is is this vSAN is not the most performant vSAN in the world even though we have SSDs and like all these other things we're just not running on like super high quality like 20k you know servers that are like enterprise grade uh we're running on like you know commodity hardware that is fast and does work uh but there are limitations that we have to work around now I've worked around these limitations for like years I'm very good at you know taking commodity hardware and then making it useful um but you have to know your limitations and hands down with 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 virtual machines io is a it's one of the biggest more than more than uh discs or i'm sorry more than cpu more than ram io sucks uh if you can't get good io your vms will just crawl um and so so it was really important to us to have good you know uh good io throughput um so yeah uh once we talk you know when we talk about like normal traffic you know if i if i have like you know 50 100 gigabytes of data that i just need to drag and drop that's fine it'll you know that one connection will go through no problem it'll consume you know 200 gig or 200 megabits per second whatever and it'll move the file it'll move the files right the challenge is when you do that like six times <laughs> right because each one of them wants to grab 100 megabits down right or 100 megabits up so now you're talking about 600 megabits down or 600 megabits up um and that's like you know it's just something that we can't really scale with right now uh in the future if again if we decide to say like all right cool we'll get uh you know we'll get uh again an on-prem nas that's like, like you know an on-prem vsan or i'm sorry an on-prem sam or something san or something like that and then yeah, but that's, that's going to be a hardware problem, you know, or a hardware solution. You know what I mean? Uh, Ella, my phone is perpetually on silent and D&D, &D, though, so no one can... Yeah, no, mine is too. I, 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 like, I have people in my life who basically have given up on trying to contact me because I, I don't know, I don't like cell phones. I hate cell phones. I'm not a fan of them. I, you know, it's weird being, like, a content creator and yet not really being a big social person. Um, so whatever i'm me so that's all i can be um but yeah no like i you know I, we've found the places that work for us right youtube and twitch and stuff like that you know twitter is not bad um but like i don't like i i don't, I don't i'm not a big person i'm being on the phone for i don't like texting i don't like i don't know i'm, I'm a boomer man <laughs> i mean not really but you know what i mean uh yo thank you for the the follow appreciate you uh couldn't you pat oh but yeah yeah we could but again i think a better approach would just be to get a uh a vsan you know what i mean or like an actual uh hardware solution right right now we're really solving it with software in the future it'd be better for us to solve it with hardware uh vertio is treating me well vertio is good but you got to realize cran and this is the only thing i will say is is uh we're talking about like old hard like servers versus like you know i'm not too sure what you're running it on but vert io is better on newer hardware i guess all i can say <laughs> the machines we're running uh, on are like 10 years old probably uh i just use my phone for calls ops family whatsapp uh yeah i pretty much just use it for like to be honest when i'm like i don't know n not doing anything else <laughs>
<laughs> I really don't use it that much. Um, okay, cool. So like I said, uh, recording pipeline cron, it's going to go to the production share. It's going to check for any files on that share. And then it's going to send out a uh, N, right? N being the keyword here. So it can be one, it could be 50, it can be who knows what. Um, but it will send that off to the Kubernetes API and schedule those pipelines. Now, again, these pipelines are going to be in the pending uh pending pro actually yeah i'll be fair that's probably one of the biggest reasons i use a phone still these days is has like an ipod <laughs> um yeah I, I i really i don't know man uh uh it's yeah whatever uh okay cool so the kubernetes api has got like 20 new pipelines sitting there and they're all pending what happens next next um well the tecton pipeline operator checks and sees those and says okay well we only want three ever running at a given time Right. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to see the first three that this sent over and then it's going to kick those into running and then those pipelines will run. Each one of the pipelines will run each one of these tasks, convert, archive. Uh, I'm not going to worry about clean just yet because I think we can kind of keep those in the same. Like I would actually rather have clean be with archive potentially because it like we can just validate it here and then clean it um but yeah we'll do convert and then archive the convert will go out to the production share convert it the archive will go out to the production share and then archive it and that's the whole process right that's that's essentially that's essentially the whole process um oh thank you for the follow appreciate you um so yeah that's that's what we are what we are trying to build so when we start talking about like great you just like showed me a really big you know, uh, slightly confusing flowchart. Like, how do you how do you build this, BG? Like, how do you actually how do you take this right and then take it, you know, and and build it? Well, the reality of it is, is the way I look at it is step by step and taking it piece by piece, right? Um, normally, if you want to make sure that you're building software in a way that you don't have to keep going, like if anybody here has ever built something and then they're like, oh crap, I forgot about this. Oh crap, I forgot about this. Oh crap, I forgot. It's just, you're just not thinking enough. You're not taking the, like, I love building software so much, but I think a bigger value in building software that I have gained is doing it right the first time <laughs> because you can you, you, you very much can do it right the first time. You just have to really think about it and not just go directly to creating, right? Um, that's why you'll notice a lot of the times, you know, I've got like flow charts and, and things that are making it so that I can look at it and be like, okay, how does this work? Um, so that when I go to build these things, I can build backwards, right? I can build with the complete lowermost dependency first and then say like, okay, let's let's keep moving backwards um and so for example in this scenario here right one other thing that we probably should add is glacier glacier yeah glacier archive boop right because archive goes out to glacier and then stores that data oops oh gosh Glacier. Bam. Nailed it. Cool. Uh, I mostly work on other people, so I don't get to make that choice at all. That's fair. Uh, think it, spec it out, design it, break it down, implement it piecemeal. Yep, pretty much. Um, and so if we look here, can anyone tell me what they think the absolute lowest requirements are for this? By looking at this map, can anyone tell me what they think the, 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 the bare lowest requirement is? Or one of them. It doesn't have to be one it can be it's a, it, there's a couple there but can anyone tell me what they and i'll be and i'll be honest with you it's not code related anyone <laughs> having like sure yeah fair 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 hard drives yeah okay fair fair that's not a, uh so do you mean do you mean do you mean the cp the production shares what do you what do you mean nix <laughs> yeah no gotta start with nix gotta start with nix 
okay so you're all kind of right and kind of wrong um but that's okay uh the first part would literally be the lowest parts of the system right it'd be the storage um before we can connect to anything right before like before we could convert anything we have to have the places for those things to exist right i can't convert something if it's not already on a network drive right and i can't archive it if it's not if i don't have a bucket in glacier to create it with right or to save it with so it's uh exactly so calface dude is now seeing the right path which I th i'm sure you guys are seeing it as well right who will be able to access the storage we're going to need i am credentials we're going to need a, the bucket we're going to need to make sure that we have a way for our pipelines to be able to do what they you know what they need to do um, so yeah, so there's, there's a few things that are kind of standing out here and I'll be honest with you, actually, now that I even think about it, um, I'm going to have to think about how pipelines will get secrets. Um, because that's something that I just realized I have no idea about, uh, tecton secrets. I would imagine it's through like config maps or something anyways but yeah that's right that's exactly right now you're starting to think of more of like what are the next things right so if i was to come in here and i was to say like checklist right well the first thing we need is storage right and in this case storage would be our uh production share which we already have right and then we would need our glacier bucket which we also already have right this, these are the first parts that we would want to start with now however if we needed to we could say like all right well if we don't have this then we need to figure out how you know the windows machines can connect to the storage and the the network or, and the uh cluster can connect to the storage we've already solved this problem by saying samba and nfs right and then the glacier bucket is going to be aws and actually we can say that this is really more so off-site uh off-site uh, story or offsite bucket, I guess. And this is AWS Glacier, right? So this should show you guys how we're solving these problems. Again, even really before we start writing a single line of code, right? Now, if you hadn't stopped <laughs> to ask the question, what do I need? How many of you would have gone and jumped directly into code? Be honest with me. Give me a one in chat if you would have just jumped directly into code. I, you know, I might have, to be honest with you. I, I might have if I hadn't thought about it. I appreciate your honesty, Calface, dude. I wouldn't. Oh, okay. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. The point of me saying it, though, is it's just that if you don't take the time to think about these things, there's a higher chance of you missing something rather than you not missing something, right? And the reality of it is, is that whether you think you would or you wouldn't, you'll always miss something. I just did. I like out of all the time that I have already spent working on this, I forgot about secrets. That could be in a lot of ways a deal breaker if i can't properly inject secrets into these uh pipelines to be able to use them the way i need to right um yeah exactly and that's that's my point is this this is supposed to give you the ability to take the time and think about like okay what do i need let's take it step by step you know what i mean Yeah, no, it's it's totally fine. It's totally fine. Like like I said, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're new to this, if you've been around it for a long time. Like it, it really it, it doesn't matter. Like you're always going to make a mistake. You have to be my biggest advice to anyone getting into engineering is you have like you have to the more willing you are to be wrong in front of people, the quicker you will learn. It's very true um okay so storage right production chair now we've already got the production chair we've already got the production chair as a matter of fact we can go uh all the way to my current root system and you will see that i actually have the production chair uh mounted right now mount nfs production footage obs mkv now this is the same way that the pipelines are going to connect to it so in this case our production chair is done we've got the production chair taken care of 
How about the offsite backup now, or the offsite uh, bucket? Now we have what we are saying is glacier. So let's see if we can, let's see if we have a bucket. Uh, hold on one second. Sorry, I had to log into my AWS account. Okay, so let's go to S3 and let's see what buckets we got. And if we look in our S3, we should actually see Hey, Alta 4 LLC recording archive. And if we click on this, look at this MKV. And if I click on this, look at that. All of our, all of our backups that we've already got. So we do in fact already have, right? Uh, if we go back to our, if we go back to our notes, right? We have the production share and we have the offsite bucket, right? Now there's a couple things that we still need with regards to this though, which is we also need the IAM credentials, right? Um, now, if we go here and then we go to I am and then we click on users, we should see all of the machine users as we call them in our organization. So for example, Alta for LLC Circle CI, Alta for LLC Palumi, recording. Look at that, recording pipeline. So we even have, right, a, a user in place that we're able to connect via IAM with. So let's click on this and let's make sure that we have the correct policies and everything. So we have an Alta for LLC recording pipeline policy. And if we look at this policy, Look at this elastic container registry so that we can pull from ECR and then S3 so that we can actually upload. And if we look even closer, we'll see that it's directly to the Alta 4 LLC recording archive, object path, all that good stuff. So in fact, this user is even set up the way that we want. Now, there are some things to note about this, which is to say, how the f did these get here? <laughs> Right? Like, that's cool, but like, I'm walking through it now. So how do we already have this? This is the second part. The second fun part about building software is when you're at a company, sometimes things already existed before you knew it and you want to lean on some of those pieces, uh, but then you also want to create new pieces to build that with, right? This is a prime example of one of those things. If we go to our repositories and we type in, um, What is it? I'm trying to think of it. Uh, recording. You will see that I have a repository here called Recording Palumi Service. And if I click on this repository, you'll see that we actually have resources directly related to what we're talking about. So what that means is that at one point around March 15th, I created this repository as a way of managing all of the recording Palumi service resources, right? Or all the recording stuff, uh, stuff's resources. The problem, the problem is that we don't manage things this way anymore, right? We have a much higher level of where we manage things where we have like Palumi repositories for our specific problems in our company, right? Palumi DNS, which handles our DNS, Palumi GitHub, which handles our repositories, Palumi Kubernetes, which handles the creation of our Kubernetes clusters, VPNs, networks, so forth and so on, right? So what this really means is that if we go to Palumi machine user, which is what these are, right? These are machine users. That's what we call these. They're not like actual users. And we go to resource and we click on user service. If I scroll down, Look at that recording pipeline. So this is where the authentication and the user creation for our user was, was, uh, was also done. So it would appear that what we did is we had one repo, right? We basically just cannibalized that repo and then we moved parts of that repository into their new places. This part, being the Alta 4 machine user. Now this repository, P Palumi machine user, this, this is a valid repository. Like this, this is ran, this was ran 25 days ago, right? So what that means is, is that this recording service, if we go to, uh, oops, recording service, we need to delete this. We need to basically just get rid of this whole repository. We need to make sure that we don't have any type of, you know, 
uh, any type of uh, attachment to any resources, any dangling resources, and then we need to delete these. We need to we need to delete this whole repository. So if we go back here, we definitely have IAM credentials. We've got the AWS Glacier bucket that we need, right? Uh, we've got the production chair, and we've got all that. So for most of this, we're looking we're looking pretty good. However, however one of these things we do not have and if we go back to resources and we click on user machine this is gone this kubernetes user is gone right we said that this is now replaced with our machine user repository right and we can actually tell that this is right because if we go to user service and then we click on recording pipeline right see how it's named recording pipeline but if we hover over machine user and go to this we'll notice that the actual im user that's created is the product name in front of it and then the name of the actual user meaning in this case our product is alta 4 llc and the name is recording pipeline right but if we go here you'll see that this created as just the name kubernetes if we go into im we don't have kubernetes anywhere like these are all prefixed now right properly so what that means is, is that this machine user resource, it, it's fine. It could be completely deleted. We don't have to worry about keeping it. No big deal, right? So that resource is good. Um, how about repository service, right? Now, I just told you that we create repositories for problems that we want to solve, right, with Pulumi. So if I go to Pulumi and I do, for example, you know, machine user right you'll see that we have our pulumi machine user but this is for ecr repositories right so the question is is do we have like pulumi ecr we don't so what we're also going to need is uh containers or no what we're also going to need is actually for storage we're going to need a uh container registry right and this is for our uh pipeline images yo rocks what's up man how's it going it's free real estate how you doing buddy shout out to rockstar 74 how are you my good man hope all is well with you hope 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 all of the business ventures and traveling and everything have been good um what's up everybody welcome thank you so much for being here i'm bg i'm one of the co-hosts of the alt f4 stream if you guys don't know about us we're just basically some nerds that like to do really weird nerdy stuff uh no i'm just kidding uh, I, I, I'm a senior uh, DevOps, uh, I don't want to say DevOps, I'm a senior software engineer. I work in DevOps and infrastructure. Um, I'm, I just recently hit my tenure in engineering, which is pretty crazy. Uh, my co-host as well is deep into technology as well as bartending and a bunch of other really interesting hobbies. You ever see me streaming? I'm normally streaming programming. Whenever you see him streaming, you'll see him gaming and doing all sorts of interesting things. So thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Um, today I am working on getting our, uh, automation pipelines in place for our, uh, recording. So rocks, it's actually funny, dude. Um, in a, in, I, I, uh, I'm building out, I don't know if I told you this, but I'm building out a recording pipeline that allows us to take like MKVs and transfer it to MP4 so we can like do what we need to. But remember, these are like VODs. These are like 20 gigabit files. Um, and so I'm, I'm building a automation pipeline, uh, to handle all of that for us so that we have all of that. Just like, I just drag and drop it into a folder and then it, 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 you know, it makes it into uh, what I need it to within 24 hours. Um, the funny part though, I've been having to mess with FFmpeg <laughs> and it made me think of you because yeah, I remember all the the fun times. I don't have to do as much as you do. I don't have to do like up converting, down converting, cropping, all sorts of weird stuff like that. But yeah, it was, it did make me laugh that, uh, that, that, uh, we both have had to deal with FFmpeg lately. <laughs> no, this is something called bottom. Yeah, it's called bottom. There you go. I literally just started as a cloud engineer. Uh, yeah, this stream will permanently be on my second monitor. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Hey, man, listen, you know, I try and just give you guys the most real world example of the stuff that I work on. Like um, we recently were talking to a potential uh, potential sponsor and, you know, it was funny because uh, 
we were like, you know, you know, like, yeah, like, you know, I just, I, you know, our stream is really just about like, you know, living through, you know, through the experience, you know, like, uh, it's more so, you know, kind of just showing you guys and if it breaks then it breaks and you get to see how it broke, you know? Uh, and they were like, Oh, that's really interesting. We didn't think about that. I was like, yeah, I just, that's, I don't know. That's how I do it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was, it was an interesting, uh, I don't know. It's just how we are here. Just, I don't know. We do our own thing. Uh, you, and you do Azure too. Yep. 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 We have stuff on Azure. We have stuff on Amazon. We have stuff. We have some stuff in Google, but not really, not really anything anything crazy things are good love you have a meeting by all right later rocks um but yeah thank you guys for being here uh i'm working today uh like i said on building this essentially uh now if you guys have ever messed with kubernetes before or anything like it you might recognize some of this if you haven't then i'll go through it really quickly for you so if we were to say hey bg what kind of what problem are you trying to solve right um as a matter of fact i have a uh, wiki article that explains all of that for you. Um, and so if you go to our wiki, you will see that, uh, da, 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 where is it? Nope, not here. Nice. There we go. Click here. Oh wait, no, that's not where I wanted to go. I wanted to go, uh, why are you taking so long? Tactical design documents. Cool. And then I wanted to go to converting OBS to recording. So we are streamers, as you might recognize. Uh, and we have a problem, which is that we do or we generate large amounts of video files, right? Like 20 gigs at a time. Um, and we need those video files to be in a format that we can use. Uh, we create our video files in something called MKV. And the reason why we do that is, is because when we stream with MKV, we have a lot of uh, niceties that come with it. For example, with MKV, you can stop a stream and then restart it and keep it within the same file. MKV knows how to basically have a container to where it can just save things and then just keep saving things as you keep going. So if we have power outages, stuff like that, it's super nice. Um, on top of it, MKV is just a safer, uh, safer way of recording live because essentially if a file cannot be finalized, right? Uh, blue screen of death, power loss, etc. MP4 recordings, just you're, you're, you're out of luck. They're gone. Right. And in the case of a power loss, we would at least because, like I told you, MKV can record up to, you know, whatever second you're storing, um, you'll get up to that second, you know, saved um, with an MP4. It has to be finalized. And if it can't be finalized, then you can't store that file. Um, so that it's really important for us to be able to keep this MKV format. And so with that, we were like, all right, well, Let's figure out a way of automating that process. Now, the TLDR, because I'm not going to go through everything. If you want to, if you want to look through the whole technical document, there. Oh, whoops, hold on. Uh, if you want to look through the whole technical document, here it is, right here. Feel free to take a look. Uh, but the TLDR is, is that we have a stream desktop, which is actually right here. And this stream desktop is on our high performance. Well, I don't want to say high performance, but our, our very fast network that we have. Um, and this very fast network provides all these different types of Samba shares, NFS shares, what we call them basically as share points. Now, these share points, right, are designed to store specific pieces of data for us. So production data is on the production share point. Uh, all of our assets and like uh, gr uh, graphics and stuff is on a different share point. So in this case, the idea is, is that the stream desktop goes to the Samba share, right? And then it drops the file into the virtual machine or the share that, it's, that we're, you know, we use. Um, at that point, it's off the desktop, right? It's gone. It's off the desktop. We don't have to worry about it here anymore. It's sitting on this, but it's still in our infrastructure, right? It's not, it's not like... It's not, you know, highly available, replicated. We could basically have an outage and lose this data, right? So the goal here is we need two steps to take. First step is we need to take that file and we need to convert it, right? We need to convert that file uh, from an MKV to an MP4 so that when we go here to edit it, we can use that file. So the MKV file really isn't, really isn't too valuable to us, right? However, it is valuable in the sense that it is what we call our digital negative. 
I was a writer and director in LA before I got into this engineering thing. And that's what we would call basically our film. We call them digital negatives. And the whole idea behind the digital negative is that's like your source of truth with your footage. That That's like, if you ever need that footage again, you can go back to it. You don't touch it. You don't like, it's again, it's like a, it's like a negative of a film. Um, and so we look at our MKVs as our digital negatives. And as a matter of fact, if we go into AWS and we go to S3, you're gonna notice that if I click on our bucket here, that it's an MKV folder and everything inside of it is .mkv files. So what happens is if we ever need to restore from this, right? We download the file and then we reconvert it, right? Now we don't have to worry about re-archiving it because we've already got it archived, but we can at least convert it, right? Um, so that's that's essentially that that part uh, that part there. Um, the second part is is that uh, again we need a way of storing it and saving it for you know making sure that we if we have a power outage or something like that we don't lose it. Right. And so that's why I say that this is two steps. We're first converting it for the value of being able to edit it in an MP4 format. But then we're also getting the digital negative or the MKV off of our network so that we don't have two files of the same size. Right. So the idea is, is that when we convert from an MKV to an MP4, it's the same size. It's like a 20 gigabit file. So we just went from 20 gigs stored to now 40 gigs store. Right. So what we want to do is, is we want to keep that data. We want both of those data, right? Because the MP4 is valuable for editing and the MKV is valuable as our digital negative, but we don't want to keep the M or the MKV on prem. We want to put the MKV and take it off prem so that it's stored safely, you know, cuddled, cu cuddled nice and neat with it's all of its other little, you know, MKV pals um, or brethren and sisters. <laughs> uh, and so what we do is, is we take that MKV as a two, 20 gig, 30 gig file, right? and we upload it to Amazon. Now, easy, you asked the question, isn't the bucket bucket expensive? Well, let's take a look at that, right? So if we go to the Amazon calculator, you can do this. You can easily go into the Amazon calculator and like get some kind of an idea, right? Now, if I go to S3, right? Say I want standard, right? We're just gonna look at standard. I'm not gonna touch anything, right? Standard storage. Now, I just told you that you know, we consume at least 20 gigs per recording and we have, you know, we record three times a week, uh, four times a month, right? So whatever that is, it's like, you know, around probably like 600, 800 gigs at least. Um, so let's do that. Let's just say a terabyte per month. So if we're uploading a terabyte per month to Azure, I'm sorry, not to Azure, to Amazon, right? That's going to be $26 and 62 cents a month. Now, that is just for data in the sense of uh, just storing it, right? We need to consider transfer as well. So internet transfer going into Amazon, they don't care about that. You could put this to like whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change it at all. They don't, <laughs> let me put it to you this way. Amazon wants your business. They're not going to charge you for putting stuff into their, com into their services. But the, what they do charge you for is getting it out. And oh, baby, do you pay for it? So watch what this happens when we say 2662 and we say a terabyte a month. It literally triples the price. Um, and and this, is, this is something to think about, right? Now, I told you guys that we only use our digital negatives really once or twice, right? Uh, when we first convert it or if we need to reconvert it for some reason. So in our scenario, the outbound really is never a case. Right. As a matter of fact, if we look at it more outbound, we need to consider outbound to be more like disaster recovery. Right. So in the circumstance of we lose everything and we need to download, you know, two terabytes worth of data, then our disaster recovery is actually going to be around one hundred and forty three dollars and something cents. Right. But in normal circumstances, this isn't really going to be that big of a deal, right? But we can actually save even more money, right? Because this is $26 a month for like, uh, this is $26 a month for like a terabyte of space, right? However, if we wanted to, right, we could use something called, uh, we could use something called Glacier, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn this off. 
and then I'm just going to turn this on. Right now, what's going to happen is it's going to keep. Okay, no, it didn't. It, it removed it. All right, so let's go back to the same thing. One terabyte of glacier storage, four dollars sixty-three cents. Right. So that's what we're doing. By the way, Glam, what's up, man? How's it going, buddy? So, Glam, I got something to tell you, dude. You're 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 probably gonna you're probably gonna it's probably gonna blow your mind a little bit. I used to watch you when you played Warframe. If this is the same person, uh, I actually used to watch you when you played Warframe. Uh, yeah, crazy, crazy world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I used to like literally like three or four years ago when we first started streaming, uh, we didn't know where to start. And so we, uh, we started in, uh, in the Warframe category with, uh, it was, uh, who's the other big guy? Um, can't remember his name. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, no, it's really cool to, to meet you, man. Yeah. I used to, I used to watch your stream quite often when I was trying to learn how to play Warframe. Good, uh, good to meet you, man. Uh, but yes, there is colder storage. That is, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. There is, there is colder storage that is, uh, entirely more, entirely more, uh, cost efficient, right? The thing to note about this is that um, in the scenario of flexible storage or even glacier retrieval in general, you're going to pay more for the retrieval part than you are the storage part. Like they, again, Amazon doesn't really care at all about you putting stuff in. Like they want you to do that. They're not going to stop you from doing that. Um, but what they are going to do is, is they are going to charge you again, once you start trying to re retrieve stuff. So when we talk about, again, going back to that retrieval, the bandwidth is always going to be the same, right? So that's another thing to note about data transfer is you have to look at data transfer. If, if you're using it like this as your disaster recovery, a part of your disaster recovery costs, right? Again, if we lose our whole data center for some reason, yo, Glam, thank you for the follow, by the way, man. I appreciate that. Um, and again, I hope you're, I hope you're doing well, man. Seriously, I, uh, again, it's just fucking crazy to see that uh, the whole the world's small. It's crazy. Uh, but yeah, no, um, you know, if we lose this for some reason, right? We lose our data center for some reason. Then whatever storage we had, whether it was a terabyte, two terabytes, we're gonna have to, you know, we're gonna have to retrieve that data. That's the first part, right? Retrieval is always going to cost, you know, it's always going to cost more. Um, the second thing though, is, is that with Glacier, you have to wait, right? It's one of the reasons why, uh, it's one of the reasons why uh, it's cheaper, right? And with, with a normal standard retrieval, right? You can get that right away, right? And that's why you pay more is because they take your data they put it somewhere where it's going to be very cheap, <laughs> you know, or very, or uh, very quick. And then they charge you for that. Right. Um, whereas in a glacier scenario, they put it somewhere where it is very cheap and then they make you wait for it. Right. Um, and so this is where we have like restore requests and standard and expedited and bulk and stuff like that. Right. This again goes back to that whole concept of like, if you're a street, just anybody, anyone in general, if you're anyone in general who has like, terabytes of data we're talking about terabytes of data if you want to manage that properly you have to think about how like how it's going to be kept right um if it's something that you're constantly just contributing to uh do you care about disaster recovery you know what i mean uh is this a scenario that you're going like this is where that really counts right you can kind of get away with it with standard but you pay more for it Right. In the scenario of Glacier, again, like I told you, we upload probably about a terabyte a month. Now, realistically, the reason why we went with Glaciers is because this is not the number that we predict. This is the number that we predict. By the end of the year, we predict that year over year, we will have generated 12 terabytes of footage just through Twitch streams, <laughs> just through Twitch streams. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, this is where we kind of went like, okay, this is where we need to really pay attention. Now look at how Glacier does it. Glacier gives it to you at a very, very cost effective price at around five fifty five dollars and 56 cents. However, remember we said that if we had a recovery for some reason, what would that be? Well, if we had to retrieve 12 terabytes of storage, it'd be around a thousand dollars. Um, so I have to be aware of this. I have to be aware of this. Um, don't click on that, by the way. Uh, sorry. Uh, why don't I have my mod icons? 
There we go. No, you don't. By the way, don't click on that. Sorry, we don't normally just drop links like that in chat. Wanted, not trying to be rude, but out of the safety of everybody. Um, haven't watched in a good five months or maybe, but it's okay. Yo, Impose, thank you so much for the fight. Hey, listen, you've still been here supporting us. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate that. Um, all of their stuff is marketed as snow puns. Their physical storage boxes are snowballs. Haven't seen this. Yeah, dude, it's crazy. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no worries, Wanted. No worries, no worries. All right, let me, okay, in that case, let me check it. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, nothing harmful. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, I see, I see what, do I win? Yeah, <laughs> I see. All right, I appreciate that, Wanted. <laughs> nice. Um, although, I don't know what that was. Um... Thank you, Imposed. I appreciate that, man. Thank you for sticking around regardless. Um, what did you... Waiting for Glacier makes sense. They move at a glacial pace. <laughs> oh, Zami, I love you. I love you, man. Uh, one day, one day, all of this techno lingo will make sense to you. <laughs> Zummies are our resident, just like, personal friend of ours who, like, has no idea what any of this stuff is. <laughs> uh, but, man, we love him for his support. Um... Can't you leverage Snowball thing for data retrieval? Yeah, you could. Yeah. So does anyone know why Snowball was created? I can explain to you why, but does anyone know why Snowball was created? It's actually a fascinating, it's, it's a completely physical related problem. Does Azure have something like this new question? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah, they totally do. Yeah, I just don't think it's as cheap, right? I don't think it's as cheap, which is one of the reasons why we didn't go with Azure for our storage. We have Azure for our compute, right? Like we use Azure for our Kubernetes cluster, but we don't use it for uh, we don't use it for storage because it's, it's a bit more expensive. Uh, because transfer over the web is potentially slower and less secure with large amounts of data. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's part of it, yes. Uh, uh, we... Like at the end of the day, you're only as fast as like the hose that you have essentially of data, right? Uh, where I'm at our house, we have a terabyte uh, down and up because we're on fiber. So that's pretty dope. That means that the, at the bare minimum, if I can connect to another pure fiber connection, then we should be able to go up to, you know, gigabit throughput. Now, that's not always the case because your disk speeds have to be able to go that fast as well. It's just it never gets that far. Right. So that that's 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 another thing to think about is is like. Even when you have like fiber, you're more so like you're, I would be surprised anybody who really has fiber is pulling more than like 50, 100 megabytes on average. <laughs> like I like normally fibers for companies, like places where tons of traffic is going through all the time. But again, it's still a limitation of a terabyte. So Amazon a while ago was like, hey man, we can support like, petabytes <laughs> we could support like petabytes on top of petabytes of data right um imagine having to transfer that much amount of data over to the internet right it would be you'd be dead like legitimately like they did a study on it and they're like people would be dead by the time <laughs> the transfer finished right so this was a problem for amazon Right. This was a problem for Am I want to be 100 percent clear. This was a Amazon wanted to make money. How did they solve this problem? Now, I would have loved to been in the engineering meeting when that one guy just sat there and was like, what if we just make a big truck? <laughs> um, but engineering and, and automation at its finest really came through with this product called uh, Snow Snowball Snow. Uh, no, it's uh, AWS Snowmobile. Yeah, snowmobile. So the idea is, is that no, it's exabyte. Sorry, it's exabyte. It's exabyte data. So the idea is that Amazon was like, hey, listen, we understand that you might have like exabytes, of, you know, amount of data, right? Or a hundred petabytes of data, essentially. Um, we're just gonna send you a truck, <laughs> and then you can just plug that into your network and transfer it directly into the truck, and then we'll move it. So the real, the real challenge here is as humans we collect data faster than we can transfer it if that makes sense and amazon solved this problem by saying all right well if i can take a petabyte's worth of data you know what i mean and move it across the country quicker than you know less than that then 
yeah, like that's that's that, and so snow snowmobile became a thing because of that. So yeah, it's it's really it, it it is very much what Glam said that you know the transfer is so slow, but it's it's truly because as humans we have not gotten to the point where internet speeds are that fast. It's we are we are truly limited by our technology to be able to move petabytes of data over the network. Uh, and so that's why snowmobile exists. And, and that's why I love it. That's why I think it's, it's, it's so much fun and interesting uh, is because it's like a, like it's a physical, like you literally cannot move data faster besides getting it in a truck and then moving it across the country. And I think, I think, I don't know. I just think that's so cool. Uh, are there companies that focus on selling, providing uh, one service as your monitor costs? Yeah, absolutely. There, there. Uh, so, like for example, there's something called Spot IO. We use this at Hippo, um, and uh, the idea here is, is like they take a look at your clusters and are able to like do cost op optimization uh, for like your auto scaling groups and stuff like that. So yeah, they're definitely yeah. There's a whole there's a whole business model off of like making clouds cheaper for people. Uh, did you know I build clouds and do DR work for my data? No, I didn't. Dude, glam. So here's the funniest shit, man. And I'm going to be real. You know, like I said, it, it, when you when you said something, it really did f with me a little bit because I was like, wait a minute, what the hell? Um, I didn't know that. No, no, I, I only knew you from your, you know, your rocking, uh, you know, your rocking chill Warframe uh, gaming days. Like I, I didn't know that at all. That's really cool, man. What um what kind of uh like what what exactly is your position I guess if you don't mind me asking, uh it's also important to note that Amazon hosts uh, data for small government so yes yeah your app that's also yes very very true in the private sector uh for government and stuff like that uh it is safer yeah it's safer to store it in like a private place and then you know make sure that that is transferred securely and safely. Uh, to where they don't have to ask questions of like, well, how many networks and things does this have to jump through and all that kind of stuff. Build clouds. I mean, hey, dude, I was just about to say, if you're working at a data center company, you're literally building clouds. There, there are people who literally build the clouds. <laughs> um, I do want to hear about the DR side of things. Yeah, yeah, man. I mean, feel free to feel free to share any of that stuff. I, I, so, so glam. And like I said, for anyone else just tuning in, I. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer, whatever that means. Bottom line is, is uh, the past four years, I've focused entirely in DevOps. I started out in front end uh, 10 years ago. Um, and then around three years after that, I jumped into back end and then I moved to full stack and then I moved to DevOps and I fell in love with like containerization and and virtualization and like all of this all of this stuff. Yeah, actually, that's a super fair point. Yeah, if you want it, it there you go. Yeah, it's a, it's a Lambda, it takes a second. <laughs> That that cold start, baby. We gotta we gotta we gotta get more we gotta get more traffic for that cold start. <laughs> uh, but it's yeah, it's gonna be there. Uh, that's cool, man. That's cool. I used to work at a web hosting company called Media Temple, so I I know the the lower hosting side of things and how troublesome that can be. Um, cool. Okay, so as I said, if we go back to our initial design, oh, you remember me? Yep, yep, yep. Yep, I, I worked there for quite some time. As we go back to our design, right, we said that we've got our bucket, we've got Glacier, right? We need our container registry. Now, this is where this is where things um this is where things become a little bit fuzzy, right? Um oh whisper, thanks, man. Yeah, Media Temple was great before they got bought out by GoDaddy and essentially sold their souls to the devil. And not even like the good devil, you know what I mean? It's like the shitty devil that nobody wants to be behind. It's like that weird devil that's like, yeah, if you were cooler, maybe it wouldn't be so awkward. Uh, but it's GoDaddy, bro. Like, ugh, I hate GoDaddy. I love anybody who still works at Media Temple. Um, but God, do I hate GoDaddy <laughs> with a passion. Um, every, yep, 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 yep. That's what happened to us. Yep, yep. Um, thank you for the follow, by the way. Um, okay, cool. So, and, and so to be fair, a lot of my work now um, is heavily. So, you know, and I've talked about this to a lot of people like, you know, I'm in I'm in DevOps and it's a very different scenario than I've ever dealt with before, because where I work, we do DevOps, right? So like a lot of my job is process, procedures, design, implement Like in a lot of ways, I'm very much being like groomed right now to be a principal engineer, 
which is what I want. I want to become a principal engineer. Like that's my next step, you know? Um, but the, I feel like my job is like just a part of that entirely. Um, and this actually leans into what I'm, what I'm about to say now, which is that, um, I made a design decision and then I changed that design decision, but I did not decouple the cloud resources to that previous decision. And so what that means essentially is, is that at one point I had automation in a different place, but I kept the cloud resources and then I deleted the automation. <laughs> so we have what are called dangling resources. Now we want to keep these resources because I can't delete this bucket. <laughs> uh, I need this S3 bucket. It has already uh, like, uh, you know, two, two terabytes worth of our backup. So like one of the downsides, if you don't know about S3 or just object storage in general, um, is that um, is that you can't change the bucket name after it's created. Now, luckily, I was smart enough to give it like a nice prefix. It's like the name is what I want it to be. <laughs> um, but how I provisioned it is not. Now, when I told you we created this recording Pulumi service thing, the idea was is that this repository was just meant to handle all of the automation for just this one thing, right? The challenge is, is though, uh, but our naming could, yeah, exactly. But our naming conventions changed. Uh, literally, no, literally, Glam, that's what happened. In this repo, I did poor name conventions where like the machine users didn't have like prefixes or any of that kind of stuff. Thankfully, I did it for the repo, but I didn't do it for the repositories. The ECR repositories are basically our, uh, our, our repositories in the cloud. Um, and I, I didn't do it for the, oh no, I did do it for the bucket. Yeah. So the bucket's been moved or the bucket has been moved. I think is the bucket moved. I can't even remember bucket. Yeah. So we have, oh no, we, okay. So the, okay. So let's do this. So, uh, we need to, uh, automation new automation repos right so we need to migrate we need to migrate the uh bucket to new pulumi bucket repository right so we're going to need to create a new pulumi bucket repository so that we have this automation right or we have this bucket in automation but the other thing that we did is we decided that we aren't going to do these things anymore. We're not going to do these like random, like, okay, this is automation just for this. This is automation just for that. We're going to focus on products and saying like, okay, if it's a product that needs this separation, then we will do it. But if it doesn't, we'll just put it in our normal global automation for our company. And that's really what these like Pulumi dash, Pulumi dash, whatever projects are. So what we want to do is, is we want to rip out the automation from this old repo and put it in a brand new one, right? And then that's it. Like we just put it in a brand new one. We, we, and what'll happen is when we rerun this, it'll fail. And so what'll happen is, is when we rerun it and it fails, we then import the existing resource and now it's managed by the new, uh, the new automation, right? Um, we're gonna need to do the same thing for repositories as well. So here we'll say uh, migrate, migrate the uh repository uh resource resources to new pulumi hmm. what do i want to call this because i don't want to call it registry because that doesn't make sense that's too vague so i'm wondering if we need to do like container registry because what we're gonna want to do is we're going to want to create uh we're uh we will need to be able to create uh container registries in both azure and aws so i want to be clear on something right i want to be very very clear on something we are a multi-cloud across the board right we have our servers that we run uh oh by the way glam you'll probably appreciate this uh we run vcenter here at, at home <laughs> Uh, and again, anyone else who likes like on-prem, like hardware and stuff like that. So um, we have we have three main setups. We have the on-prem, which we run here, which has got 
324 core nodes uh and then three eight core nodes we run vsan on top of vcenter so we have like our little you know our nice little on-prem cloud uh we have kubernetes inside of it so for example you can see here's our our nine node kubernetes cluster uh we've got some game servers for back in the day when we were hosting game servers uh and then we've got like circle ci runner basically this is our private on-prem cloud right this cloud is really our cost saver right so 90% of the time we run things here because it's just it's 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 just cheap <laughs> and we're just paying for the electrical bill at the end of the day right when we talk about moving things to the cloud and like or keeping things highly like again different problems we want things highly available we want things to be replicated we like we want all that then we move them to the cloud so quirk quirk is in the cloud right quirk is in azure so if we go to portal.azure.com and we go to Kubernetes services, we will see Alta 4 LLC. Here's our, here's our off-site Kubernetes cluster. So what does that mean? So chat, what this means is that we have an on-prem Kubernetes cluster and an off-site Kubernetes cluster. That enables me to easily move workloads, right? Back and forth easily, right? I have Kubernetes in the cloud and I've got Kubernetes here. What's the difference? Not much besides configuration. So that's why we have this design of like Kubernetes being our base orchestrator because it does really enable us to be cloud agnostic. Uh, what are you storing on with the local VMware environment? So to give more specs, um, I'm going to be clear. This is commodity hardware. Uh, these are Dell R610s, I think. Yeah, R610s. Uh, but hey, they're they're cheap and they get the job done. So I'm, I'm very appreciative of them. Um, so yeah, so they are three... 24 core 96 gig node ram servers uh basically 12 core yeah they're bare metal yeah it's bare it's all bare metal yeah, yeah yeah this is all yeah so chat if you guys want to you're more than welcome to check out our discord for all of our i mean i'm gonna be real glam you want to be around a bunch of ops nerds this is pretty much our whole community uh but yeah if you click on pin messages here you can actually see now this is a older picture <laughs> um i really should go take a new picture um but this picture shows some of the hardware which is the servers um we have since upgraded to like we use unify now and we have like you ubiquity across all of our hard or all of our virtual or sorry all of our networking and stuff um but yeah these are the main servers so these three bottom ones are the 24 core 96 gig node servers right the top three are the eight core 32 gig node servers now the interesting thing about our setup is we are using a hundred percent of these resources in vCenter. So the top three, uh, to give more information, are two terabyte each. Okay, so each of them has two two terabyte SSD drives in them, and then one one terabyte cache drive in them because these are our actual storage servers right here. So each one of these is mirrored using vSAN, right? So this is all software solution, like software solution for rating and all that kind of stuff. I don't know how much you guys know about vSAN or any of that, but the idea is, is that vSAN takes one hard drive from each of these, mirrors that, or no, uh, I think, well, it depends on your configuration. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but then it essentially uses the other ones for caching and all that kind of stuff. These are so if you were to say, hey, BG, do you guys have highly available storage? Yeah, we totally do. We, we, we really do. If one of these nodes goes down, I don't have to worry about it. Not that big of a deal, right? We have that, that availability. What we don't have is that if this thing gets unplugged, <laughs> then I'm <laughs> right? That, 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 that's why I say like the data center can, like our on-prem can only really go so far, right? Like I said, we have three nodes. We have like our own little availability zones, like all, you know, but it's only really as far as you can go with an on-prem setup. Now, again, this is not a good picture. I really need to get a newer picture of the setup because the new setup looks very nice. Um, but yeah, no, uh, this is where we keep most of our stuff running on-prem. Again, we're running all of our uh, Kubernetes stuff on here. Uh, so we do run, you know, like converge the conversion process and all of that. But the moment we talk about storage, we go off site, right? Because we don't want to pay for that. We calculated, uh, Atoda and I actually calculated what the difference would be if we just got like a 12 terabyte, like 12 ter terabyte hard drive, right? These hard drives, even though they're like, like 
two, three hundred bucks or something like that. Then what you start dealing with is like, okay, this was the hard drive from four years ago. We got to figure out what to do with this one. And then this one was from five years ago. And dude, well, I don't even know if this one works anymore. Like that, that I'm not, I'm not doing that. I've already done that. <laughs> so like, even, even when we talk about like the cost effectiveness of storing on-prem at that scale, you just, you can't beat Amazon. You really can't beat Amazon. They are, they're cheap. They're super cheap, non-redundant power. So kind of, <laughs> um, so glam, we, we do, we have everything is on a battery backup and the cluster is split between two battery backups so technically if our power goes out they shift to their equivalent battery backup and then they stay on you know for as long as they can if we had like you know i don't know like a generator that'd be great but no i don't have that <laughs> I don't have that. Um, I, I don't. We don't have that, unfortunately. We do have. We do have. Uh, what's it called, though? Uh, solar. We do have solar, so that's that kind of helps. <laughs> oh, dude, chat. I got something so funny to tell you. Okay, so the house that we're in right now, we are. We're we're still like we're still renting because I I haven't really found the house that I love yet. Um, but I actually really love this house. And I'm even considering talking to the people about like, you know, can I buy it from the, from you? Um, but it was funny because the other day, uh, they had, we had somebody come out and like, just take a look at the place. And, uh, they were like, so how's everything going? Like everything good. I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, we've been super happy. They were like, we noticed the electrical bill has been really high. <laughs> And I was like, I was like, what do you mean? And they were like, yeah, like, sh do we need to, do you like, do you want us to look at like the electrical? Like the, the electrical has definitely been higher. Like we got our, we got a call from the solar company that like, you know, the, the electrical has been higher. And I was like, I went, oh, I was like, no, no, that's, that's all me. I was like, the, those are the servers in the garage. That's, that's, that's to par. We, we expected that, <laughs> but they were just like, they were like, wait, wait, what? Like you expect this much power drain and we're like yeah we do yeah, it's the server's running and so they were like oh okay cool <laughs> but that was funny yeah they were they were definitely a little confused on that one um okay cool so like i said uh we were able to migrate or we need to migrate the bucket to the new pulumi bucket repository and we need to migrate the repository or the repository uh, resources to the new container uh automation um so what else do we need to do what else do we need to do um let's go back to our chart right so we've got this we've got this um we've got kubernetes already set up as well right now we we need to talk a little bit about like the convert and archive steps but i'm gonna i'm gonna talk about that more in a second when we like start dealing with go and stuff don't worry we will be programming chat there's plenty of work to do <laughs> um but yeah like i said so to give you the tl the tldr right we have a production share. We know that that exists. That's in our V center, right? That's on our vSAN, our highly available storage. Our cron in our Kubernetes cluster is going to go out into that storage, right? Grab those or check for those files and then schedule within the Kubernetes API, the Tecton pipelines, right? The operator is going to manage how many pipelines are ever running at a given time. And then those steps are going to take care of the process. Um, so we're getting closer, right? We're getting closer to where we could utilize some code, right? Um, but we're not there just, just yet. Uh, the last standard state I physically worked on had, uh, out, had two massive generators on the fourth uh, floor with two weeks of fuel that was changed really. Yeah, dude, it's, yeah. I, I've seen like, like Google's is crazy too because they use like hydrothermic, like I forget, basically they use the heat from their servers as a way of also generating electricity for them, which is just fuck safe. <laughs> like I was off on that bleep, but it's crazy. Like, yeah, like it's, you know, it's crazy. The kind of stuff that like they're using now to keep servers online and like the heat even is used as like ways of generating electricity. Like the actual just like air heat is crazy. Um, those kind of, that, that's a whole other level. That's, I, I, I bow to those people and say, okay, you are scientists. <laughs> like this is, this is no longer just engineering. You're actually like doing science work now. Um, okay. So we need storage, which we've got, we need new automation repos. Now we don't really need the new automation repos yet because the, the, the services are already in place, but we need, or the resources are already in place, but we need to at least just be aware of it. Right? So we've said that we need credentials. 
got credentials, we got our bucket, all of that is good, right? The challenge that we have right now is we need a way to pull our images. Um, now, if we go back to our AWS console and we go to I am, right? And we click on da, 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 16 here. Uh, we should see recording pipeline. Now, if I click on recording pipeline, I think we've already given this specific thing access to yeah container registry so if we look here it's allowed to get authorization token okay so yeah so but see this only allows it to get authorization token interesting okay so what this means chad is is that i'm actually not able to pull from ecr i'm just able to authenticate with ecr which technically means that this repository, uh, we will need to grant access to the repository in the uh, Pulumi machine user automation, right? So remember how I told you chat that it's very easy to run into gotchas and not even realize it until you get there. One thing I noticed before even lighting, writing a single line of code was that Okay, sure, at on the on the ground or you know on the like ground level or whatever, we have an I am user, right? But then I, I was like, you know what? Let's there's still more to know here. Like we we still don't entirely know if this is accurate, right? So I went in and I looked at the policy and I realized that oh no, this actually won't work because this policy is only letting me authenticate with ECR. It's not letting me actually um it's not letting me actually pull from any repository. So if I had said like, okay, cool, let's get started. And then we jumped into all that stuff. And then we got to that point, we would immediately have gone, oh, I'm not able to pull the image. Um, the problem here is, is that we need to solve this within our normal automation scenario. So it might actually make sense for us to update some code. So Pulumi, Pulumi machine user. All right, so let's go to Pulumi machine user. So these are all of our machine users, Pulumi machine user, user service. And we could see here that here are the I am permissions for it. And actually, if you see here, recording pipeline, look, get authorization token. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to update this, right? So that we can, uh, we can, what's it called? We can pull from this. So actually we could do this right now if we really wanted to. Um, so let's do development, right? And then go to repository here and then let's grab this repo so let's make this change now since we already know we're right here and it should be pretty easy so we're going to get clone this automation repository now yo what's up gorilla how's it going dude um now i'm not actually going to run this locally uh because i you know well, i already have automation around this there's no reason to so what we're going to do is, is we're just going to go to user service uh oh wait hold on oh uh, Nix yarn install. Oh, by the way, uh, Cran, if you're there, I think you'd appreciate that. I've, I've stopped trying to install so many things locally. Dude, I, I really am enjoying Nix quite a bit, quite a bit, uh, users service. Okay, cool. So here's like our on-prem back, uh, backend API offset. Okay. Here's all of our perfect. Okay. So here's our recording pipeline. So what we need to do is we need to go right here and we need to add a new, oops, we need to add a new, come on now, stop, uh, a new action and whatever thingy here. So we're going to do action, uh, this uh, effect, allow, and then resource. And we're not gonna do just star like this. We're gonna actually, uh, we're gonna actually grab the correct ARN. So let's. Interesting. Uh, lo uh, love man, it's going great. I see you're uh, accustomed to Nix. Yeah, dude. Yeah, well, not accustomed, but I'm getting better with it. I like. I, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it quite a bit. Um. So we want to just be able to pull from ECR. I am pull from ECR. Oh, you know what? I actually have this in here. So we can just, okay, here we go. So we need this. We need this whole 
thing. Principal push user ARN. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, I actually assigned a principal on this too. That's very interesting. Uh, we don't need any of that though. So we'll, let's just copy and paste this whole thing. Boop. Got it. Oh, here. Boop. Got it. Okay. Doop, 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 doop. Okay, cool. Awesome. All right. So what does this say exactly? So what this says is it says that we can get image, get layer availability, complete layer download. So basically everything for downloading layers or pushing up layers, put image, upload layer part. We don't really need these two. You know what I mean? We don't really need any of these. Although, unless maybe you have to have all of them. I don't know. Whatever. We'll just keep it like this for now. Um, the interesting thing here is the is the principles. What am I doing with this? So I'm taking the user ARN and I'm pushing it into an array of principles. I don't think we need this. Yeah, I don't think we need this. I think we can just do that and then do resource and then we need to do the uh what's it called the registry so we're going to go to ec container registry and crap recording producer this is right that's the shaw but i need the arn I can never remember how to get the ARN of these things. How do you get the ARN of a repository? ECR ARN. AWS ECR ARN. Yeah, here we go. This is all I needed. Just the the standardized naming convention. So region AWS ECR region repository. And then in this case, it would be, I could star on that. Yo, what's up, TG? How's it going, man? Hello, hello. I could star on that. Um, hmm. Because I don't know recording cron producer, recording pipeline CLI. That's really what we want is the recording pipeline CLI. Recording pipeline CLI. And this needs to be the actual account ID, which is this. Oh, uh, is that right? I think that's right. Right. AWS ECR I uh, ARN. Oh, oh, region is okay. US West too. I was like, why does that say region? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, thank you, Gorilla. I was like, I, I was confused on why that said region, but yeah, it's <laughs> that was the yeah, yeah. It was region. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, you're right. Yep, yep. Yeah, perfect. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So A R N A W S E C R U S West two account ID repository recording pipeline C L I. So what is this gonna do, chat? This is going to take my already, like, like, like I told you guys, chat, you got to get good at dog fooding. You got to get good at adding and not having to delete. Like having to delete means you didn't think about something. <laughs> adding things are very easier to maintain. So what are we doing? We're just adding to our Alta for machine user that already exists. That's already got all of these other, other, you know, other, uh, roles or whatever on it. Uh, and we're just simply sprinkling in a new, a new, policy right we're just saying hey recording pipeline you're allowed to pull your image for your jobs that's it that's it that's all we're doing so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to hit lazy git hit space new uh, and as a matter of fact let's create an issue for this really quickly so let's go to not austin let's go to uh company is it company company board yeah company board and let's say we'll create a ticket here and we'll say um uh, what was I going to say? Uh, implement or no, no add, uh, recording pipeline update recording pipeline user or we'll say 
fix recording pipeline user problem. We need to update the recording pipeline machine user uh, user I am role so it can also pull from ECR uh, from ECR images uh, directly. Perfect. Assignee me uh, is a bug and this is whatever. Go. So we're going to do this and then I'm going to go here and I'm going to copy the git branch name. Uh, give me one second. Sorry. I'll uh, let me give me one second. Glam. I'll get to your question. Uh, bam. There we go. Cause it's trackable. We want to make sure it's trackable uh, feature uh, user service uh, add ECR for um, recording pipeline. Boom. So what does that mean? Why did I go here and create this ticket? Well, we track every change we make here at the Alta 4 stream. And so what that means is that now if I go to here and then I do this and I create this and then I say this and create pull request. Well, guess what's going to happen? It's going to see this. I should see it. Yep. Went into progress. There's my open branch. And not only that, but it also adds the problem into the ticket for me. So it's the biggest reason why we do it. Um, all right. Let's make sure we watch this pipeline. Oh, login. Login with GitHub. Boom, boom, boom. Cool. All right. There we go. All right. Let me, uh, let me catch up with chat while we wait for this pipeline to finish. Uh, sorry for the weird question, but since there are some ops people here, does anyone know of a lightweight call center software product that can be configured with Google voice number? I haven't, uh, telephoned, uh, oh, I, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I feel like honestly, a Tota, are you there? Cause I feel like a Tota might actually know that that's a little bit more in his, in his ballpark. Um, he works in IT, so he does like he deals with a lot of that stuff quite often, actually. Um, man, this is awesome. Everything is just literally automated. Yeah, dude. I can like get up and actually here, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna go make me another cup of tea. I'll be right back. <laughs> I love automation. Where's the Toda? He's working right now. Yeah, he's working. Okay, so we are refreshing. I guess it's been a minute since I've pulled stuff. These these aren't as cached as they normally are. You got to automate the coffee machine to trigger with some Terraform provider. <laughs> yeah, that'd be dope. Um, Glam, I would ask in our Discord, honestly. Um, and I, if you do ask in our Discord, I'll at reply Atoda, who I'm thinking of. Um, and he might, he might be able to help you. He might be able to help you. I'm not a, that you're definitely not wrong. It's a little bit of a, of a side swiper, but it's not, it's, it's, a, I, I'm actually kind of curious on that. All right. Yeah, we don't need this anymore. We're watching pipelines now, chat. All right, preview our changes. And here's what's dope too, chat. Because we still use Pulumi, we can do this and we can just go look at Pulumi as well. I was thinking about doing some fun. Dude, see, that's the thing is like, I wish I, wish I could come up with... Hold on. No, no, I think this is fine. Because we don't have dev deployed anywhere. Like, I think this is expected. I think I actually did this. Um, and I, Like, I think I did this locally, and then I didn't update it. So I'm just trying to think. Vault generic secret. Dev. Why? Hmm. Do these exist? I don't think these exist, dude. 
I like I genuinely don't think these exist. Access key, dev serverless email. Do these exist? That's a cool idea though, Glam. I like that idea a lot. I was just gonna say I'm not as creative. <laughs> uh I wish I wish I was. Is it being deployed through K8s? Ah, here it is. Yeah, they got named Quir oh no. These might actually be this might actually be wrong. Why does it want to delete all of the dev stuff? That doesn't make any sense. Uh Oh, because we don't use dev anymore. It's on site and off site. That's what it is. Okay, this is fine. This is fine. Yeah, it's because we don't use dev anymore. Um yeah, I'm pretty confident that's what this is, is because we don't use dev anymore. It's now off-site and on-prem. Let's go here really quickly. Palim adds Quirk machine users. So if we click on this, Alta 4 LLC, Alta 4 LLC, on-prem. Yeah, see on-prem, back-end, off-site, back-end, on-prem, off-site, on-prem, off-site. Yeah, that's, that's what all of this is. Okay, so I think this is fine. The only thing that I'm slightly nervous about is uh if the vault stuff is gonna work <laughs> i don't know uh screw it let's try it whatever um all right so like i said this should be fine we don't have i don't think we have dev anywhere do we dev portal quirk dot tools ah it's working oh god it is up wait why is this why do these want to be deleted then Oh boy, I'm confused. All right, we need to uh, we need to do a little bit of digging. So I need to go to my personal Manjaro VM. I can't I can't delete these without knowing what the hell they're there for. <laughs> uh, all right, so I'm also nervous that I'm not using any of the credentials. When was the last time dev, dev was used? Offsite, on-prem, dev backend API was used yesterday? Crap. <laughs> so what is going on? Why, 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 why? Yeah, these are all supposed to be here. So why do you want to delete? Hmm? Is it because we don't have your records? But how did these get created? Like, these are all automation <laughs> created. Like, how, how did this happen? <laughs> I'm so confused. Unless they're Quirk machine users. Library, front end, worker, worker, cron, back end, bot. How were these made? I, I don't, I'm, I'm slightly confused right now, Tat. I don't know exactly how these were made. I mean, they had to have been in this state, right? Because it's saying that it wants to delete them. So my assumption is, is that this repository at some point had adds quirk machine users, history, setup users, circle CI, Pulumi. User provider. Yeah, that's, that's totally right. User service. Can we look at the history of this file? Initial automation commit. Yes. Recording pipeline, discourse wiki. Huh. Save access key to vault. I 
I'm severely confused right now, chat. How did Dev ever see on prem offsite, on prem offsite, on prem offsite? Excuse me. We've never had like Dev anywhere. So I don't fully understand how these even got created. Unless like I just have code here that I like have not pushed up yet. Oh God. <laughs> I literally went into it and it's like, oh God, hang on. I, I bet you I have code I haven't pushed up yet. God dang it. Hang on, hang on. Oh, hey, look, it's a bunch of quirk related stuff. <laughs> yeah, I haven't pushed up this code. Okay. That's the problem. I haven't pushed up this code yet. All right. Um, yeah, that's that's 100% the problem is that this code has not been pushed up yet. Problem when you use more than one virtual machine to do your work, chat. I got I got to get all these I got to get all these repos out of here and into where they should be. Um, all right, so here's what I'm here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to take this code um, and I'm going to put it in with the working branch that we have right now. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so we're going to do this. We're going to go here. We're going to grab this. I'm going to do git switch dash C, right? Right. I'm going to rebase. Ugh. Pull origin. This should, there we go. So see how that brought in those changes, right? Okay. So then we want to go to, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on index, right? Okay. So we've got provider users and service users. So I think the reason why I did this chat was because um, I wanted to make it easier for me to create quirks. Yeah. See this, see this. Yep. Here it is. Chat. This is it right? It's literally right here. New back in API. Yeah. See this. So yeah. Yep. Yep. This is it. This is it right here. Yep. 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 And then look, yep. Here's our new stuff that we just added. Okay, cool. Perfect. That merged dude. Thank you so much. Linus Torvald for creating Git and making one of the truly best pieces of technology that's ever existed. <laughs> oh, dude, Git is so nice. Git is so nice. It can be a pain, but it's also super nice right now. <laughs> Time to uh, put some Git hard, reset hard commands in the dev setup on <laughs> No, 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 no. No, we just needed to make sure that we had this. Um, as a matter of fact, what happened was, is I probably apply this. So feature add, uh, quirk multi M's. Now, if we push this up, we should see only, uh, we should see only, okay. Yeah. So here we go. So we just pushed. Yeah. So there you go. There's our new pipeline and, oh man, that was terrifying chat. <laughs> that was actually scary. I saw that and I was like, whoa. Every love in software is a conditional love. Yeah, that's true. That's 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 fair. That's a fair argument. All right, so let's see what the refresh says now. Because now it should be a lot less. It was also right after you were talking about how deleting was bad. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's fun when you, like, get caught in circumstances like this. <laughs> that's why automation is good. That's why automation and standardization is good. Stick to what you're using. <laughs> don't don't break the don't break the mold, man. Unless you have to, you know. All right, here. So let's go here. Let's take a look at this run. I mean, my problem was in this. Yeah, there you go. Boom, seventy three unchanged. Yeah. Okay, that's that's better. That's that, that's a lot better. Yeah. Okay, so let's go here. 
Now we should just have the one. I love, I mean, Palumi is really great too. I, I, I wish they had runners on, I love that they put their star there. Uh, I wish they had runners. Like I wish they had their own runners. Cause it's, it's kind of, it's a bit of a bummer that I'm essentially like copying a link from within a runner to go to another runner, but it's fine. So if we go to diff statement, authorization token batch, da, 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 da. yep. It's all here. Cool. We look good. Cool. All right. We're good. We're good now. All right, so now what we want to do is, I wish Circle CR large. Yeah, yeah, I don't disagree with you on that one. Um, so this is a this is a bug. Oh gosh, I did not mean to do documentation. Uh, yo, dear Lord, thank you for the follow as well as Jason Born. Thank you for the follow. Appreciate you. Um, we look good now, Chad. We look good. We look good. So let's see what we got here. So now we've got all of this new Quirk resource stuff where it like can create some machine users for backends. All of this, all of this looks good. Um, we added a line there for some reason. Uh, okay. And then we've got some of this as well. Just random formatting, I'm guessing. Uh, and then user service. Yep. And this is where, yep. All of our new stuff exists. Perfect. Fantastic. All right, cool. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to, uh, we'll say, uh, this adds, uh, EC ECR permissions to, uh, Alta for LLC recording pipeline user uh machine user yep i do there you go i also have my nix dot files in there too but i would recommend taking a look at the first one uh unless you want to like go down a rabbit hole that you might not come back from here's another thing that's dope when we close prs in uh on github look at this boom done See that right there? Done. GitHub changed the status from in progress to done. I really like linear. Linear is, uh, I would recommend taking a look at the video as well. Yeah. Um, I really like linear a lot. They do a really good job. All right. So now if we rebase off of main and we go to our repo, quirk reputation, robotic. Dude, I love automation. Oh, Mike T. <laughs> automation is awesome. Y'all greens. Everything done? Did it work? Oh, we're on the update. Oh, the update's done. Hey, all right. So let's see if our changes happened. Right? Let's see if everything got deleted. <laughs> Hopefully it didn't. Uh, yep, we're good. Okay, we're good. We're still good there. So let's go to Alta 4 LLC recording pipeline. And let's go look at our policy and we should see, Hey, look at that. There it is. Chat. There it is. Now, listen, I could have just gone in here, clicked edit policy, copied and pasted some stuff and did a few lines of code, right? The reason why we automate is again, so much for being able to maintain state, manage state properly, like manage our resources in a sane approach. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I just, I just want to be clear that, you know, we, we, we do this purposely. Um, to be able to get this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of result. So yeah, looks good now. Um, all right, so let's go back to Notion. So we need to grant access. We did that. Okay. So storage is done. We got, we've got pretty much all of storage done. Um, we don't need new automation repos, but we need to update, update existing resources, right? So migrate the bucket. We don't need to worry about that right now. We don't need to migrate this yet either. Um, but we need to be able to grant access. We did that. Okay, cool. So at this point, if we go back to our chart, right, let's look at what we've got. We've got, yo, thank you guys for the continued rep ups, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, have you ever used Podman for containers learning about it? Uh, no, but I've heard good things. Like I know a lot of people who like it. So, uh, yo, imposed a gorilla. Thank you for the, uh, the rep ups. Appreciate you guys. Uh, but yeah, no, I've, I've heard things good. Like I know a lot of people who like it. We support. So what's funny is we support Podman in LSP containers and I don't I've never even used it. <laughs> the power of open source chat. Um but yeah, we we the project that the open source project that we created uh LSP containers, if you go to it, uh we actually have Podman support. Uh volume syncing, where is it? Podman support. Yep, right here. Yep. 
Um, again, I've never even used it, but uh, we, we do have support for it, which is pretty cool. So. If you end up using LSP containers with Podman, you'll be good. <laughs> uh, all right, cool. So what else we got? What else we got? So again, again, we can access the files. That's no problem. We can access the bucket now. We can access the ECR image, right? Um, you are welcome. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so what else do we need now? Okay, so... Oh, I hey! Don't you dare. Sorry, my cat was trying to rip the, the foam off the wall. <laughs> he seems to think that they're play toys. Um, okay, so the services can communicate entirely with the off-site stuff that they need to. They can also talk to any on-site storage that we need to. Do we think we're ready for coding chat? Do we think that now we are ready for programming? What do you think? Do we think we have everything? We've already got the Kubernetes clusters up. Never, yeah, no, never. That's fair, that's fair. Um, <laughs> always, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, okay, let's think about this, right? Let's think about this, right? So our job's gonna start, right? And it's going to you do some kind of code that, like we haven't done that yet, but it's gonna do some kind of code thing. <laughs> some kind of code thing. Uh, it's gonna do some kind of code thing and it needs to talk to the network drive. Well, we've got the network drive. We've got NFS, all that stuff's already there. So it can do that. It can do the conversion. Okay, conversion's done, step away. We go to archive. Archive starts, does the the mounting of the volume just like it did with the conversion stage. Archive uses our credentials to push up to Glacier. And then it deletes it. I think that's right. I think, yeah, I think we're good. I think we're now ready to start working. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I actually think we are. <laughs> um, okay. So then we need to implement our pipeline CLI. And this is going to be in Go. All right. So I want to talk to you guys about the next thing that I'm going to do, because this is something that for me was introduced to me at Hippo that like really kind of changed my perspective a lot, I think, on automation in pipelines. Okay. Um, what time is it? Two hours in? Oh, dang. Two hours in. Can you guys actually give me like a quick fiver? Do you guys mind if I take a super quick break and go to the bathroom and then we'll hop? Because we're about to program. Like we're about to, I'm about to teach you guys how you can standardize your actions in your pipelines without ever having to use things like orbs. You don't have to use things like, uh, you know, external uh, plugins that help you deploy, like all that crap you don't need to worry about. I'm going to show you with Go, how you can standardize your pipeline so that you can run your pipelines anywhere. And I know that this is true because this is exactly what we do at Hippo. Um, so yeah, give me a quick minute. I'm gonna take a super quick break. Uh, if you guys are new to the channel, be sure to check out that little blurb right there, uh, as well as check out our Discord, uh, social media, and the YouTubes. Remember, all sorts of good stuff out there. We're not going anywhere. Again, like I said, I'm just gonna take a quick break. Uh, I also run ads during the break as well. If you don't know why we do that, it's basically so you don't have to watch them yourselves. Um, if you don't wanna see ads though, you can always subscribe to the channel with Twitch Prime, um, or uh, I think you can also not get ads through Twitch Turbo if that's still a thing, I don't know. But anyways, I'm gonna take a super quick break. Enjoy all of that sweet content in the meantime. Oh, by the way, we also have a wiki. If you're ever curious about any of the stuff we're ever working on, you can always check out the wiki. All sorts of great information, as well as every past stream with its own uh, agenda, all that kind of stuff. If you guys don't know, we store every stream on the wiki. So if you go here, click on our last stream, you'll be able to see the VOD, as well as like a breakdown, how we got everything set up. And we're gonna be going through some of this today. I'm gonna show you guys how you can do local development with Kubernetes as well because we need that for what we're about to do so a lot of good stuff on the way give me a second i'll be right back and then we're gonna hop into this and we're gonna get some more work done all right give me one second bear back hey sorry about that <laughs> thanks i always see that's yeah i appreciate that <laughs> just me going off on a roll without you know realizing i was muted mctance thank you buddy um so what i was saying 
before I realized uh, that I was muted again, thank you, McTan, um, was I think, uh, for starters, thank you, everybody who stuck around. Appreciate that. I think one of the things that's funny about streaming, and I think any streamer can relate to this, is, you know, we all realize that we're in, like, I, I think you get to a point where you realize, like, you're an entertain, like, you're an entertainer. I'm not standing here with a guitar in my hand or a drums in front of me, per se, but, like, I'm, I'm entertaining you. Like, I'm, I'm doing it through what I do, you know? And I realize that, like, the moment I get up to, like, take a break, it's, like, my immersion. <laughs> my immersion is gone! Um, so I appreciate you guys giving me a second to... This stuff is, you know, it's a lot of stuff we go through here. So being able to actually take a break and <laughs> let my mind uh, relax is, is appreciated. Plus, I got more tea. All right, so... I want to talk to you guys about how you could standardize your pipelines, okay? So one of the challenges that we had at Hippo, um, and this was actually something we we deal with it even, like right now even, I have to deal with this on some level. So I want you guys to have a brain experiment with me here. Like, let's all put on our, put on our, you know, our magic hats and uh, let's let's think about this together, okay? So say you are somebody brand new and you're like, I'm going to go to circleci.com and I'm going to create some pipelines, right? Now we're just saying from complete scratch here, we're just going to create some pipelines, okay? So I say, all right, well, I'm going to use their docs and, you know, let's figure out how to create a pipeline, right? So we go in here and we click on pipelines and we say like, you know, uh, okay, what's a very simple pipelines overview? Cool. So we see like an overview, blah, blah, blah. None of this matters except for the whole point of me saying that you will then proceed to follow a process that what you don't fully realize is in a lot of ways, vendor lock-in. Um, the idea is that as you follow these processes, you're going to like go to jobs and steps, right? And you're going to go, okay, well, how do I do a job? Okay, well, I got to write this YAML like this and I... I got to do this and okay, cool. Right. You see here how like my first job does this and then my next job does this and then this does this. Right. And you know, you like, this is very, very standard when we talk about CI, right? This is something everybody here who's ever dealt with CI, I'm sure has experienced with on some level, whether if it's GitLab, GitHub, whatever. Right. <clears throat> but when you start writing these, and you turn around and you look back like a year later, you're going to notice and realize that a lot of this is built for that specific pipeline or, or CI platform, right? You'll look at it and you'll go, oh man, I really use services here. Can I go anywhere else that uses services? And you now have that requirement, right? Or, or you might have that requirement or, oh, we use, you know, secrets like this. Can we, you know, we can't use them like this anywhere else. Right. So this is what I kind of mean by uh, this is a way of vendor lock in where now you, you really have like pipelines, but you really have circle CI pipelines, right? They're not pipelines, but they're, they're, they're specific to the provider that you're working on. Um, thank you, Vinny. Appreciate you. Now, Avi is very, very good at, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, taking his idea and, and kind of breaking it down in ways that like we can relate to at work. And one of the things that Avi constantly says to us at work is he looks at our pipelines like pipes in bash. Right. And the idea of that is, is like I should be able to like cat something and then grep, you know, uh, something and then like, you know, awk, and then like, you know, something, right? But the idea is, is that these interfaces, right, are completely like standardized, right? Like these are just standardized interfaces. So we don't have to care what we're sending through these pipes, right? <clears throat> and so a better way of thinking about that is essentially saying that these are our pipes, these, these uh, steps, and each one of the steps is like a specific uh, interface or, or a entry point of either custom logic or something like that, right? So when he kind of explained that to us, I think my first thought, was, I was like, what? I don't understand this at all. But when I started realizing how we were implementing it, that's when it started to click. And so you have to ask yourself the question, okay, well, if you're 
not writing your steps or you're not particular or you're not like you know putting all of your logic in these templates where are you putting it right like how are you making it so that it's so so you know uh it, it's uh potentially you know uh agnostic to any ci system but how are you like how are you doing that like how, how does that work if you're not writing it in templates like this so what I found out was that we were going to create something called a, uh, a uh, well, what we call it Serengeti release. But what it actually is, is it is a, in our case, it's a Python CLI tool. <clears throat> and the whole concept behind this Python CLI tool is, is that it has the commands built into it that handle either the step and or steps that you would take in your CI, right? The reason why you use like, you know, run command, run deploy, or you write this like this is because you don't have any automation around it, right? You're not, you're not automating any of that process. You're literally writing the code step by step as it is. Now, to give you a better example of this, I'm actually gonna go to our Hippo build repository and I'm gonna show you how this works side by side. So if I go to hippo build and then I go to templates and I go to Safari service circle CI, right? We're going to go to a, our standard circle CI template, right? <clears throat> now, as we go through this, you're going to notice things that are very similar, right? Like build Docker where we, you know, do some login and stuff. And then we build Docker, right? Like there's no CLI here. This is just us using the Docker CLI. The reason for that is, is because we don't need to reuse that CLI. There's literally no point to that whatsoever, right? So we just use the normal Docker CLI here, but look what happens when we get to Lint. Lint actually goes, Hey, no, no, no. You're going to use an entry point script and you're going to tell it the command you want to run. And that's it. You're not gonna, you're not gonna run, you know, uh, ESLint dot, dot, dash, dash, blah, 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 blah. You're not gonna do any of that, right? You just have a script and you get an entry point command. <clears throat> That's it, right? And so what we do is then if we go to like a service like risk scoring service, and then we go to entry point, you'll notice that in their repository, the developer or us can choose what their entry point is. So when I tell you, how do you standardize your CI system so that you don't have to have those tasks all in your CI code, right? You can put them somewhere else. It's by having these types of pipes, these entry points where we say, okay, well, if you want to lint these, by the way, chat, this is the same command for every repository in our company. I, I sh the nay chat. If you go to any repository in our system, the entry point.sh exists because it is a standardized requirement. You cannot run pipelines without having that standardized requirement. And if you want to be able to lint, then you have to be able to also include the command and then your commands that you want. So we, don't have to worry about what you and how you lint, right? We just care about the commands and the entry points to get it so you can lint, right? <clears throat> and it's another thing here as well, right? Like if we look at test, like look at test. Now test has just got like all this stupid, like, don't worry, this is all internal pipeline. Like, like these are just, you know, stupid test pipeline code. So none of this is actually valid. So don't worry. We're not, we're not doxing anything here, but look, if we go all the way down to test, look, it's that same entry point command, but this time we're doing the test command. Oh, my password is my secret. <laughs> uh, lint is code validation. So linting is like code styling validation i think it's not so much like code validation it's much it's more like hey we have a standardized way of practicing you know what i mean uh or a standardized way of uh writing code these are our practices and you need to adhere to these rules uh for your code to be committable do you lint and then commit 
do you mean like do you developers can run lint at any time we run lint in ci as a you know just like a precaution yeah uh i like code beautify yeah but we don't actually it's like it's it's beautify without or i'm sorry it's prettify without like formatting it, it just yells at you <laughs> like that's it just yells at you it's just like hey fix it <laughs> so okay um but does that make sense chat i want you to ask me questions if this doesn't make sense but as i'm telling you right this test command is also the same test command for every single repo why is that because every single repo has an entry point.sh with that command in it where we can put what we actually want it to run <clears throat> Excuse me, my apologies. But again, what? So what's the difference here? What, so essentially, what we're saying, Chad, is is we're saying that the the commands that we run in pipelines are also the commands we run locally. No, it doesn't stop the pipeline. <clears throat> you can't merge without it being successful, right? So we have two. We have two steps, right? We have. Uh, feature branch or we have two like workflows we have like feature branch workflows right which is non uh environment branches and that's like master dev whatever you know what i mean um and then feature branches which is just like star <laughs> anything else really um and the feature branches get validated with test lint build actually it's build lint test technically and then anything else that it might have doesn't deploy Right, and then once you merge, you do all the same steps again and deploy. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, like I said, right, it, what we've done at Hippo is we have created these entry points that are existing in the repositories. That, again, it's just one command everywhere, and then the commands are you know used with the scripts in that specific repo. Uh, do you circle CI pipelines like? Uh, the one here to promote through environments uh, a version uh, we do in at hippo yeah we do at hippo I don't uh, I don't um, at alt f4 or you know we don't for our company yet but that's just because I haven't solved the CD problem yet <clears throat> I don't know how I want to do continuous delivery yet tecton might actually be the CD solution by the way I really like tecton so if we can make this work, there's a solid chance that Tecton will be the CD deployment system. Um, <clears throat> whoo, excuse me, sorry, Chad. I got I got something in my throat. Let me just let me just take care of this. One second, sorry. One second, Chad. Dude, I love the tea I bought. Like I I really do. It's so good. Um. So it's just shaming the dev. Nice. Yeah, pretty much. Just saying they're stupid, you know. What are you thinking, you dummy? But with, you know, nicer words. <laughs> uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. Cool. So let me show you a counter to that, right? So I've shown you these, like, entry points, right? Remember how I told you that I was going to show you what's normal, right? Well, here's what's normal. This is what is, or I shouldn't say normal, but this is what normally is created, right? You go in and you say, like, okay, I want to report coverage. My step. All right, here's my first step. Here's my second step. But, like, look at this, chat. Look at all of this, you know? And, again, don't get me wrong. I know the person who made this. They made it super, super well, actually. Like, for, it, for this to have ran across every pipeline for, like, almost a year now, it's, it's, he did a really good job, like, just making this clean and simple for creating our artifacts and reporting coverage and stuff. But like it came up the other day that this actually has started to finally break. And what we're going to do is, is we're going to take all of these steps and we're going to turn it into an entry point Boop, right there. Uh, and we're literally going to do that. Um, <coughs> the only difference is it's not going to be an entry point. Uh, the second part of this, or the, the next part of this is, uh, we do what is called, we create a Serengeti release repository. I told you about that, right? That is a actual CLI tool that we use in our pipelines. Now I told you that we use the entry point as a CLI tool, but what you can also do, do is, is you can create 
a more generic CLI tool that you can run in your pipelines to handle these tasks for you, right? We use the entry point because that's a little bit more like directly per the developer or the developer's team repository, like how all that's set up. Like we don't, you know, if they want to run yarn test versus NPM test, like whatever, it doesn't matter, right? Like we, we don't care about that. We don't have to change the template for that to be a problem. But in the circumstance where we like deploy everything the exact same way, right? We can actually say like, okay, well, let's create a really well written, you know, uh, CLI tool that's testable that can like utilize uh, SDKs and like all these other things so that we're not just writing code like this, right? But we're actually like writing real logic in a program. And then just like we have those entry points dot sh files we're going to use that cli as an entry point and this is actually how we do our deployments at hippo our deployments are standardized and built into a cli tool called serengeti release and the cli or i'm sorry the ci the continuous integration runs the command or the command line uh for it and so you'll see here like <clears throat> instead of us doing all of this right? What we're going to do is we're going to take all of this and then we're going to make a command in Serengeti release. Maybe, I don't know. Um, but it'll be like, you know, uh, Serengeti release space instead of release, uh, you know, report coverage, right? And then it'll take arguments and stuff like that. It could take like what all of these arguments are, and then it'll do exactly what this does right up here, but it'll do it programmatically. And again, this is how we can then say, all right, well, this is how we do reporting. Now we're going to do reporting this way anywhere in any pipeline, right? Because it's in our CLI tool. It's not in the actual pipelines themselves. So the big, the big like explanation behind all of that is, is we're going to do that. <laughs> we're going to create a CLI tool that handles the steps that we want in our pipelines. Um, and that CLI tool should effectively be able to convert and archive and and potentially do anything else that we want it to right uh this might not be related but do you have multi-tenancy solution or need for multi-tenancy um in what sense like uh what uh sorry i'm not sure what you're relating it to what for what would i need multi-tenancy <clears throat> Sorry. Um, okay, cool. So like I said, we should have a CLI tool that can handle conversions and archiving and technically even potentially scheduling, right? Scheduling pipelines too. So that tool actually exists. I've already created it <laughs> uh, and I can show it to you now. Um, I created a new Go tool called Release Pipeline uh, CLI. And if we go to go, you'll see here it is right here. See this record, or I'm sorry, not release pipeline, recording pipeline, see uh, recording pipeline. I should probably call this CLI. Yeah. Um, and so, or actually, no, let's just keep it as recording pipeline for now. Yeah. But this is essentially a go CLI tool that I have created to help with uh, these steps, right? So as I told you, we should have a step for convert, right? So let's open up our CLI and sure enough, look at this. We have a command in here uh, or a file in here for conversions. Now, uh, this isn't completed. This is just essentially where I left off. So we still have work to do. Um, but the TLDR is, is that this command takes three arguments. Uh, two are required, right? And one is optional. In this case, it's input file and output dir, which are required and then overwrite is optional. And the idea here is, is that this command takes a path to a file, right? And it takes a path to an output directory, and then it will take that file and it will convert it, right? Um, and I wrote this with Cobra. We're using Cobra to, uh, to actually um, generate the CLI and all the arguments and stuff um, in commands. And then we're using LogRus for all the logging. So now if I do like go run, right? And if I say like uh, convert or here, let's do uh, Nix. I actually need to go into Nix shell on this one because I need FFmpeg. Okay, and so now I should be able to, yeah, do this right here. So if I do, where is it? Not schedule, we wanna do convert. There we go. 
All right, so if I run this command right here, which here, let's get more, more space. You're gonna see I'm running go run dot convert input file, right? Here's our input file, which is on our share. And then output dir, which is just going to downloads. And I'm saying overwrite, so go ahead and overwrite. So if I hit enter, look at that, I start converting. <clears throat> so what does this mean? So this means that as long as my CI has all the dependencies it needs to be able to do this, again, being able to connect to the file system, being able to run the CLI tool by pulling it down, being able to uh, have FFmpeg in it if it needs to, right? All that stuff, then I should be able to run this in CI. So we're just literally taking this command, right? And putting it into, putting it into CI. And we can actually see this working because if I go to top, we should see FFmpeg, there it is right there. So this is actually working. We're gonna cancel that though, cause I don't need all of that. Um, and we're gonna move on. Yo, right, Joy, did you really just like write all of that down? Holy crap. <laughs> Thank you for the 15 months with the tier three, my dude. The continued support at tier three, man. You absolutely don't need to do that, but thank you, thank you so much. We really appreciate you, man. How you been, by the way, dude? Hope all is well with you. Uh, uh, say deploy versions of a specific, uh, uh, play deploy, say deploy different versions of a service for a specific region or whatever. Just something we might need for my work. Oh, 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 do I have a need for it? Yeah, yeah, no, we're, I mean, yeah, at Hippo, we're absolutely multi-tenancy. Um, uh, not so much for Quirk, uh, just because we're not at that scale yet, but eventually, eventually we will, yeah, for sure. Uh, where are these videos coming from? Pulled from somewhere or are they new recordings you all make? So, uh, Glam, to give you a little bit of background, um, TLDR, we run Ubiquity products as all of our networking. <laughs> so, and we're running like their new shit, <laughs> whatever that means. But essentially all I'm saying is, is that we we're trying to run the latest and greatest that we can because we run everything on the network. Um, so all of our VODs go through the Ubiquity stuff and then go to our, um, our data center or our on-prem stuff. Um, and then that is stored there for us to use. And the network is set up with like multiple VLANs and stuff so that uh, we're able to access those. So technically I'm on a Windows machine. Sorry to break your immersion here, chat, <laughs> but I am. Uh, and so like, if I go to this PC, you'll see here's that production storage right there, footage, Twitch. And so this storage is all of our VODs um we are essentially completely networked for uh for all of that so whenever this is done i'll drag and drop it onto the network store and then it's except you have something ripping down your vods um no no this is a straight recording out of obs yeah this is we're doing the dual recording yeah yeah sorry yep 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 yeah we're doing uh so here um let me see if this might help. Uh, technical design documents. You might be interested in this. Actually, I feel like you definitely would be interested in this. Um, so this is a technical design document I wrote on how our stream setup is achieved, which I'm sure, again, you being like a super tech head, you would you'd super geek out over this. Um, but the TLDR is, is that we're all, we're all analog, baby. Uh, I, 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 I'm not doing any more networking crap. We've tried V, uh, we've tried, uh, V band. We've tried NDI. We've tried RTMP. We've tried all those things. Um, and so, uh, we just realized like pass throughs and like switches and like in audio interfaces was just the best way to go. Um, and so we stay analog basically until we get to the, the machine, um, and then we drop off, uh, we drop off that file as the MKV, uh, which is another one actually record. Yeah, here you go. This is the actual, this is the actual for anyone else as well. If you guys are curious, this is the actual, uh, technical document I'm writing on <clears throat> like how we do it, right? We store OBS recorded videos in the MKV format. Uh, the reason why we store it, um, basically MP4 has the potential of breaking, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, and then we talk about like how we use FFmpeg, how we were originally doing the conversions, and then like how we want to achieve it. <laughs> Uh, I completely agree. I was using NDI for something, but yeah, dude, it really is better to run. Like anyone we know who's interested in streaming, again, anyone out there interested in streaming, if you want to do streaming, I highly recommend just using hard lines. It's going to it's gonna make your life a lot easier. Um, so yeah, so we have the network drive, right? That we can run this. Now, again, all this is underneath the hood uh, is just a uh, command. Right, like I'm, I'm not doing anything fancy, right? I'm just running a command, and as I just showed you, uh, if we go back to our files, right? If I go to convert, right? This is Go code, right? This is a, this is a CLI tool that I built in Go, and I have a custom convert dot run uh, function, and if we go to that function, we'll see that in it, we actually write all of the logic for using FFmpeg, loading in the file. Uh, re uh, producing the actual logging output, like all of that is in here, right? And so we're really just, like I said, we're writing a CLI tool that's really wrapping around some other, some other tooling or some other custom logic and stuff like that that we want, right? Um, so again, when I when I go into my Nix shell really quickly and then I run this uh, this command, right? All I'm doing is is I'm running a CLI tool with an input file to a path that should be existing. And again, these are, this is that concept of just pipes. Like I'm just, I'm not, I'm not making it care about where the file is or, or per se of like, you know, do we know that it's on a network shared? Like we don't, we're not solving that problem. Like we just, that's not a problem we care about. We'll figure that out where it needs to be solved, right? This is just, hey, we need the steps and the processes for what we want to do in one place. And we want to make that super portable. So let's put it in a CLI tool, right? Anything that relates to like files or like, you know, requirements outside of it, we just have to figure out how to make our CLI tool work with those requirements, right? So again, input file exists on our shared storage somewhere. We don't care about where it is. We just know that the pipeline, like when I run this command, I should be able to run this command here, just like the pipeline can run it. And we both should be able to run this. That's another thing that's really nice about creating a CLI tool is I can test all of this locally. Um, and so, yeah, so we hit enter again, uh, uh, no such file or directory. What did I do? Remove. Oh, I don't need the overwrite. Got it. There we go. Yeah. And again, you can see how it loads it from the network, starts converting it onto my downloads. Okay, cool. So now that we understand the CLI tool, and again, if you have questions, please feel free to let me know. We're going to go ahead and go a little bit further and we're going to make more of the CLI tool. <laughs> um, oops, that's not what I wanted. This is what I wanted. Okay, so let's go back to recording. Uh, print working directory. Cool. I mean, go. Okay. So the other thing we wanted to do is, is we wanted to see if we can, so checklist implement CLI. So we need to be able to schedule pipelines, right? So that's something we need to be able to do, uh, schedule pipelines command. Uh, that's also one I've already done. So if we go to the schedule command, we'll see that it's got the same type of setup as, you know, the other CLI, cause we're using Cobra, right? Um, but you'll notice again, I'm writing the code in a way that's very simple, right? I just have a function that runs. And if I go to that function, this is where most of my main logic is. So in this case, we have a function called find files, right? So the CLI tool will take a input directory right here, right? And then it will iterate through that directory and look for anything that has a MKV in this case, right? So we say, okay, cool. Look for anything that's an MKV. If it's not an MKV, we just skip. We don't care about stopping. We want to look through everything, right? But we just want to skip that one, just move forward, right? In this case, if it is, we found a schedulable file and then we append that file to the array, right? Very simple logic, super, super simple logic. Uh, this is actually Nix. Uh, Actually, I do know what it is now. <laughs> that was that was before I, I used Nix, but now I do know what Nix is. Um, but yeah, this is Nix OS. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So again, super, super simple. The CLI tool just looks for some files. And right now, this isn't fully implemented. So what we actually need to do is say like to do implement 
Kubernetes pipeline scheduling, right? Um, or pipeline creation is really what we want to call it because they're, they're pipelines that are created. Um, but we should be able to at least run this and, uh, and get some type of output. So we're going to do this. We're going to say, go run. We're going to add verbosity here because there's some underlying logic that we kind of want to see if this is going to work. Uh, and then we give it the path, right? Now, this same path is the path that we used in the convert command, right? Think about that. If I go back to uh, recording Nix, right? And then we go back to the convert command, right? Look, input file is the path that we're looking for schedule input dir. This is an example of those pipes that I'm talking about, right? It's a command that just takes some type, type of parameter and we know we're probably gonna have to reuse that parameter again later. This time it's input dir, so it knows how to look for all of the files that are MKV versus this one being input file because it's going to only process an individual file. But the two commands help each other, right? So now if I run this command, we should see, okay, look, found schedulable file, right? We said that that was output we get in debug, right? And then info, we see scheduled recording pipeline, scheduled recording pipeline, scheduled recording pipeline. So that means that that command is also working. So, so far we have a scheduled pipeline command and a convert files uh, or convert file command, right? Now, if we go back here, the other thing we said we need is an archive command. Now I haven't done this one at all, but I have uh, archive file command. And I, or I have actually created the boilerplate for it. So if we go to archive, we'll see that this file is a fresh file. It's really got nothing in it. Um, but if we look at it, we'll see that it says archive called um, so that if we at least run it, bare minimum, go run dot uh, archive, archive called, right? So we have that in place. So what does this mean? So that means that theoretically in a pipeline we should be able to do uh convert and and go run dot uh archive right and then when we need to schedule stuff we should be able to do go run dot schedule like that so the process is go run schedule is ran here right go run convert is ran here, right? And then go run archive is ran here, right? And the CLI can handle all three steps and use the same image and everything or same binary and everything. Uh, and it's now made it so that this doesn't have to worry about how it actually converts things, right? This doesn't have to worry about how it actually converts things. And this doesn't actually have to worry about how it schedules things. It's just a service that runs a command, right? And the logic is in the command. Um, so that's what we're building, chat. That's what we're, or at least that's what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to build a CLI tool that we can run these commands in so that we can then uh, run them in our pipelines. And the goal really should be to be able to run the CL or the commands locally and expect them to work the same way in, in CI, right? Um, so again, we have convert. Convert is like, pretty much done i don't think there's really much else we need to do for convert um schedule needs to be done um but i don't want to work on schedule yet i think i want to work on archive and then i want to work on convert and then i want to work on schedule because if you think about it that's us working backwards that's working on our dependencies on which one depends on which right archive needs uh, or convert needs archive and schedule needs to be able to use the convert command and the archive command so we're kind of looking at it saying okay let's do archive first and then we'll convert and then we'll we're working backwards right um okay so if we go to the archive command and we kind of just write some pseudo code here just to be like all right well like what do we need to do right like what exactly do we need to do i would say the first thing is we need to be able to look up a file based off of in uh, a uh, CLI flag, right? So we need to be able to look up a file based off of a CLI flag. Uh, we need to uh, uh, be able to upload that file to AWS S3 uh, Glacier, right? 
and then we need to be able to uh, verify that the file is uploaded and safely remove it, right? So that's what this function is going to do. It's going to, uh, or this command is going to do. So when I run, right, go run dot archive, right? I'll probably have something like input file like before, right? I'll have some random path, you know, mount NFS production footage, uh, OBS, uh, MKV or no. Yeah. Sorry. MKV right? Because we want to archive our MKV files and then the actual file name, right? And then we'll probably have something like uh, bucket, right? And then that's Alta for LLC, right? Here's how we get back to our bucket that we were working with either earlier recording bucket, right? And then we could even say something like uh, clean afterwards if we want to make it so that clean can be optional or not, right? Um, and so if we wanted to say like, all right, we'll actually turn it, turn clean off, you know, we'll make it so that it doesn't remove it in the pipelines, then we can just easily make that a feature. But as I said, this is completely separated from the CI, right? This is our own steps running in our own code. We can run this anywhere, right? That's the goal of this CLI tool is to make it so that again, if I want to, if in the future, if I was like, you know what, I actually think I'll just run this with circle CI. I could, <laughs> I totally could. I could just run it on my own self-hosted runners and run it in circle CI. So again, that's the power of having this type of tool and saying like, we're going to standardize these steps in, in a CLI tool or something like that we can write and not put it just in YAML. Manage, man, listen, YAML has taken us to pretty interesting places. Okay. But what I'm going to say about it is managing it is complete, utter dog shit. Uh, it is okay. I hate managing YAML. I it's just it's it's the equivalent of feeling like you are like under a pile of papers. It sometimes just sucks. Uh, and so like we can have nice things, okay? So being able to write stuff in like logic with like actual languages is just it's so much nicer. Uh, yeah, it's so much nicer. Uh, can you shove data directly into S3 Glacier, or was that done using lifecycle policies? You can shove directly into data. Oh, you can shove it. Just right into glacier <laughs> um yeah <laughs> sorry i had to i had to watch myself on playback on that one i didn't know what kind of face i made um i think i'm the only one at my work that customized our ansible playbooks uh my yaml hat i mean hey that's but listen that's the that at least that's the yaml you at least want to be modified <laughs> you're at least helping the world with that you know what i mean that's that's not just YAML, but that's also like automation. Like, I don't know, like I'm, I'm talking more like Kubernetes manifests and stuff like that stuff is just, oh, or, or any type of cloud infrastructure focused YAML is, is, is rough automation. I feel like, especially Ansible, like glam, you might appreciate this uh, as well, dude. I'm just like, you know, sharing you all my stuff today. Um, my dot files, my, my original dot files, uh, are automated with Ansible. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and I actually made a YouTube video on it, on how you can do it. Um, but yeah, my my whole dot files are actually an automated with Ansible. And so like, if you go to like roles, you'll see like all of the stuff I install with and how I automated it. And yeah, no, like I, I really do love this approach. The only reason why I don't, or why I'm not using it right now, because I technically still do, um, is because I've been trying Nix OS and Nix OS is like declarative. It's all configuration based. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good watch. I, I have moved to Pulumi for my Kubernetes management. I forget how to write YAML for Kades. Good, good. That means that you like to be able to like, you know, enjoy your time on this planet. Um, yeah, dude, it's so much easier to write it in like, cause here's the thing too, man, if you think about it, YAML, unfortunately, also doesn't have like a language server, right? Like you don't have types and things like that. And so Pulumi, you can like the languages do, you know? And so it's like, you don't, I don't even have to think about describing manifest half the time because of like, I just use the auto completion. <laughs> um, managing cloud formation YAML is living hell, especially when you want to add logic based on the environment you want to deploy to. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't disagree with you on that one. I don't, I'm, I'm not a big fan of cloud formation, to be honest with you. That's, Pretty much why I stick to Pulumi and other 
services like that. I am stoked I found your stream. I technically don't work in DevOps, but interface a lot of pieces of it. So I want to get... Yeah, dude, absolutely. I'm stoked. Like, again, man, I... It's, it's, it's really mind blowing because oh by the way no sympathy is the other is the other big uh you know person in the warframe community that i used to watch a lot of too um and again chat like this is this is the craziness about twitch um if you guys don't know glam you guys you definitely you guys should definitely check him out he's awesome streamer super good vibes great community um but yeah, no, when we first started streaming way back in the day, uh, we did not know where to stream. We didn't know where to go. And one of the things that's tough about streaming early on in your, like, I guess, career or whatever you want to call it is, yeah, like it, it, you, you kind of are like a fish out of water. Like you don't really know like where you're comfortable. You don't know like where you're, you're like, I'm comfortable sitting here talking with you guys being myself because I like you are my people. <laughs> we are all nerds. I like that. Um, but like, it took a long time to like find that community. And, you know, one of the things that I thought was really cool about Glam and No Sympathy, the other streamer I'm talking about was they had really, or, you know, the, when I first saw them, they had really great communities and like, I'd always go back and it was just like that can, it was a repetitive, consistent, like good experience. Um, and like a lot of streamers, I think want to get to that, but it's hard to get there. And I don't even know if we're fully there yet. Um, but yeah, no, that was something I inspired from heavily uh, was like, oh, smaller communities. You don't have to be like, you know, 5,000, 10,000. Although one day it would be cool to get there, whatever. Uh, but yeah, you don't have to be at that level to to be able to have a really cool entertainment and fun experience. So, yeah, shout out to both of you guys. Uh, he's still there. I'm sure. I'm sure that man is a that man is a tank like he I I've seen I, again I've, I've I've every now and then I go back into the Warframe channel and check it out just for like nostalgia's sake <laughs> um but yeah we we war, we streamed in Warframe for like six months I think and then and then I was like I'm gonna try this programming thing uh and yeah crazy um okay cool so like I said this is a command and yeah dude seriously I'm so glad that you're here I, it's it's crazy that this kind of stuff happens on Twitch um so we want to look up a file based off a of CLI flag. We want to upload a file to AWS Glacier, and we want to verify that our file is uploaded and safely remove it. So why don't we work on that? Let's let's do that, right? So we've got archive bucket and archive file. Um, what I'm going to call this actually is archive input file. Um, or you know what? We'll just call it archive file. I, I don't really know if I want to keep the input. Well, maybe we'll get rid of the input thing. Um, so we want to look up based off of a, uh, of a CLI flag. So if I go to convert, I think we've already got a convert. I think we've already got like a lookup of some sort. So we do an iOS stat. So that's going to be something we want. So let's just do that, right? Uh, essentially, we're just checking to see if it exists. So bam, that's in there now. Um, we don't need to do a probe or anything like that because we're not using FFmpeg. Um, we don't need to do file name. Do we want to do file name? Yeah, we're going to need file name because we're going to want to, uh, be able to give that the name in S3. That's going to be the, uh, the file, the whole path, but it's going to remove the path and just give us the name with the extension. That's what this function does here, this base. Um, what else do we need? What else do we need? We don't need to change it. Uh, we don't need to do that. Uh, don't need to do that. We could use this, I guess, just for some logging output. Not really too sure what we'll log, but you know, it's good to have logging, you know, good, good, good to have it. So we'll, we'll do something with it. Um, okay. So let's do this log Russ and then, uh, boop. And then we also need to do, uh, the, oh gosh, this. Oh, here, file path. Okay, and what else we got? What else we got? Uh, OS, perfect. Okay, oops, and what else we got? We got don't need that anymore. What else we got? Input file, ah, that needs to be archive. Uh, now the reason why we're doing like uh, archive dash and so forth and so on is, is because the way that you write co uh, Cobra commands, um, they all stay in the same module or the same package or whatever you want to call it. Um, but what that technically means is like, if I go to another command, say like convert, right? That means that if I were to do this per se, oops, nope, sorry. I have got fat fingers right now. If I was to do this, 
Uh, oh wait, I need to go somewhere that I can actually use it. Yeah, I actually have access to it, right? See that? And that's because they're in the same package and anything in the same package, even if they're in different files, can be shared. It's kind of like Python in that regard. Um, and so we need to give them prefixes so that they don't have any collisions. Uh, and so we'll do log logrus.fatal. And we'll just give that an error. Uh, actually, no. Hmm. You know what? We want to abstract this away into a command. So here, let's do this. Actually, let's go and create a new new directory. We're going to call it archive, and then we'll create a new file, and we will call this one uh, lookup. Or no, maybe not lookup. Uh, we'll say yeah. I mean, I guess we could call it. The problem is, I already have a file called lookup, and that's going to make a collision in package names if I do that, unless we. Okay, that's probably a better play is we should abstract that into its own file. So archive, uh, we'll say dir files, right? And then we'll say uh, lookup.go and then we'll, cr we'll move everything into that lookup go file. So lookup um, and then we want to do convert schedule lookup. Wait, what? Oh, come on now. I know you're in here somewhere. Uh, no. Internal convert. Where's that lookup thingy? Probe. Do I not? Oh, did I like refactor that or something? Is that why it's not here anymore? Hmm. Schedule maybe? Maybe it's in schedule? schedule find files oh okay so find files is what we need to yeah let's move this so um we want to take this and then we want to go to lookup we're going to call this package files right and then oops we're going to do this there we go and then we'll just say find and so this is kind of like now like a find in a database where this is going to return us all the files of a directory that we give it. Um, and then what we might want to do is to make this a little bit more generic, unless we want to keep this MKV blocker, which really isn't that big of a, like right now I have no other use for it. So it's, it's kind of fine that it's staying there. Um, but the idea of basically of what I'm getting at here is, is that in the off chance that we don't want to skip on MKV for something else when we use this later, uh, we should make this a parameter instead of just having it be there and then being like, wait, what's going on? Um, so I think for now it's fine. Or what we can do is, is we can make this more specific. So we could say like find recording files, right? And then that will make it so that this only finds recording files in a directory that might actually make more sense for now. Uh, okay. So we'll do this is dir, um, or we could call this, I guess, dir path maybe or path Let's call it path. Cause it's technically a path find recording files. So files find recordings or we can call it find recordings. Yeah. I like that because it's, it's a, module called dude i hate naming stuff and programming naming stuff and programming is literally one of the most challenging things ever like uh would i just wish i could name everything freaking uuids or something uh okay so find recordings this will be a file or a thing that finds all of our recordings so now if we go back here uh we go to schedule see this how it's saying oh i don't know what find files is now that's because we deleted it uh, and so we wanted to go to, uh, not schedule, but files, see how that's an internal thing now, and then find recordings. There we go. Um, and actually now that I realize I don't have that lookup thing anymore, I think I am going to keep this as lookup. So instead of files, we'll just call this lookup. Because then we can have lookups for like all sorts of things, right? And then this can be files.go, right? I think that makes more sense. Um, okay, so then we'll go back here. 
we'll go to convert right uh oh no i'm sorry i mean schedule and it's gonna say yeah, i don't know what that is and it's like yeah that's totally fair you don't know what that is um let's go to look up and this needs to be changed to look up look up there we go look up find recordings and then we'll go back here and we're gonna go here and then this will become lookup dot find recordings bam i like it i like it chat okay cool so now that we've got that lookup right um we want to go to our archive right and so i think what we need to do is is we need to grab this go to lookup go like this look up flip them okay so this is fine recording so why don't we do funk find file or recording maybe so maybe like recording and then recordings or or maybe we need to change this to find all hmm. recording find all yeah i like that and then we'll just call this one recording find perfect all right so then we'll paste this in and what we want to do is, is we want to say that this is a path with a string and this is oops and then this is a path as well and then this is here like this perfect and you can see that we're slowly starting to strip that away okay so what we want to do is, is we want to say return we actually don't want to make this encapsulated we want to just uh what's up whisper how's it going uh i do wait what name me sorry i do uh start with a to z when you deplete uh that start duplicate oh god a a b oh god dude that would <laughs> i wish my mind thought like that that you literally almost broke me just making me trying to like think about that uh okay error so we do want to return an error we or we want to return the errors on this because i like to do my error handling above i'm not a big fan of uh like i like letting it propagate up or at least when it can i guess so let's do um uh bum bum stat error right and then OS stat and look at look at look at the beauty dude look at how look at how much tab nine is trying to work right now I I love tab nine so much it's such a good product listen I am I am super fine with chilling over tab nine because it's like it literally saves me so much time yeah so if you guys don't know what tab nine is uh tab nine is basically uh machine learning for your uh editor um it's not like uh copilot where it just writes all like you just go like i need the logic you write it for me it doesn't do that this is what we call contextual completion and the idea behind it is tab 9 looks at your code in real time uh and it can even send it up to their servers and stuff like that um but it gives you relative contextual uh auto completion based off of like what you're writing or what you have around you or like it's it's more focused on smaller auto completions that save you time like this right because this is actually almost right i think it's more this one i think no i think it might actually be that one yeah but um but yeah regardless like it does a very good job of being like oh do you need this and what's great about tab 9 too which i didn't even think about but I think in the past like six to nine months they've been adding models specific to the languages right so it doesn't just give you a model based off of what you're writing but it also gives you a model of like well okay this is how you would write this in this language is this what you want and so it can do it's just really good if you don't know what it is i just you know again i'm not trying to I'm not trying to make you buy anything. Um, I just think it's a really good product. I actually do pay for it. I have the yearly thing. Oh, by the way, we do have, if you do use tab nine, uh, yeah, think exactly. Think how code completion that learns your code. We do have a tab nine um, promo thingy. They did give it to us, which is pretty dope. So if you do use tab nine, I highly recommend you just buying our promo because it's literally 50% off for the whole year. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I like when they gave us that I was like wait seriously like that's that's a lot um so I I may have I may I may have you know oh whoops I was in the wrong window um you know I, I may want to be able to get on that at some point because I paid for the whole year for uh no so it's just it's year over year it's year over year so it's the first year for free um but I think like what you could do glam is you could let your current one roll out and then you could easily renew with ours <laughs> uh i might know a few people who've done that um it's not like a first time thing either it's just like it's just yeah it's just it's if you want it for the next year for free um so i and i i've paid for it full price so yeah uh use your promo using your promo code to buy one for yourself <laughs> Five head. Uh, hey, what happened to the Azure affiliate link? So the Azure affiliate link is coming back. The reason why we don't have the uh, Azure affiliate link there anymore is because when I went to it, I realized that it didn't do anything. <laughs> uh, they the link is broken. It doesn't work anymore. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to them. I think it's because the the link that they gave us was specific for what we were doing, and so I want to reach out to them and be like, hey, like we you know, you guys want us to put something up there, um, and we're gonna you know we might be able to see if there's other things we can get out of it so we'll see we'll see <laughs> i wish it was forever though dude man that'd be nice um okay so recording find right um and then what i want to do is like i said i want to do uh underscore uh stat error right and then actually it's just oh a stat dot uh path or OS. Yeah, see, there it is. See, it got it. It got it. Um, boom. And then if error, right? If error, uh, if error is not equal to nil. Oh, look at this chat. Holy smokes. Look at this. It's trying to, yeah, I love tab nine. Um, so we actually want this. We want to say if error is not equal to nil and is not exist then we throw an error right uh actually you know what i'm not even going to do the is not exist i'm just going to say if we if an error is not equal to nil we'll we'll just return the whole stat error i don't really care if it's not exist in particular well i guess it could be something else but i guess if there's anything wrong with the file we really don't want to mess with it if that makes sense you know what i mean do you prefer tabs or spaces? Recently, I worked on a project from a team that had a whole half using spaces, half using tags, and it was incredibly annoying. <laughs> Dude, do you know what I do with things like that? I'm not even kidding you. I've done this before. I literally auto format across every repo. <laughs> uh, and then like everybody hates me for like a week and then nobody talks about it ever again. Um, if you're not trolling, which I feel like you're not, I feel like you're actually asking me seriously. Cause I started reading it. I was like, wait, are you actually asking me this question? Um, so I prefer, uh, I prefer spaces. The reason why I prefer spaces is because spaces translate the same everywhere. And that is one thing that I think everyone can attest to is it doesn't matter like if you even if you use tabs to spaces right you're still going to get like if you're configured for four tab four tabs or four spaces per tab then you're going to get those four spaces right like and, and like i just i like that better because then it goes to like code like code review better you know and stuff like that i feel like you know especially when you mix the two it just ugh, it's terrible but I feel like the thing that stinks about using tabs in my personal opinions, just my personal opinion is that if you're somebody who like goes from like two to four or, or like always uses one or the other, um, it's incredibly annoying to deal with. Um, and so like if your goal is to have two spaces per tab, then do two spaces per tab like just give it to like don't make some like weird in you know things so that later on when somebody else uses it like it, it could actually be four you know versus two or something like that pretty i mean yeah pretty much glam yeah pretty much um i prefer spaces for indentable but for some reason 80 percent of the people i 
Well, so like that's essentially what Glam is kind of noting is is like in the underlying like encoding or whatever. Um, it's technically like you know slash 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 slash. slash. It's just like a sh ton of s's. <laughs> um, I don't know, but like, is that like I don't know. I don't really look at that ever. So I, you know, I don't, I normally look at it encoded versus not encoded, but there's an argument there too. I don't know, dude. Like it's, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's a complete argument that can go either way or the other. Uh, I'm digging the editor setup. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. But yeah, I, I just say use what you want. And if you end up working with other people, then I don't know. They're just gonna have to deal with it, I guess. <laughs> Or, you know, you make opinions around it that you all agree on and then, yeah. Um, okay, so what we want to do as well is we need to... Um, I don't actually have to make those opinions, thankfully, at Hippo, so it's not really that big of a deal to me. Um, yeah, I, I thankfully don't have to make those kinds of decisions. So we're going to say FS file info error, right? Because we do want... Uh, and I think this is going to be a pointer, right? Uh is this itself uh is this itself oops it's like fat finger file okay so that is okay so in that case then this would not be a pointer this would mm, no nope, it has to be a pointer because we return nil yep 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 so it has to be a pointer yep okay so then we'll do uh let's go here and then we'll say file and we can change this to error now because it's basically isolated. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to say file nil. And then this can just be a pointer. There we go. Okay, cool. Okay, so what is this going to do? This is going to take a path that we give it, right? Recording find. It's going to stat that to see if it exists, right? And if it exists, we're going to get file info returned. Now... If we say file dot, we should be able to say like mode, size, name. Cool. So we've got, we've definitely got data that I think we can use. Um, okay. So let's go back here. So let's do this now. Oh, we don't need this one over here anymore. Oops. Yo, what's up, Ikasi? How's it going? Uh, and then we'll go back here and then we'll say file error, uh, lookup dot recording find right and then we'll say archive file right so at that point if error or if uh error is not equal to nil thank you tab nine uh then we would say like for now or actually we could then we would say log rest dot uh fatal and the reason why we're still doing a fatal here but we put it in a function is is because then this is like the only fatal we actually have. And what's going to happen is, is as we build this out, this recording fine is, is going to like be put into a function itself. And then this will be just another error. So we're just, we're kind of just building it step by step right now. Um, so recording find file log rest fatal. And then this is our error dot error, which is a string. Perfect. Okay. So let's go ahead and do this as well. Let's go back to recording find. Now that we've got a little bit more logic, let's go ahead and give it just a little bit of uh, logging. Why not? Um, and so we'll say uh, file, or no, we'll say path, right? And path, or no, sorry, actually just this. Yep, and then we'll say file found. We can say recording file found, recording file found. Now I'm not going to make this info. I'm going to make this debug, right? But the reason why I'm doing that is, is because if I ever need to debug this logic, right? I can easily just say, okay, dash dash verbose, right? And then I'll know if this is finding the files or not because it's in this function, right? So this is kind of where like when you're starting to actually, you know, really start building things that handle multiple levels of logging. This is where this kind of stuff comes in handy, right? Dude, just leave, this is like a little bed, it's a little breadcrumb chat. It's a little breadcrumb that you say, okay, this is in debug. I'm not gonna worry about this right now, right? I don't care, it's in debug, right? But if I turn debug on, 
I'll know that this works. I don't have to then later on go, oh God, let me go put in my debug log output and make sure this works. Hold on. You know, like I don't have to do that in this scenario because it's already there and it's nice and pretty, takes care of the formatting and everything we need. So yeah, I, I recommend leaving yourself little breadcrumbs like this. Like if you're ever worried, like, ah oh, man, I don't know if this, like if this function doesn't work for some reason, I need to know what it returns. Just do it. Just, just add, just add it now. Just do it. Just add it. Okay. Just do it. Okay. Um, so, oh, oh, you know what we could say file recording. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is I, oh, a uh, found recording file. Yeah. Cause see, I'm like, I'm trying to find like, see this like found schedule file, right? Found recording file. Right. So that's the, that's the kind of idea here that we're, we're trying to, we're trying to do. Um, and so we can even do this as well. Oh no, that's, actually that's fine. Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, so we have our recording find, which takes our file, stats it, if it exists. Mm, if we get an error of any kind, uh, even if it doesn't exist, then we're good. Um, otherwise we say, hey, we found a recording file and then we move on, cool. Okay, so we need to then upload that file to AWS S3 glacier uh this is actually my first time seeing tab 9 in vim i live in vs code it's pretty nice man i mean i um i i i still use vs code like i i i don't really as much anymore because like you guys can't see it right now but like i have like a split hold on like i'm i'm pretty as you know as some of you may know like i've got like a split keyboard set up <laughs> like and like you know like i I guess what I mean to say is, is I'm pretty much like glued to the keyboard as much as possible. Um, and so when I started really start to do that, just be as glued to the keyboard as much as possible is really, really when uh, I started, you know, using Vim more and things like that, just because I hated having to move my hand. That was really it. Like it just, I found myself being like, oh, I don't have to do this in Vim. <laughs> and I was like, ah, I feel so unoptimal. And I was like, yes, I will. Um, but again, it's, I still use it for like a lot of like, uh, VS code's really nice for like YAML, like especially for YAML and a lot of other things. So I still, I, I guess it kind of depends. Like if I'm in logic like this, I use, uh, NeoVim, but if I'm, if I need like more of like a bigger view of everything, I feel like VS code does a pretty good job with that. Um, yeah, there is copilot for NeoVim too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forget who implemented it or whatever, but yeah, there's a, there's a plugin for it. Yeah. You and I mean, here's the thing I think too, is, is like, okay, so check this out for anyone who uses VS code, right? Um, I just want to show you guys why I made some of the decisions I made around what I have in Vim, right? So for example, one of the things I love about VS code is plain and simply that it's got a lot of nice plugins, like the user interfaces and stuff are pretty nice. So one of the things that I really wanted to be able to do was have a really nice uh, get integration, right? It doesn't have to be massively complex, right? Like I'm not trying to do tons of stuff, but I just wanted a nice diff right next to like all of my files and like, like just, just that, like just really what VS code has in this little diff viewer and stuff. I want that in NeoVim, right? And so how did I do that? Well, I embedded lazy git into it. Now lazy git is its own CLI tool, but because you have so much customization around NeoVim and stuff like it, right? I can actually say, okay, well, I'm just going to embed a CLI tool that I can then run as almost like a plugin in my main code uh, or in my editor while I'm working, right? Um, and so like, this is one of the ways that I manage my diffs, right? And so if I'm like, okay, I want to add this. Okay, that's been added. want to add this. Okay, that's been added, right? want to add this. Okay, that's been added, you know, so forth and so on. Um, same thing with Docker. If I do space LD, these are my Docker uh, containers, right? I can see all of the images I've pulled down and uh, any volumes I have and any containers I'm running. I can even look at stats on those containers and the environment variables and like all that kind of stuff. Um, what else? What else? I've got my, in my terminal, right? So I've actually got a terminal right here that I can use. So I want to be clear. There are things that I really, really loved about VS code that I knew like I just was not going to be able to live without. <laughs> so I, I don't think I would have been able to make them like, I don't like, I am not somebody who just uses NeoVim. Uh, I, I'm not somebody who just uses NeoVim like on a very simple level. Like I know like, like Avi, for example, my, uh, one of my coworkers, like he, 
he uses like bare bones neo vim with like no no real configuration and but here's the thing he's fantastic he's he's an amazing engineer and does and gets like tons of tons of done you know it's just that's how he got used to it you know i i got used to editors with auto completion and like all these other things and so it's just you know it's a choice but um yeah um okay so upload that file to aws okay so we now need to kind of actually start working with aws and uh go now this is something that's actually kind of new to me which is aws go client we need a go client Uh, you should add git delta to lazy git for a better diff view um yeah i feel like i actually know what that is but um i have not installed it yeah that's like an improved diff view right yeah i should actually make note of that delta yeah 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 okay yeah 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 it's a good call yeah check out diff view for diffs oh that did not oh it's because it's not a link Hold on one second. I want to, I always try and like copy down these recommendations because I'm always interested in, you know, trying new stuff. What's up, uh, the Nova? Nova Glow, how's it going, buddy? Those container stats of Dote, I would probably never look at them, but it's still very cool. I mean, yeah, they're, they're definitely helpful. Um, all right, so let's do, I, you know what? I'm just going to go directly to code samples. Uh, I have a ton of, I mean, hey, drop in the Discord, guys. If you guys have stuff for NeoVim, uh, which like it might make sense for us to actually create like a uh, here here I'm gonna create this for now there hi <laughs> um cool uh yeah feel free to share anything you want in there that's that's like brand new uh we normally would put stuff in like devops and programming and stuff but like uh actually here we could just call this vim bam there we go um cool yeah you can share yeah sh feel free share anything that well, i mean again we normally talk about it in these other channels it's just been recently that uh we've had more of like okay i'll make a channel on this so you know we're, we're just trying stuff out so yeah uh no but i think i have heard of it little waffle i think i've heard of it yeah uh our whole development is in github code spaces but the integration with code spaces into our org allows us to create a very tight developer experience in that it's easy to roll out changes all devs pass down to external so like i definitely think that that is super cool um i saw kelsey hightower recently put out a tweet about how uh like i think there was like conversation around essentially um there was conversation essentially around like uh uh is is dev going to be is dev going to be you know all uh remote i don't i don't know i honestly don't know i i there's still so much that i can do locally that i just i don't know if that's actually a real like I think maybe a, maybe a good amount of the community, sure. Maybe you know, like maybe like a good amount of uh, the engineering world might, sure. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know if eventually everybody will be that way. I just I don't I don't think so. Like something's got to sit on something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, do you use Git work trees? No, not really. No. One of the challenges with Git work trees is is that they are completely it's not a bad thing but it's by design that they're all isolated into their own separate like directories and like you know uh encapsulation and stuff like that um it just doesn't really work for my development flow um it's an option not like a requirement you know what i mean um and so i guess i guess that's my only like thing about get work trees is like well, i tried them but i was like constantly accidentally like deleting stuff like i just i guess i didn't have as ephemeral enough like branches to where i wasn't just like recreating things over and over and over you know what i mean like secrets and stuff like that you know like it's if i was just working on pure logic and just focused on that then maybe that would be enough but i don't know um i finally managed to get a devops work project done uh using uh ansible oh nice very cool man how did you like uh how did you like uh 
what's it called um using ansible yeah stash with lazy gip um yeah no i mean i think i think like uh i just tried a uh, new work juice but yeah yeah no i he's had that up for a while actually um i actually i think i'm like a original contributor on that thing um, I don't know, man. Yeah, I, I don't want to say work trees are bad because, again, their idea of concept of like complete isolation and being able to just be like, OK, it's gone now, you know, and, and having like these separate directories. It is very intriguing. I mean, if you think about it, too, it is a lot of extra, you know, it's a lot of duplication. Uh, and I think that was another thing that was kind of kind of meh for me was is like it was definitely a lot of uh, duplication, which I just. I did not want to manage, or at least I hadn't figured out a way of automating it and managing it. So, um, yeah, but it, it's not a bad way of doing things. If you if you can get away with it, then, you know, it could be really cool. Yeah. Like if, if it's just like a small project with not a lot of dependencies or again, like a specific module or something like that. Yeah. Uh, do you all run NeoVim in Windows? Uh, no, I'm so glam. I'm on a VM, so I'm, I'm actually running in a virtual machine on nix so i'm i'm using linux but you'll see here i've got like a bunch of vms down here that i'm using um yeah no i i normally just use it directly uh in in linux but you can use it in like uh wsl i think and stuff like that yeah i uh, use a local vm or no so i use a local vm i i'm a i'm a big proponent of vmware i love vmware a lot um, and their product. So I have VMware Work Fusion and Workstation. Um, and another thing that's nice about that is that because, check this out, because it is all VMware stuff, I can easily log in and have access to my data center if I want, which is pretty dope too. <laughs> uh, so yeah, like this is, these are all of my, because I'm using vCenter and this is a big reason why, uh, this is a big reason why I went with VMware. Uh, this is because, yeah, of all of the, yeah. All this stuff which i'm sure you probably know about already yeah <laughs> um yeah I, th uh, I found using tmux and vim is perfect too much customization isn't the best uh, i'm mainly customer facing so uh either aws session manager or ssh into the machine yeah no i um i normally am running just again a vm and then an ssh if i need to and stuff like that yeah how do you bring up that terminal in neovim i use tmux to switch panes so i use something called float term uh vim float term right and it's uh it's a really cool uh it essentially allows you to create pop-up windows and put like multiple like if you really just want like a new terminal window float term is very simple right it just boom creates you a new window but if you notice like if i do space lg see how it says float term here one out of one but it's actually lazy git that's because float term is running the command for me and then like bringing it up into the window in NeoVim for me. Same thing with like Docker, right? Or canines, right? That's, the, that's literally the canine. Like I literally have Kubernetes in my NeoVim. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but I can't lie. You're super swift in the terminal. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> I've been doing it for a while. So uh, toggle term for NeoVim is better. I've tried both though. Oh, dude. <laughs> I will take a look at it. I will take a look at it and I will see if I think it's better. I'll be fair. I've been using flow term for a long time and I am somebody who just like, eh, if it works, it works. So I would be, I'd be interested in knowing what the difference is. Uh, just the way you, not you, but the way I hear that sometimes from people, I'm just like, okay, <laughs> I'll figure out if I like it. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. I, I really just need flow term. I would imagine toggle term probably like bounces out from the side and like has like, actual windows and stuff like that um i don't really like that to be honest with you like i actually just like the flat just like i don't i don't really like yeah share your share your dot files if you if you have them uh, but yeah, i don't really like the whole like i like to be honest with you even this is annoying to me sometimes like even just like popping up a side window like this is is frustrating Yo, toggle bit what's up man how's it going dude dude i swear i saw a toggle and i thought of you i promise I absolutely promise you. Uh, both terms emitting lots of text. Yeah, exactly. What's going on, hiatus? How you doing? Um, but shout out to Togglebit. How you doing, buddy? Welcome, welcome. Um, all right, so let's keep moving forward. So, all right. Um, we need to work with the AWS SDK. So, um, I've been lurking since you started shilling Nix OS. 
Really? Are you are you in dude, are you are you slowly convert dude? Toggle, we gotta talk, man. It's I didn't think I was it was like a it was like that movie in Spider Man, you know, where like like the old one where like Toby Maguire or whatever no not Toby Maguire, uh whoever plays Eric Foreman or whatever, when he like puts his hand down and then like the little symbiote just like grabs to him and he's like, Wait, what the and then like it just keeps grabbing him, he's like, Oh god, no like that was Nick's for me and then like I just became one with Nick's. <laughs> um yeah, no, it's it's pretty. It is actually a pretty interesting uh, piece of software and operating system. Um, lurking is fun. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying the lurk. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on it. You were flashing your configs the other day. Yeah, I really wanted to try and make something that was going to be uh, that was going to be uh, here. I'll do this. Boop. Um, I I really wanted to uh, try and present something to everyone that was like relatable because I felt like Nyx was completely unrelatable to me. <laughs> uh, and it took a little while, but then I eventually got what I got. And so I was like, okay, I think I can talk about this. So yeah, I don't know. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I need to, ah, oh, dang dude, developer guide. Uh, utilities using AWS services. So I need to see the Go SDK documentation package. Yep. Uh, getting started. Okay. Okay. Here we go. This is what we're looking for. Okay. So to get started with the SDK setup and Go modules to retrieve them, go get, for example, initialize the project, go mod, go get AWS config, and then a service. Okay. So we need to. We need to go get AWS. So let's get these modules. We, we need to get these modules. So say go get, uh, we'll do dash U, AWS. We need config and we don't need DynamoDB, but we're gonna need S3. Go get dash U, config. And then we need, I'm gonna go out on a limb and just say that this is S3. I'm gonna see if my standardization, wait, what? Malform path go missing dot in what? Oh, I did it twice. I was like, what? <laughs> I'm confused. Hey, sir. Uh, do DevOps guys uh, are spe uh, specialized to are? Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Are they normally specify a specific cloud or are they one who do everything? I mean, yeah, you really want to be somebody who I think is comfortable with, you know, multiple. I mean, <sighs> DevOps is tough, man. Like, again, I, I always say this because I want to encourage people to go into DevOps, but I think DevOps does have a solid requirement of pre previous experience. You know, um, I knew a lot about Linux operating systems before I went into DevOps. I knew a lot about servers before I went into DevOps. I knew a lot about programming before I went into DevOps. I knew a lot about engineering before I went into DevOps. I knew, you know, like, and, and the thing was, is like, I became good at DevOps because I became good at solving those problems. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, if you have solved problems on one cloud and solve one cloud, you know, on another, like, you know, I guess it doesn't really truly matter until you run into the problem to needing to solve it, you know? Um, yo, Atoda, thank you for the 40 months, bud. Everybody say hello to Atoda, my wonderful co-host. Um, how are you doing, dude? Um, but yeah, no, uh, yeah, I, I, I think the best approach is just to be as good as you can at, you know, solving problems that are related to, you know, developers and ops, uh, you know, uh, do you know how to effectively set up a, you know, set up a repository and, and get that repository in pipelines? Do you know how to, you know, have good procedures around, you know, writing code and, and, uh, and what's going to happen is, is there's going to be, there's going to be a time where like, you'll make standardizations so things can move. And then as you move, those standardizations, you know, they evolve and they change or new things come into play, you know, but you got to start somewhere. And so I guess one of the first things I guess you can start with DevOps is standardization. 
you know, learning how to standardize things, like how to have good practices and good principles around stuff. I think, yeah. Um, I guess I'm missing something. Who chooses the services? I guess my question is, do you want to be the person who chooses the services or do you want to be the person who implements all of the practices and procedures and the design on how you choose the services? Because it's two separate things. DevOps does the latter. DevOps takes a look at the procedures and how it works and, um, you know, how, before you even write code, DevOps has made opinions and practices around how you do what you do, right? So once you make a decision, like here's what DevOps does. If you go out and you say, okay, I'm going to use Redis, DevOps goes, why? <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Like that's, that's, you know, I'm not the one actually potentially, you know, even deploying the Redis, but I am asking the question why I'm thinking about it in relation to our whole, our whole, you know, circumstance and, and, you know, everything. So yeah, it's a, it's a much different problem. Collaborative. I mean, yeah, I love the collaborative part of it. Yeah. Um, as a boss, I have a requirement to you, a DevOps guy to provide me with cheap and scalable solution for a database. I care only for money, generally talking. So I'm going to be real with you unless you can also in that conversation say, okay, then pay me what I need to be paid and let me do my job. Then sure. But that is not at all DevOps. That is... I give you money and you just like do, right? Um, what happens in the scenario, Caparino, I'm just gonna, you know, play out the idea here. What happens if we are, you know, over budget and under time, but have been bleeding money already and need a way of fixing how we create a database, right? Like, like what if, like what if none of that was ever considered right or or things like that um do you, do you stop and then focus on that do you keep moving forward and keep you know what i mean that's it, like i guess what i mean to say is is that approach only has so much longevity before you have to kind of take a step back and be like i'm going to give these this to somebody who is specialized <laughs> in doing this um yeah it's just even as a business person you can't look at it that way. You have to be able to trust the team that they will solve those problems for you. Like you're, you're as a boss, in my opinion, your boss, as a boss, your, your perspective should not be, I need a person to provide me with a database. What you need is a person to solve your database problem, <laughs> right? Uh, that's it. You just, you need somebody who is good at databases who will solve that problem for you, right? That's it. Um, and then you tell them from a business perspective, this is why I need a database. And then they go, okay, cool. Let's figure out how to get you a database you need. If that makes sense. Again, if that makes sense, I don't know. Again, that's just, that's how I like working. <laughs> Um, okay. Go run this objects, source files, list objects that go. Yeah. Let's look at this. Okay. So main.go load config default. So load the SDK's default configuration from the shared environment. Okay. Load default config flag parsed context to do. Okay. So we could start here. We could start here. So let's do this and let's go to archive. And what we're going to want to do now actually is actually not go to archive. Let's go to internal archive. We're going to create a new file and we're going to call this aws.go. Uh, and the reason for that is, is because this is going to be what creates our client. So we're going to say func client like this, right? And we're going to paste in what we just, what we just got. Now this needs to be config aws config. Perfect. Um, and I hope that helps Caparino, by the way, I don't want you to think in any way, shape or form that, you know, uh, I was attacking you or anything like that. It's a very valid question. 
Um, the problem is, is most of the times those challenges are more culturally, right? Um, you really don't in engineering in any shape or form want somebody who is focused on just the money side of things. You, you want somebody who can barrier between money and engineering. That's why you have like VPs and like all of these other things in play. Um, and then you, you know, you, you, you know, uh, not propagate, but then you allocate those assets, you know, and to the specific parts of the company that you need. And, and then they all fight over which one they want. You know what I mean? Like it's a, it's a much more, you know, uh, involved process, uh, or it can be, or, 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 or you can work at a company where it's ran directly from the top. And in those scenarios, it's, to be honest with you, normally not very fun unless they know a lot about engineering and what they're doing. And they're very cognizant of like, I don't know, man, it's hard. It's hard to, it's hard to be a business person and an engineer. That's why so many people genuinely, in my opinion, uh, they, they, you know, like all CFOs that eventually be like, they all become like CTOs, you know, or like they, they step down from that role because it's just like this sucks <laughs> you know what i mean not a lot of people actually like uh being the boss when it really comes down to it they just want money <laughs> uh which fair you know totally fair totally fair i can't argue anybody who you know wants the american dream uh or the american dream i should say in quotes uh The teams generally have an understanding of the needs of the given business exactly and desires around requirements. Exactly. Exactly. BG is just that guy at hippo. We all have that one guy. I mean, to be fair, I'm actually not, um, Avi is really that guy at hippo. <laughs> um, I'm getting closer to be like, I'm that guy when like Avi's not online or like other people, but then I'm that guy. Sure. <laughs> um, but I will say that like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm very lucky to be at a very high level at my company to where I can, Again, anybody who comes into DevOps, uh, like anybody who goes into that channel and they're like, hey, I need a, I need a, if somebody were to come in DevOps and be like, hey, I need a, I need a Redis cluster. I'd be like, why do you have a technical document on this? What is this for? What, like, you know, it would be a straight grilling of just why do you want this before you could even do it? You know, um, and that, that is my job. And as a matter of fact, uh, we even talked about this the other day. Yo, what's up, Anthony? How's it going, buddy? Thank you for the raid, no matter what. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, thank you. Welcome, everybody, for Anthony's stream. Hello, hello. We're just going on a little bit of a rant about DevOps, talking about stuff. Um, and, you know, honestly, and, you know, management from companies and how, how they relate to, you know, the business side versus the engineering side. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, if a uh, if a team lead for a tech com uh, team has no knowledge of tech, they shouldn't be a team lead. Yeah, I don't disagree. You know, I mean, I would say that we do like even at Hippo, we do a lot of good work bridging the gap between like non technical and technical. Because you got to remember at Hippo, we are also uh, an insurance company, right? Like we're an insurance company as well, you know. And so we have like underwriters and like you know all of these other things that uh, you know essentially uh are not related to engineering at all and we have i think done a pretty good job of you know uh bridging those two gaps pretty well um but it is it is very hard it is very hard yeah um especially when you're trying to tell somebody in like engineering about something that's entirely a business focused thing and it's like wait what like how wait okay so how do house closures work you know what i mean and, and like how does insurance work? like it's all stuff where you have to be like, okay, I see why this is so important later on. Um, and it can be small too. Like one little digit change is like massive in some regards. Uh, I'm aware of those types of bosses and I wouldn't want to work with them. How can I even explain why I am needed or what I do? Yeah, that's, that is a massively, honestly, very mature and uh, accurate look at uh, why everybody should be given that opportunity of ownership of you know what they do and they should not have to deal with like micromanagement in the sense where it's not empowering them to do their job um because when 
what I think what a lot of companies don't realize is when they are micromanaging to the point where they're not giving their engineers the power to do like what they need. Um, they are also stripping them of the ability to be their best. And I've experienced this many times where um, I've gotten on calls with like people who are like my direct like like I've gotten on calls with like direct like under the president and like CTO of the company and stuff like screaming arguments where I'm just like and I'm never going back to that again, by the way. It's one of the reasons why I left that company is because this guy I worked for, although he was very nice and he, you know, he did do a decent job of taking care of me. He was also abusive as f dude like there would be times where it'd be like okay cool like yeah no we're good and then there would be like why isn't this done and i'm like well what and like like literally like just overnight complete difference in personality and stuff um so yeah like you know that's not fair to you <laughs> you know what i mean that's really not fair to you at all um and i i dealt with that for like two to three years before i finally left uh, from a cost perspective, a project um, should have a clear timeline and an even clearer budget. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, nice VMC. Uh, I mean, the VM plugins. Well, <laughs> dog, you didn't even look. <laughs> uh, I, it's it's there. You just you got to look, man. Um, so if you go to dot files, right, click on this, click on again, the documentation explains it. But if you click on roles, you can click on neovim files here's everything you want here's the lua click on this here's packer it's all right here bud you just you gotta look man gotta look gotta look it's it's more than just a dot files it's a whole automation thing um basically i automate my whole repository or my whole my whole environment with just like one setup it doesn't just install my dot files it also stalls like uh it also installs like bottom discord docker like every this is this is my complete environment setup yeah yeah you're good you're good you're good um by the way uh there's a, a there's no auto shutdown services on azure if you spend your limits right no there is yeah there is no no if you if you spend more than like yeah you uh, oh well so let me be clear if you have a limit, yeah, it'll just, it'll stop you right there. If you don't have a limit, then yeah, there, you know, that's with any cloud provider though. If you're on a 30 day trial or whatever, then you won't get, they cut you off. Like they shut you down. So the only time you can ever be like overcharged or whatever, is just when you're using a normal subscription. Yo, Prime, what's up, dude? Sorry, by the way, thank you so much for the 35 months, dude. Thank you, thank you, bud. How are you? How is everything in your side of the world? Good to, good to see you, dude, 35 months. I love when people don't even realize how long we've known each other. I love going into your channel and then resubbing, and then people are like, 35 months, dude, what? And I'm like, yeah, what What do you mean? Like, what? <laughs> it's good to see you, though, bud. Hope you've been well. Hope everything is well with you. Um, need another month, right? Yeah. Um, God damn, there's more NeoVim dot file configuration than source for... Wait, what? <laughs> uh, oh, hey, Prime. What's up, dude? You didn't tell me you were going to do that, man. I didn't know that was happening. What's up, everybody? How's it going? Welcome, everybody, from Prime Stream. Hello, hello, hello. How are you guys? Prime, you you squirrely little... You little scamp. You little scamp. You you knew I was going to fall for that, too. Damn it. <laughs> What's up, dude? How's it going, everybody? Welcome, welcome. Hello, hello. How was your stream? I didn't even... Dude, I didn't even realize you were streaming. I didn't even realize you were streaming. I thought you were just coming in to say hi. God damn it. You got me. You got me. You got me. Welcome, everybody. How's it going? Hello, hello. I was wondering if you will hold me tight. I didn't get to last time. So I feel like it's only appropriate for us to make up for, for said lost... For, for said lost holding time. <laughs> uh, which, dude, I'm super hyped, by the way, to be able to see everybody and hang out, man. I... It's funny because a lot of you guys might not know Prime and a few of us have already met at a TwitchCon like what, two, three years ago or something like that. Um, and it was, dude, like we are talking about what, like it was like six of us in total. No, like nobody, nobody knew about programming on the internet and such with regards to Twitch. Like it was, 
Yeah, last con is where we met. Yep, yep, yep. Last Twitch con. Yeah, it was it was a good time. It was a good time. Pixar didn't happen. I don't know if anybody took pictures, to be honest with you. Bruh, how's the Nix OS journey going? It's going I'm I'm in Nix OS right now. What are you talking about? <laughs> I'm literally in Nix OS right now. Look at that. Nick Shell. Bam! I'm in it. Um yeah, no, I I I fell in love with Nix. Um by the way, Prime, I think last time you raided us, some of uh some of your Nix OS DGens came over to our community and uh, ended up converting me, which I personally, it took a while to wrap my head around it, but being able to have like a truly declarative environment is what blew my mind. Um, and yeah, I'm actually going to be doing a YouTube video on it um, where I'm going to be talking about how I ported my dot files essentially from because there's like benefits there's benefits to both i'm going to be clear on this there's benefits to both like if you're somebody who wants to be like completely declare okay so here i'll i'll show you guys really quickly i'll show you guys really quickly all right so before i knew about nix os right i used to oh i still do i still do but i automated my whole environment with dot files and as a matter of fact i think prime you do this in some regard too um, I went to the extreme where I manage everything in my dot files. Uh, I install like all of my CLI tools, like Docker, all of this stuff is done with, uh, automation using, uh, what is it? Ansible. Um, and so like, you'll see like Samba, Spotify, like everything in here is managed by Ansible. And like, I've loved this for a very long time. I made a YouTube video on it, like all that stuff. Right. Um, and so for, for a good while, like five, six months, I've just been running automation. I, you know, whenever I wanted to do something, I would just be like, you know, dot files update. And then it would, it would update my dot files and, you know, easy peasy. Um, and then <laughs> I had somebody come into our, our channel and say like, well, what about Nix? Like, would you know anything about Nix OS? So the thing that's interesting and prime, I, and, and for anyone else out there, this is what really caught me a lot was actually Nix essentially is a package manager. It's a package manager wrapped in a language. And the idea behind it is that every single part of your, your, your profile or whatever is configured, right? We're not talking about something that's imperative, like Ansible in the sense where you are taking steps and then it finally gets to where it is. But we're talking about something that's declarative, like a, yeah, sure, like a package manager or anything like that. So what does that mean, right? Well, I'm going to show you guys a very, very small example, and then you guys can kind of take it from there, right? And again, eventually soon I'll be making a YouTube video on this, but uh, this is how I kind of got it. So think about it like this, right? Say I want to install uh, NeoVim, right? In a, in a normal scenario, right? In Ansible, right? I'd go to like tasks, main, and then you could see here, like I do literally what you would need to do to install NeoVim manually. I you know, get the dependencies, I install them to my computer, I clone the repository, I build it, I install it, I remove the build fold, like all of this is pretty standard, you know, like, ants yeah, literally exact same thing, right? Cool. Okay, let's talk about how it looks like in Nix. Now, again, by default, Nix is entirely declarative. So we're no longer talking about imperative steps and like stuff like that, but we're talking about a language that essentially is parsed and then built against, right? So for me, at least, I start with what's called a flake, right? Now, if, I'm not going to go too far into it, but I just want to show you the, the key factors here. The first one is this is the entry point of the complete configuration. And if you look, you might notice that Nix actually has support for using what are called overlays. And these are basically custom package repositories that you could say, you know what? I can either install NeoVim via the normal package manager in Nix, or I can overlay a custom one and install it that way. This is all I need to install NeoVim chat. I am literally not kidding you at all, right? So the idea here is, is that once I have this reference, I'm able to use it in my Nix code as a direct reference of a package, right? So you see here how I've got NeoVim nightly, right? Well, I'm gonna shoot over to the exact file that has that in it. Uh, and so if we go to users shared uh, home manager, right? This essentially is the declarative configuration for my home directory, right? And so in this case, look at this, my home, 
how do I make it so that I declare my background? Well, I keep my background image in the repo and then I tell it, hey, home.file background image, this source is now this. Same thing for canines, right? So very declarative. Look, session variables, right? Bam, bam, right? So let's go all the way down to NeoVim. So you guys might use Packer and all that great stuff. I ain't got to use <laughs> And the reason for that is, is because in Nix and Home Manager, there are not just packages, but there are also declarative programs, right? So... I don't just install NeoVim, I also enable it so that I can customize it, right? And so what's happening is, is I'm actually telling Nix, hey, I want you to enable NeoVim, and then I want you to override the package with the NeoVim Nightly package. That's it. Nightly's done. And not only that, but Nix has a complete repository for, or package manager, not just for normal packages, right? But it also has it for Vim plugins, for Python packages, for Go. Pa like, this is a package manager that actually sprawls across languages, right? So when we say, oh, well, I need NVim LSP config, I need LSP extensions, I need Nix, I need Prisma, I'm not using a package manager here except for Nix. And what I'm doing is, is I'm saying, Nix, uh, let's look for LSP, con uh, LSP config. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Uh, LSP config. I didn't spell that right. Boom. There it is. I don't, I don't need a package manager. It's already in the Nix packages, right? So all I have to do is say, okay, well, Vim plugins with packages, Vim plugins, and Vim LSP config. Now, what's dope about this is I can do this for anything that exists. And so you'll see, look, this is all of my plugins that are, are already there, right? Um... Not only that, but you can then inject custom packages, right? Here's the cool thing, and Prime, I think you'll geek out over this for sure. Nix is declarative, but it's also used as like a build system, right? So not only can you use it in the sense of like, you know, configuring your environment and stuff, but it's all SHA backed, right? They're all check, like everything is checksummed and everything like that. So if you ever need like a specific like it's all essentially uh verified in a normal build cycle um and so it pulls down these packages it verifies them it builds them it checks them and then it gives you exactly what you need the second part what i have not said about any of this is nix is empire entirely powered by something called a nix store um now prime i just told you and anyone else in chat i just told you that you know, Nix uh, is able to, you know, grab packages and compile them and install them for me, right? Well, with that same thought, it's also able to take those packages and symlink them anywhere I need them to be. As a matter of fact, that's how Nix really works underneath the hood, at least from my understanding, is you have a store where all of this data exists, and then you have symlinks. And as a matter of fact, if you notice right here, if I do ls-alh, my background image is actually a specific, uh, I don't know if that's a SHA per se, but a specific hash version from the Nix store. Because if I ever needed to, I could revert that change. The Nix store builds declaratively and also makes sure that every build is unique. And so in the end, in the end, or I'm sorry, in any circumstance where I change this, this will get linked to a new SHA and then the previous one will still be there. But what is even cooler about this is this now allows you to basically have anything you want on your computer anytime you need it, but you don't actually have to install it. So what does that mean? Okay, this will be the last thing I say. Say I'm on a computer where I need node 16 and i only have node for 14 or i need i well, vice versa whatever right now you could probably use something like nvm or something like that right but with nix nix is again all about this store that it keeps data and then sim linking things to your shell as you need it so what you can do is, is instead i can say nix shell dash p i need node.js 16 as a matter of fact i need yarn as well 
And then in it, I'm just going to say node dash dash version. So what just happened is Nix went out, grabbed Node.js 16, grabbed Yarn, brought it and stored it in my store, which I've already done all of this, and then executed that for me. And as a matter of fact, if I wanted to, I could get rid of the dash dash command and hit enter. And now I'm in my own shell with Node 16. So this has been brought up often, which I don't think this is a terrible comparison, but yeah, it's kind of like a way better homebrew. <laughs> the idea is that, again, you have this concept of just a store, right? It's just, it's just a box, right? This is where your data exists, right? And then it says your shell's over here. And then Nix goes, okay, you configure what you want me to put in your shell, right? And to go even just one itty bitty tiny minuscule step further chat and this will be the last thing i show you because it's relative to what we're working on i am working on something right now called our recording pipeline right this pipeline is something that i need ffmpeg for and like a bunch of other binaries right now i just told you that i can create a shell right with everything i need in it no problem well remember nix is declarative so not only that, but I can then create a default shell.nix file in all of my repos. And in that, it contains any dependencies I need. Now I have Go on my computer by default, so I don't need to install it. But if I wanted to, I could just say packages.go and now I would have Go in this shell as well. So if I do this, nix-shell just by itself, it will inherit that shell configuration and now if I do FFmpeg, I have FFmpeg. But if I leave the shell, I don't have FFmpeg, right? This kind of removes Docker <laughs> as well for a lot of things. So if you guys, if anybody here in Prime, I know you're probably going to remember this too. Um, I might have made a little program or a little NeoVim plugin called uh, LSP config, right? Or not LSP config, no, sorry, not that one. LSP containers. <laughs> I didn't make LSP config. LSP containers is the concept of taking LSP config, leveraging it, and then running all of your LSPs in in uh, in containers, right? You don't need this with Nix at all. And as a matter of fact, chat, do you wanna see do you wanna see how embar not embarrassing, but like how like how not sad but i was just like damn um look at this chat you want to see what it looks like to install lsps uh hold on hold on let me just find uh lua in this repository i don't remember which file it is it's right hold on hold on here here's all my language servers chat they're just packages and nix <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, because again, you don't like Nix knows about node packages. It knows about Rust Analyzer. It knows about all this stuff. So you just you just install it. <laughs> um, I would love to play with this. Yeah, man. I mean, I like I said, I'm I'm going to be putting out a YouTube video on this soon. I think I have one other one that I want to put out first that kind of helps with the other approach. So I want to say this too, and I want to be completely clear on all this chat. Okay. Yes. It's super sick. Yes. Like I love, like, obviously I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, you know what I mean? I'm using it. Um, what I will say though, and here's the challenging part is it's got to work on Nix, right? Um, there are some things that don't fully work on Nix, right? Uh, one of the things, one of the challenges is that at work, we use something called TwinGate, right? TwinGate is a way uh, we access our networks and stuff, right? Now, this is something similar to uh, VPN TailScale. If you guys have ever heard of TailScale, it's basically the equivalent. Now, what's dope about Nix, right, is Nix does support of like a lot of, you know, open source stuff. So TailScale is on here, right? TwinGate, however, is not, right? Now, I want to be fair on this, right? I use my VMs for work <laughs> uh, as well as for play. Um, and so in this case, I need to figure out how to get TwinGate into, you know, my VM or I need to figure out another way of 
handling tunneling um so yeah like this is you know this is where it's like okay uh, there are small little gotchas like this and it doesn't mean you can't use twin gate it just means that you might have to figure out like how to you know how to inst uh, how to compile it for nix and there are these things called uh derivate deriv derivation der oh my gosh i can't say the word derivation derivation derivations I think I can't say the word right, but essentially those are each one of the changes that you make. And so you can add um, whatever you want as that specific change. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, derivations. Thank you. I can never say that word right. But if you're curious about any of this, I have both of them. I have both links there. I have uh, the YouTube to how I automated my first setup with Ansible. Um, and then the second one with the Nix repo. Um, so yeah, take a look at both of them and let me know what you guys think. Uh, let me catch up with chat though. My bad. Can you have NixOS images where yes, you can prime. Yeah. Yeah. So prime essentially what happens is Nix builds like a container for it that they call it Nix containers. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, you can absolutely do that. Yeah. Nix is. So one thing to note about Nix is really Nix kind of becomes your package manager for everything, right? Like Nix um to give an example um what's a good example that i can give um like say you're working with like go right um well no go's not good because go the go or the go whatever with nix isn't that great yet but python sure python for example uh there's this thing out there called uh pip to nix i think or something like that um, and the idea is, is that again, Nix is really should be your package manager. And so what happens is pip has like, or, uh, there are like Nix tools like this that are able to like read requirements and stuff and then bring it into Nix so that then you're managing everything with Nix. Um, and then it can build that environment. And like that, at that point, like, you know, now you've got the packages. Now it can literally build that exact, exact environment for you. Right. So, yeah um nix versus ansible feels like uh pn pm versus npm yeah i mean it's totally preferential and i will say that too like again going back to the whole using tail or uh using uh twin gate like you know i'm kind of just like out of the water on that you know now if you look at it seriously like again nix os is super cool super interesting i'm still using it i'm using it daily Again, feel free to take a look at my dot files if you want to learn more about it. Also, feel free to like join the Discord if you want, all that good stuff. Um, but uh, like, I am convinced that it's really good as like a side computer. <laughs> it, don't I, I don't know if I'm convinced that it's good for a main machine, like to use as like your main host OS. You know what I mean? Um, it's a little, like I said, it's a little buggy. Like I actually have, like for example. Uh, so I have Discord here, right? I have Discord. And Discord, um, you need to actually install Discord Canary. Uh, you might notice that in my dot files, I have Discord Canary. And that's because the way that these get updated, they're all updated by developers, right? And so if a new version of Discord comes out, you need to either get the Canary version so that you have that new version, <laughs> or you need to wait until your version gets updated by Nix, right? Because it's all package manager driven. So like, that's a bit of a gotcha. That's something you kind of need to think about, right? Like, so for example, if a new version of Docker comes out, Nix isn't going to get updated until somebody goes and gets that new update and, you know, updates it in the package manager, and then that will get propagated to everyone else. However, the cool thing about that and the reason why that's so great is, is because then it's declarative and saying, okay, everybody, this version is the exact version and things like that. Oh, one more thing I want to show you really quickly as well. Um, this is also super, super cool. Um, Prime, I think, I think again, you'll, or really just anybody who does like uh, debugging sessions with multiple people. I told you that Nix is completely reproducible, right? Because it's declarative. So it was actually really neat. We were uh, we were debugging something the other day, and I I, I don't know where it is, but um, you can use things like Nix Shell as a way of making completely portable but like uh, reproducible commands. And so what I mean by that is is like if there was a circumstance where you were like, oh, by the way, on Node.js 14 X, this yarn is not working, right? Like yarn yarn test right but on 16 it is 
you can easily just like literally share this command and be like okay does this work for you okay yeah it works for me okay okay let's see if it works like like you are now talking about the concept of passing containers but you're just passing them as commands right because i'm gonna have the exact same version that you're gonna have and again if we have a circumstance where like we have a custom nick shell right like this and i just run the same nick shell command that they do then i can exactly reproduce the problems that they have right so that was something that was really cool was is like uh uh cran somebody in our community gave me the command and i looked at it and i was like oh i can literally run this with all the exact dependencies and everything as well and like we're good so yeah the fact that you have such high reproducibility is like insane um is it harder than arc or arch i called it arc jesus um i think that they're just different you know arch does a really good job of keeping everything latest right like you're basically getting the absolute latest package at any moment in any given circumstance right um uh may i have kids that still use nicks <laughs> dude i don't know <laughs> i i don't know i honestly don't know because i don't have kids and i went deep down the rabbit hole um no i mean i think i think i think if you can like all i wanted to do with my config was get it to a point to uh, where i don't have to touch it as much and you know i'm slowly starting to refactor it now where like if you look at my dot files for example uh you'll see that like i um i have like profiles right so if you go to my flake.nix you'll see that i have like a hippo for work and then like a personal for for me right like i'm slowly starting to make it so like you can do and like pro, and like it, you know anybody really out there you could do stuff like that as well where you could say like okay you know i want it to build like this and build like that um i cannot yeah i mean i'm not gonna lie dude i think i think i don't know i i, I yeah i <laughs> <laughs> you you have to learn the language too right so again there's three parts to nix uh there's the the nix uh what is it the nix triangle <laughs> uh i forget what it is but whoa that is not what we were looking for <laughs> god i hate google sometimes um i don't remember where it is uh hold on we might have it in our discord freaking google man uh let me see if i can find it I'm just going to search. I should have known. I should have known not to trust Google. <laughs> uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Do we even? Yes, here it is. I knew we had it somewhere in here. Um, so this is the, the declarative trinity of Nix, essentially. Uh, there's the operating system, right? There's the language, right? And then there's the package manager, right? All of these are Nix, right? It's not just a package manager. It's not just a language. It's not just an operating system. It's it's you learning the language, right? And then also, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Like, listen, it, you know, if there's, you know, I'm trying to get it to, like, I think what might be better is to wait until I have mine done. Because <laughs> I'm trying to get it more templatable so that it does kind of make it easier but yeah no there's there's a lot to it yeah there there's a lot to it um there's a lot to it it's it's definitely i i think for you prime i think the thing would be like you would have to standardize a lot of your stuff i think that's the big thing yeah you'd have to stand like you'd have to standardize a lot and i don't know if that would be easy for you um but like i i found that right like when i moved like and i'll be fair that's another reason why the ansible setup like the one that we currently have right is is so nice right because if you just want to add something you just boom add simple done right like and that's why i really say like you can either do you can either do you know this approach which is more of like an imperative approach um or you can really try and do the nix os stuff um now i will say this prime as well um if you don't want to go down the whole nix os route or anyone else doesn't if you don't want to actually do the os route you can also just do home manager right home manager works in anything um but it essentially just manages your like home 
directory and and everything but it will enable you to install programs into your home so for example if you have like go and stuff like that then you can put those into home manager and remove them from the normal way you set them up so i don't know man i i i you know maybe we'll see um all right buddy have a good one thank you again for the raid shout out to prime again if you don't know him i'm sure you do give him a follow <laughs> uh i use nix with uh ubuntu mac os and nix os yeah i almost i almost um did the so one of the reasons why i wanted to try nix os just for anyone else out there is because um i have a macbook and i was running a vm on it but it's getting a little older and I was like, ah, I, I, I would really like, I would really like to be able to have more power. And to be honest with you, Nick's, you know, you don't need any power. Like it's just, you know, daemons and stuff running on the main machine, just, you know, in the Nick's OS store or in the Nick's store. And so I was like, okay, but I just like, <laughs> like Apple in general with how they like create their machines and stuff is just so not fun um and like you know having to deal with like multiple python versions and like i was just like eh, i don't know i don't know how great the mac experience is yeah if you want uh bamzy just check out the vod man um and by the way if you guys don't know we do have a couple resources for you the first one is the wiki um if you ever miss anything on our channel we always have our wiki and the wiki essentially is where I post the agenda for the day as well as the uh, the uh, the VOD. So like, for example, you'll see right now, if I go here, you'll see that I'm creating an agenda for today, right? This is because this is everything we've done. This is like what we've worked through. Well, we then take this agenda and then whenever it decides to want to actually load any any day today. All to four there we go um it will actually uh you'll actually be able to go here and like here's the vod here's the complete breakdown of like what we did and like even in this vod i talk a bit about nick so um yeah don't worry you'll be able to always get all of the the streams and stuff from uh from here and uh yeah anything else does uh nix uh work on the m1 max i would imagine it does from a like nix like uh like just the nix uh home manager setup i don't or it does work on m1 as well i yeah it does work on m1 as well yeah yeah, yeah. um sorry i was thinking about per uh virtualization right because i use i use a vm guys just to be clear right like i am on a windows machine right now <laughs> sorry to break your immersion but i'm on a windows machine right now and then i run all of my stuff in vms because i don't want to bork my my main machine Nick Darwin, nice, nice, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, we are we are definitely growing a small Nick's community in our community. So again, if you'd like to, I'm gonna be real. We have two people who are like super, super good at Nick's. Cran is one of them. I think Jose as well as uh, Max, Max, whatever Max Headroom. I think these guys are really good with Nick's. I think they're some of the maintainers as well. So if you guys have questions, feel free to jump in the Discord and ask them, and you know all that good stuff. Because I'm I'm pretty sure they can answer these questions way better than I can. Cran has been like super supportive. He's been, he's been really helpful. Um, no, Nix X grade. Wait, what, what, what do you, wait, what? <laughs> uh, so if you want to be labeled as the ultimate giga Chad nerd, you should go the route of arch plus Nix home. I, I maybe I, that's an interesting dynamic. That's an interesting dynamic. Um, I've not tried it. I've not tried it, I guess. Um, if I could use Nix to replace homebrew, that would be great. Brew sucks at packaging. Yeah. And again, Nix does a really good job at, uh, at doing that. It's, it's, it's a very good package manager. So I, you know, I give it a shot. I, I just didn't try it because personally, like I said, I'm not a big fan of the OS or the Mac OS development ecosphere. And so I was just like, yeah, I'm not going to worry about that. Um, what is your VM software? I use something called VMware workstation. So work station. There you go um all right so anyone just tuning in thanks appreciate it sorry we went down the nicks route there for a second um i'm bg i'm one of the co-hosts of the alt of four stream thank you for being here uh i'm a senior software engineer i work in devops and infrastructure uh my job is highly highly focused on pr procedures practices designs architecture like all of that kind of stuff and which is one of the reasons why i do i do love nicks is because it, you have to you know it's so 
declarative. You have to think about everything, and it's very like you know deliberate. Uh, it, it definitely is a part of my job and what I love doing. Um, we work on a lot of different stuff here. Uh, if you guys may have seen, if you're in Prime's Discord, you may have noticed something called Quirk. It says hi to you every time you join. That's our service. Uh, he's uh, been awesome supporting it and helping us out and uh, testing it. Uh, we have a bunch of other people who use it as well. Um, and so uh, that is a product we build here on stream. Um, I am currently in the process of building a CLI tool in Go um, for some other things that we need. We are actually a company. Uh, we have incorporated and we do build software for other companies as well. We, we've been contracted and, and worked with other companies in the past and stuff like that. And so um, a lot of the things that we do here, we solve with hardware, software, like we solve it, you know, the way I know how to. Uh, and so we have a problem uh, where we had a problem, uh, which is essentially we needed a way of uh, converting our VODs from Twitch. So like right now we're streaming, right? We're keeping a VOD for that. Um, but that VOD is stored in a format called MKV. Um, and by the way, this is the actual, uh, this is the actual uh, technical document I made on it. So if you're curious on how we do things here, that's one of the, way that, one of the ways I do things is I write a lot of technical documents. Um, but in this document, we basically talk about how we use MKV and how we need to uh, convert it from MKV to MP4 so that we can uh, you know, edit those files. But then we also need a way of being able to store those files forever so that we, if we ever lose them, you know, we have easy backup or recovery. And so this whole technical document talks about how we do that, how we're gonna store it, how we're gonna convert it, how we're gonna archive it, um, and all of that. And so we've been working on that essentially. Um, and we've gotten to the point now where we have a very good process in mind. And this is essentially the, the flow chart. Uh, again, this is very much part of my job. So this is why we're doing some of this. Um, but we use Kubernetes here. We use Kubernetes for our on-prem cluster. Uh, so we have a, a, a on-prem uh, cluster and uh, data center where we run servers and stuff like that, as well as a bunch of virtual machines. Uh, and then we have Kubernetes in the cloud as well. That's our that's our orchestrator. We start with Kubernetes. So uh, on-prem, we also have these things called production chairs. And the idea is, is that if we go back to here, right, our stream computer connects to a Samba share in our network, right? And this is actually a virtual machine in our data center, right? In our on-prem data center. Um, that drops a file and then stores it here. Right. But this is only internal to our network. So if I wanted to like edit it or something, I can easily literally go here, right? Go here and then look, bam, production. This is the literal production share right here, right? So we solve the problem from a streamer perspective of being like, okay, cool. Let's, you know, get the data in a shared place where we can edit it wherever we need. But the second problem we have is making it in a format that we can work with. And so that's this second part right, part, part, part right here, our, our recording pipeline. And the whole idea behind this recording pipeline is, is that in the same way that our computer accesses the network to get this file, we're going to use Kubernetes and jobs and things like that to go out over the network, get these files and via automation, convert them, archive them like all of that process um and so that's what we're working on right now this is what we're going to implement that with and so this share is really that first part where we say okay well we will expect recording files to be on here right we'll have a cron in kubernetes that will go out to that share right and then check for any files that it needs to process. Um, and then we lean on Kubernetes for a lot of the rest of it. Now I'm using something right now called Tekton. Tekton, <laughs> I keep calling it Tech Talk. Um, but Tekton essentially is an open source uh, Kubernetes centric system that helps you really build CI CD, right? Now I don't need CI CD at least yet but I do need something that I can like run workflows with and steps, something that's like one after another, right? If we look here, we'll see that I need to run convert and then archive, right? I can't run them side by side. So if we do like a normal queue scenario, I'll have to like queue one and then have like a worker queue another queue. And it's just like a whole nightmare, right? We want something that can handle this directly, right? One after another. Again, my job is focused on solving the problem the right way. Uh, and I don't even always get it right the first time, <laughs> but, you know, trying to really look at like what's 
the core of the problem and the core of the problem is we need to be able to run these steps again as a workflow one after another and stuff like that exactly like a workflow processor so the whole concept is is that once this cron has got the list of files that it needs to process it's going to send and create a bunch of pipelines in tecton to run right now there's a challenge though with this which is by default if we just did that and we had like 300 files or something like that we would literally ddos our cluster <laughs> because we would just have triggered 300 pipelines right tecton doesn't really say like okay how many do you want at a given time or anything like that it just runs as much as it possibly can so what we're also doing is, is we're creating a go based tecton operator which will watch the Kubernetes API and anytime we give it new pipelines, we will only set them in the pending status. That means that this operator will be the one that actually processes and says like, okay, um, I only want three at any given time. How many are running right now? Okay, none. Okay, cool. There goes three. And then three pipelines will start, right? So once those pipelines start, it will run the task, the convert task and the archive task, which goes out to the production chair, does the same thing, and then drops the archive uh, file in Glacier for storage. So this is what we are building. Um, and I was showing chat actually before you guys got here, the CLI tool that we are building to, uh, to make all of this very portable, right? Now, because I'm using like pipelines, um, you know, at this point, it could be something like, you know, me going into YAML files, like, like, you know, just think of like a normal pipeline, right? Um, and so, yeah, in the circumstance where uh, we're creating pipelines like this, I can either go into them and like, you know, create all the code and or all the logic and everything I need there, or we can do something that we actually do at Hippo, which is we create um, CLI tools, right? And the idea is, is that these CLI tools match the steps that we want to take but they encapsulate all of the logic so we don't have to put the logic in the pipeline templates right all i really want to do is, is run a pipeline that says hey run the convert command i don't i don't want you to care about what steps need to be done in conversion do you need ffmpeg or do you need this or right like i don't need to i don't want to worry about any of that i just want it to go to convert and run convert right so a way of standardizing that essentially is by making it into a CLI tool. And so we're building a Go CLI tool right now to handle all of that. Um, and to give you an idea of what that looks like, if I go to command and then I go to, uh, for or here, I'll just do this. We'll just do go run dot. What? Oh, hold on. I might have some broken code. Hold on. <laughs> oh, I have a lot of broken code. Oh, dang. Oh, I was building something. Anyways, I can't do it right now because it's broken. <laughs> Uh, but the TLDR is, is like, if I was to do go run uh, schedule, right? See this command right here? The idea is, is that when I run this command, it's going to run the schedule subcommand and then schedule the pipelines for me, right? Same thing with convert. So for example, if I go to Nick's shell, right? Convert, look at this. Go run, convert, input file, right? Output dir. So we're literally taking the steps that we would be, you know, making in CI and then turning them into uh, CLI uh, commands that we just run in CI, right? So that those have all of the logic, those take care of it. It's all in testable code, right? We're not, we're not writing our test logic in, uh, in, in YAML templates. We're writing it in actual code and then just running that. Um, does NixOS have Craig, uh, have a Craig, uh, running in slow? Oh, dude, I have no idea. <laughs> that's a good question, man. That's a, that's a, that's a good question. Um, your note taking is so good. Oh, thanks, Anna. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm trying to get better at it. I'm trying to get better at it. Why do DevOps people love Go? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it's more so that DevOps people love Go or just like Go is, was built for DevOps. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I could build in TypeScript, sure. Um, it's a lot of other layers that I don't really need. Um, I could build in Python. I would say Python is a very arguable like comparison. Like honestly, a lot of the stuff we have at Hippo is actually built in uh, in Python. A lot of our CLI tools and stuff. I don't think Go's like. I don't think you have to be in DevOps and doing Go. I definitely don't. I think you just need something like 
again, that's, that's, it's helping you build these things practically. That's really the big thing. Step-by-step -step execution couldn't be a script. Yeah, 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 exactly. Doesn't DevOps people love Ruby? Um, I think back in the day, I think Ruby's kind of fallen off the map, unfortunately. Um, right now we're working on, uh, by the way, right now we are working on the uh, archive step. Right before you guys got here, actually, I was working on the archive step. Uh, I do go for fun. I do, uh, I work I, at work, I do Java. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of Java, to be honest with you. Um, not my cup of tea. Uh, okay, cool. So we are working on the archive step right now. So the archive step, actually, we've kind of written it out already. Um, it does a couple things. It's first going to go out and find the file. So it looks up the recording file, right? Then it'll upload that file to AWS Glacier, and then it'll verify that the upload is done and safely remove it, right? So in this case, we've already taken care of this first step here, which is the, uh, the actual process of looking for the file. Um, and so this is a very simple function. It just grabs it, it just takes a path, grabs the file, um, and then simply says, okay, cool, we found that file. Let's return a pointer reference of like the actual info on that file, um, and then give a little bit of debug output so that we know this function worked properly. Uh, the next thing we wanna do is upload that file to AWS Glacier. And so we were in the process of setting up the, uh, we were in the process of setting up the AWS client actually, uh, right as you guys got here. So if we go back here, you'll see that we have added the AWS uh, package as well as the service S3 package. Um, I'm interested knowing though, I wonder if this needs to be V2. Yeah, okay. That makes a little bit more sense. New is from config. Yeah, there it is. Okay, I was like, okay, so I should probably do a go mod tidy really quickly. Yeah, there we go. All right, uh, let's go back to AWS. Uh, woo, your content seems cool. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Ruby, Chef, Go, Docker. Yeah, I mean, I guess. I mean, I think Go's just more like Ruby's, uh, what's it called? Dynamic, dynamically typed, right? I think, I, I, I don't know, man. I just like static typing. That's the easiest way I can put it. I like static typing. Um, I'm a simple man who likes static types. <laughs> uh, I don't know what else to say. Um, Got to run. Thanks for the good stuff. All right, Hacksaw. Have a good one, buddy. See you soon. Um, I appreciate it. Cool to see some practical stuff. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate you being here. Okay, so all we're doing right now is generating a client. I'm wondering if we want to generate actually a S3 client is really, I think, what we want to call this, right? Because we really want to do, yeah, we really want to do an S3 client. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So where did we go? Okay. So let's go back to this. Yeah, here we go. Okay. So the first step in this example is they load the config. We got it. We get the client. We got it. And then, okay. So they're immediately going into using it S3 dot. Okay. So then in that case, I should be able to do like S3 dot put object, right? Object input, put object input. All right. That's probably a struct. Yeah, it is ops let's see what this has in it so bucket key body oh farts um they should be able to we should be able to give them a path dude i don't want to load a 20 gigabit file into memory <laughs> i mean we could stream it so it really wouldn't matter but like i really would rather not do that if we don't have to hmm interesting mm. so we're probably going to need to create a stream and then load it into yeah we're gonna yeah shoot okay is this the recommended way by the way is this like so let's do this aws go sdk put stream because i'm lazy and i feel like googling it <laughs> um using the client upload managers. Okay. The S3 manager packages uploader. Wait, is this like a, Oh no, no, no. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay, cool. 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 I think I know what this is. They have like a, a JavaScript version of this. If this is the case, then this is perfect. Cause it knows how to like do multi-part and everything. So the thing that we really want to be able to do chat is, is we don't want to just put it right. Put essentially just means, Hey, 
you take this whole 20 gigabit file and you just upload good luck we'll talk to you in like five days we don't want to do that we want to upload it with parallelism we want to split it and send as much as we can in chunks and then like do that um and so there are like upload managers and stuff like that uh in different sdks of aws but it looks like they have one in go to um how can you achieve that terminal it looks super good just check out my dot files man that's all you gotta do uh i made a, a youtube video on how to do it yep just check out my dot files um uploader upload okay so me thinks we need this upload manager the s3 manager packages uploader provides concurrent yeah see this concurrent upload of contents to s3 by taking care of s3's multi-part apis the uploader is both io reader for uh, also supports io reader for streaming uploads we don't need to worry about streaming uploads because it's just going to be on the file system right so in our case this is perfect so we need to get the s3 manager package and install that as well uh okay boop s oh it's already here s3 manager okay cool so examples new uploader or can i just go back to this one hold on which one wait where what how did we what oh was it in a oh dude i am just getting lost in okay here we go uh okay so session the session the s3 user or s3 uploader will use session oh that's interesting Create an uploader with the session and default options. So we have to get a session. Oh, that crap, do we get a session? Examples. New uploader. Why not? Okay, so session, session dot new session. Uh, okay, that's cool. But like, what does a session have to do with anything? <laughs> um, I haven't had to do a session in like a while. Uh, client dot is there like a session ability to get here yeah no so this is just like shoot mm, i'm wondering if we need to give it a different type of client new uploader with client oh oh here we go maybe this is what we need yeah yeah, yeah. let's do this new uploader with client the so new upload with client creates a new uploader instance ups that pass an additional da -da 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 -da, requires an s3 service client to make s3 api calls okay perfect yeah, yeah so this is what we want this is what we want so once we get this upload with client right then we go s3 new uploader and then look yeah so see this right here this part size this is where we tell it hey we want you to split this into 64 megabit chunks and send it up as quickly as possible, right? So this is why we want to use this type of uploader and not just use the the client dot put, right? Because again, if we just do client dot put, uh, we're not going to get any of that other parallelization or you know any of the multi part capabilities at least easily. You can wrap it, but this is wrapping that put, so it's this is a nice little helper. Um, new uploader with client. Okay, so I think at this point we can just return the client and then we're good. So let's do this return error. Let's get rid of this. We don't need that. Um, technically, we don't really need this either. We can just do return uh, this and then do a nil after it like that. And that should be good. Uh, oh, do I? Oh, I need to return a client. So then we'll do a pointer to S3 dot client and error. And then that means that this should give us a pointer, which it does. Fantastic. All right, get rid of that. Uh, and then we need to make nil returned here like that. Okay, cool. Now you might ask yourself, like, why are you like you're taking three lines of code and putting it into a function because I don't know this is all I need right now. <laughs> um, there's a solid chance that this S3 client function is going to get a lot bigger. Um, so I'm just, I'm separating my concerns so that if later on I need to add more, you know, client logic or anything like that, I just add it to this function. Problem solved, right? Easy peasy. Um, okay, cool. So what we need to do now is, is we need to go back to archive Okay, so we have a lookup recording find function and now we have a client creation function, right? But we don't really have a function that is encapsulating those two like we do with the convert, right? We go to convert, you'll just see convert run, right? And if we go to uh, schedule, well, actually schedule still needs to be broken down too. So yeah, we want to follow the same concept of like convert run. So what we're going to do, we're going to go to internal, going to go to archive, 
Um, and then we're going to do another file and we're going to call this file um, upload.go, right? Um, and so then what we're going to do is we're going to go to upload.go. We're going to call this package archive and we're say funk run. And this will just kind of be like our upload run. Or if we wanted to, we could also say this is our archive.run. Um, okay, so we just said that there are some things that we need to move. So let's go ahead and go back here. And the first one is, is we want to grab this and move this over here, right? Oops. Let me. Okay, thank you. And there, like that. Cool. And then the next thing we want is not to move it, but to add our client, right? So let's do this. Look up. There's our lookup module, right? And then we want to do client client uh s3 client yep there we go cool and then so this actually does return an error uh oh geez uh oh geez okay hold on we're good we are good we are okay why am i fat fingering right now okay <laughs> sorry guys um okay so then i want to oh need error yeah i keep messing up my control c for some reason uh if e thank you tab nine by the way if you guys don't know what tab nine is you definitely should because it's amazing um basically it's really awesome auto completion uh based off machine learning and it's contextual it's not like crappy copilot it's way better <laughs> uh, i love tab nine um you'll see completions like that from time to time where you'll see like i have like an lsp completion but then you see these like tns here these are all tab nine so tab nine actually does a really great job of doing things like this, where it's saying contextually like, Hey, I see that you're about to write an if statement. Are you actually trying to write an if error statement? And then you can just do something like that and boom, it'll auto complete it for you. Um, again, it's not trying to write the code for you. It's just simply saying, Hey, I noticed you were doing this. You might want to do this too. And it gets really good at it. You can do exclamation mark tab nine in chat, by the way, if you want to, see more about it um okay there we go so we want to return an error um and that's it we just want to run this is basically just like a run command so we've got the file got the client and we need the uploader now right so now what we can do is let's do s3 manager dot new upload with client s3 manager dot new upload with client and we will go to client like that um oh yeah i forgot we also have the <laughs> the year off thing so if you end up liking it you can get a year off um it's pretty nice or year half off sorry year half off that's what i meant to say all right so now we have an uploader uh upload like this uh s3 manager uploader uploader so service function part size okay cool uploader dot upload input upload input do you use the pro version or tab nine or just i use the pro version yeah so if we go to tab nine really quickly um so tab nine essentially uh has two options to it it has the free version and the pro version the free version essentially gives you everything out of the box except for things like uh in the pro version they actually connect to github and do indexing against your code for you um in the pro version they use a more advanced model in the cloud so it actually sends your code up to the cloud um or not your code, but parts of your code up to the cloud, basically contextual parts uh, for auto completion. You have to be okay with that. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I was about to say, you don't have to, you don't have, like, I'll be honest with you. It's so good at the pro version that like, I haven't downgraded just because I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to lose anything <laughs> um, because you don't like, you know, it's, it's all like AI and, or, you know, machine learning and stuff like that. So it's just, you're basically just getting better models, but I used the free version for a long time and I was just like you, I was like, I love this. This is super easy. Um, I ended up just buying the, the full version one day and just using, you know what I mean? Like I did, I guess what I mean to say is like, I didn't, uh, I didn't really have any rhyme or reason to trying it except for I just did. And then I was like, Oh, I really like this. And so I just kept paying for it and 
yeah at this point i've just i've just stuck with it i don't know um if it like i also know that the free version used to have like uh a little bit more limitations but i think they've gotten rid of like a like again you telling me that it's been working fine for you makes me fully believe that like any developer in this chat could probably use the free version and be completely fine with it um so yeah cannot use client why s3 i face s3 api wait i'm confused what is this thinking that this is supposed to give this so session must session where is the uh yeah new with client new s3 new s3 service oh well wait a minute but this is am i not using like the oh dude i'm using the old version dang it okay we got it okay i somehow got the v1 version in here i have wait is is there not a v2 version of this oh don't you dare tell me i can only use the v1 version with this thing oh crap uh sdk go upload yes but see this is the this is the old sdk we want the v2 one uh list tables s3 nope yo thank you for the follow appreciate you uh crap Oh, it's services, right? Services. Wait, what is it again? Service. Uh, okay, so it's GitHub, AWS, AWK, AWS, SDK, Go, V2. Yep. Slash service slash S3. How do they have this set up? Oh, here it is. Service. I was like, what? Uh, S3. All right, let's find S3. S3. Oh, wait, wait, wait. What was that? S3 control. S3 outpost. No. Nope delete oh crap upload part yeah you see this right here this upload part this is what basically the uploader uses <laughs> the upload manager it knows how to just use the specific parts um crap internal s3 testing endpoints no types so it would appear that this does not have the same interfaces that v2 has um shoot s3 client aws uh go v2 upload multi-part there's got to be a way of doing this. The pro version offers local only mode. Interesting. Hmm. S3 man. I mean, this is literally what we need. It's just, it's not in uh, the v2 and i'm wondering if we should use the v2 i mean it's the newest thing you know what i mean uh or we figure out a way of creating upload new multi-part upload new downloader new da, 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 da. s3 manager it's new downloader uploader here we go uploader with client new uploader client dot config provider maybe this is the one that we want let's try this really quickly maybe it's let's try this new uploader client dot config provider what Client config, AWS config, service name. Cl 
client config provider. So does that mean I'd have to do like config client? Oh crap, I'm overriding it. Uh, C, sure. Why not? Six, oh, whoops, three. C. Now again, this shouldn't work, but I wonder if I now do uh, client, S3 client, nope. Okay, so kube, AWS, go. It's got to be this one. Yeah. It looks like the only way I can do it is if I use the old. Yeah, if I use the old SDK. Yeah. Dang. Oh man. So wait, what what's what's the difference about the new SDK versus the old one? Like what is it just like they're deprecating it or something? For more information about Mana, uh, the Dynamo DB. Mm. Let's see if they've got anything in here on the uploader. Upload. S3 manager swallows abort. Oh, wait, hold on. Maybe there is a way to use it with the new one. Let's see how somebody's got this wired up. Perform an upload with the upload manager that results in a multi-part upload. What is this? Did I use AWS SDK Go? I mean, Reddit is pretty much always the way to go. So do they have anything in here about S3 transfer manager? The S3 transfer manager is available for managing uploads and oh, it's it's called now. Yep, yep. Okay. Okay. I was like, wait, it's got to be somewhere. So it's called manager. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So has been replaced with the manager new uploader. Ah, got it. Okay, so we're good. Yeah, I was like, dude, this makes no sense as to why it would be that difficult. So it's just manager. S3 manager. Okay, so what we want to do is, is we want to get rid of this and this, right? Because what we actually want to do is, is we should just have a manager. Okay, maybe it's not fully. Oh, I have to go. Wait, what? Oh, I have to go get it. Oh, we have to go get it. Okay. All right. All right. We got this chat. We got this. Not that bad. Not that bad. All right. So now we go here, right? Oh, no. We'll go to, what was it? Upload. Yeah. Upload. Um, and then manager. Hey, look at that chat. Boom. I love you guys. Nailed it. We did it. Perfect. Okay, cool. All right. We're moving forward now. Um, and look at that. The client works now. So, right. You see how that error is gone now? That's because... We don't have that that issue anymore. Um, cool. Okay. Dope. That was good. Thank you guys. I appreciate that. We did it. We did it. Okay. So, um, what else we got? Let's just get through these errors, man. I want to get through some of these errors. Uh, recording find. Okay. So this should be uh, file string, right? And then file, right? Um, and then okay, we're getting a little closer here. Uh, cannot use lookup on file string path string fs file wait what why don't you like that what are you actually trying to tell me uh value is type file as string and value assignment hmm? this is a string though or am i my messings oh because i'm renaming it yep okay duh 
Uh, all right, so we'll say F, I guess, for now, just to avoid the collision. Uh, all right, yep, perfect. Okay, and F is not declared. Okay, so the uploader, let's go here. Here's the new code. Uploader, new uploader. Okay, here we go. So, bam, look at this. Oh, so much. Okay, yeah, this is what we were looking for, Chad. <laughs> we, were, we were a little lost. We were a little lost. Um, okay, so here's the load default config. We're already doing that, right? We've already got all this. So here we are. Bam, new uploader. I'm almost wondering if we want to change... Hmm. You know what we could do? Instead of saying an S3 client... Well, this could be our uploader. Or upload, right? Hmm. Uh, we'll just keep it as run for now. Let's not over. Let's not overcomplicate it. Okay. So manager upload, uploader, and then manager dot new uploader. Create an uploader by passing a client. Create an uploader with the client and then Oh, we want this one. No, we want this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we want to be able to tune the size of the chunks that we send up. Right. We don't want to just do the like. We'll do the default to start, but if we can. We we got a little bit of throughput here, chat. We uh we got a little bit of throughput on our fiber connection, <laughs> so we're gonna try and give it a little bit more oom pow pow. Is this that fancy spangled new eight? Yep, totally, totally. <laughs> that that yep that high that hot dang fancy fancy HTMLs. I tell you what, I can give you old Hank Hill. Whoa. <laughs> uh, whoa. All right, um, uploader. So we need to give it not just the size, but I think we also u dot buffer provider client options concurrency. Ah, here we go. The default concurrency value will be used. The number of goer teams is spin up in parallel to call when set. Okay, so I think we're gonna set this to four because I think last time I did this, we set this to four. That means that we're gonna have four concurrent uploads per job all right you got me you got me so this is 64 megabit part that's fine we could do 64 megabits at a, or megabyte megabits bytes whatever at a time um and then the uploader dot upload takes context and then input and options uh upload an object intelligently buffering large files into smaller chunks yeah so this chat see this right here see this right here chat do you see this chat Ch look this is the only reason why we're using this stupid library <laughs> because it intelligently buffers the files and does everything else that you need it to. It's the only reason why we're using this stupid file <laughs> or this stupid library. Um, but yeah, that's, that's basically why. Um, all right. So we'll call this, uh, you, cause we're just like doing, no, we got to keep it uploader. So if that's the case, we're going to call this one, um, file path right so we can have some decency here and then we'll call this one file right and then uploader is that yep cool okay and then we'll do uploader dot upload right and then we want to give it context right so right now i'm just going to do the lazy thing which is just context to do <laughs> don't do this <laughs> um don't actually like like actually make context appropriately don't do it the way i'm doing it and then we need s3 put object input okay so what we're gonna do i thought i heard something is we're gonna say uploader input and then this will be s uh this will be a reference or a pointer to s3 dot uh what was it again <laughs> i lost it already no, I broke it because it doesn't like broken syntax. It's S3 put object input. Okay. So S3 dot put object input. Bam. Cool. Come on now. All right. And then bucket key, right? So we've got bucket. I'm just going to fill these with blanks for right now. Key, right? We need that. What else? Uh, bucket key. We don't need ACL body. 
That's an IO reader. It's an IO reader. Interesting. Is this actually wanting me to like buffer the file into memory? I think I might actually have to stream this chat. <laughs> Wait, if I use this new badge, can I still see it? Yeah. <laughs> I had an armchair de uh, dev. I let go for about 20 minutes explaining me HTML programming. It was an enjoyable experience. <laughs> uh, interesting. Okay, so... You know, I, I, I would have thought this would have been a string. This being an IO reader, I'm wondering if... I don't know if that's an actual buffer or not, though. Um, but we do need the the body. We need the the body <laughs> of it um string and literal struct so these are all references or pointers well that one's not that one is okay 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 so what we want to do here is we want to create key and this will be file dot name wait what how do I keep having file collisions? Dot. What? Is that because the, oh, duh. It's Cause it's a pointer. All right, key uh, file dot. Wait, what? Does this not give what I think it does or Yes. Yes. Okay. That's ah. Oh god. I just like completely nuked Neovim by accident. Um Shoot. Where was I? Oh my gosh, I'm so lost. No. Upload. Yeah, yeah. Wait, what? Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> uh, hey, hey, stop. Stop. All right, my cat's trying to rip off the stuff on my wall. Um, there's a swap file somewhere in here we need to get rid of. Where are you? Are you gone? Still running. Where? Alphonse. Cat's gonna make me get up and yell at him. Uh, PS, PS aux, grep, and vim. Oh, kill, uh, four, seven, five, wait, what is it? Four, seven, five, zero, four, three. What? No, four zero three. Dang dyslexia. Wait, what? Uh, kill dash nine. I said, die. <laughs> All right, there we go. All right, uh, upload. Uh, delete it. Fantastic. Cool. All right, now I got it back. Um. Oh, I should have just brought it into foreground. You're totally right. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. You gonna keep doing that? <laughs> Every time I look away, he just goes right back to doing it. <laughs> you little butt cheek. How cute is the cat? Do you want to see the cat chat? I can show you the. I can show you the boy. This is this is Alphonse chat. I'd say he's pretty cute. I'd say he's I'd say he's a pretty cute cat. Alphonse, do you have anything to say, buddy? 
he's shy now. He's like, I don't know what to do. There's so many people. You gotta be shy, buddy. This is yeah. This is Alphonse. He's a good boy. All right, go go go, go somewhere else. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's a good boy. He's a good boy. Uh, okay. So I don't understand fully why my auto completion is not working here. So if I were to do like key, right, and then file dot, like I I'm super confused on what is going on here. File. Yeah, like like I shouldn't be getting prints. <laughs> what in the world is happening here? FS file info. I mean, I know it's a pointer, but like, why, like what, what, what the heck is going on here? Why does this not like this? F is declared, but not used. Okay. What, what, what are we doing here? What are we doing? That's weird here. We're returning a pointer. Ah, I can stand you. Yeah. I get what you're saying. Express or evaluate it and then, yeah. I just like, I shouldn't have to do that here. You know what I mean? Like, I shouldn't. And so I'm wondering if, honestly, Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to rip this out. There's no need for this. It's 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 too simple. Um, let's just put this in the run for now. Yeah, we'll just do this. And if I feel like I need to do that later, I'll I'll do that. But we should be able to do that now. Right? Um Yeah. Okay. So this can be file path, right? This should be a file info, right? This should be a client, right? Yep. Uh, this should be client, right? Oops, client, right? Uh, this can go away, right? Uh, files declared but not used. Okay, so then we're gonna go down here. We're gonna say key file dot. Yeah, see, look, it's it's. I'm super confused at why the pointer was not allowing it to evaluate. Like, I don't get it. Um, I mean, again, like even what, like I. Oh, that's weird. Uh, hello, I need programming for uh, but I don't know what to do. Uh. Wait, what? <laughs> I am super I don't know what you're doing to be honest with you. I'm I'm equally as lost in your your conundrum, my friend. dot name. Yeah, I mean that's really it, right? And then we would just do like a pointer to this and then this is interesting. So what if I go here? Oh, that's right cuz you can't do that. Yeah, so we'd be like key. All right? Yeah, so now the key the key works properly. Yeah. I need a compiler for that message. Yeah, same. <laughs> yeah, same. I was like, uh what? <laughs> I was confused. All right, so here's our file path, right? Um, and then we need our bucket name, right? Because that's where we're gonna store it, right? And so we'll go here. Now these have gotta be it's interesting that like every one of these is a pointer. Um, I guess it is what it is, but yeah. So we'll say bucket, uh, bucket, uh, bucket. Oh, you know what? We don't even need to do that. We can just do that here. So pointer, come on, there we go. Bucket name, there we go. So now we just need to figure out what we're going to do with the body. The cat, the cat has a chair now. Sit. Yeah. No, he's already passed out on on a Toda's desk already.
Uh, <laughs> I think most of us just went, uh, y yeah. Um, I have no idea what you're trying to do, bud. Yeah, you you might need a little bit more context than uh, what you, what you're saying right now. I think I think most of us are lost in what you need help with. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you you'll you'll have to add a little bit more uh, details to it. I think. All right. Um. Cool. Okay, so now we're getting a little bit cleaned up. Now we got the key. We got the bucket. Right? We know that we've got the manager uploader set up the way that we want. It's going to be concurrent using four different parallel uploads. It's going to split those into 64 megabit chunks each for very good, uh, very good. Um, that could be it too as well. I Good call out. Good call out on that one. Uh, that's a good call out. I appreciate that actually heavily. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious. What is the name of the site you are using visual? Uh, it's called uh, Lucid. It's called Lucid. Yeah, Lucid. It'll show up in a second. It's just running behind a uh, Lambda. <laughs> or at least, yeah, there it is. There it is. There it is. Slowness, slowness is related, perhaps. Monitoring. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, no worries. No worries. Sorry, I was checking on stuff for work chat. All right, so we're getting closer. So, you know, again, this code isn't ready yet, but we are getting closer to our goal, right? Um, so when we archive run, we check for the file to see if it exists right if it doesn't exist or anything like that we return an error otherwise we create our s3 client right we generate an uploader and then we input the upload files or the upload data for the file now i think the thing that is interesting is they take an io reader so i'm guessing i'm gonna have to stream this data into the application which is interesting. Um, yeah, that's that's super interesting. Uh, okay, so let's do AWS S3 manager. Uh, uh, go. Let's see, I don't want that one. Yeah, this is the one we want. Yeah, V2. Okay. So uploader, upload context uh you can confirm you can configure the buffer size and concurrency through the upload parameters additional function functional options can be provided to configure individual upload these copies so forth and so on okay so that's great and all but like are you meaning to tell me that this actually needs to be it does an io reader okay uh, question, not sure if this answered before while I was here. How are you able to stream during the day, uh, during the week with your job? My company knows about it. <laughs> Excuse me. I almost like choked there. Uh, my company knows about it. Yeah. They, my company knows about it. So, um, they, uh, you know, they, they signed off on it. They're okay with me doing it. And to be fair, my job is more about just me getting my work done. And as long as I get my work done, it, it doesn't really matter. And they know also that there are days where like I I won't stream, you know what I mean? The company comes first. You know, like basically my job comes first. If I if I have to work, I work. I don't I don't stream, you know. Um but if I can stream, which I normally stream three times a week, you know, uh then Yeah. So it's it was just an agreement between us and you know, between me and them of like, hey, this is something I do, you know, I wanna keep doing it, I'm gonna keep doing it. Like I will make sure I, you know, do my part of the job getting it done. Um, AWS S3 stream. Yeah. Nope, not node. Go. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, they've been super understanding of everything. So I'm appreciative of that, you know? All right, so let's see how they're doing this. So look, our code's very similar, right? Except for the session stuff. We're not doing any of that um uploader dot upload right so body f ah okay open the file defer f close why are they not deferring the close that's all we need for a stream i guess that makes sense whoa wait a minute yes and you're absolutely right, Haspy. You're you're absolutely right. Yeah, they they also realize. Well, it's and it's not just a few things. It's not it's not just that, right? It's it's, you know, um, 
they're empowering me to get better at my job they're empowering me because i can also work on work stuff like there are definitely days where i work on work stuff as well uh we've just been busy with so much other stuff right now that um you know we we haven't had the ability or i haven't had the ability to uh do a lot of work stuff on stream but um yeah no i mean i'm also able to do work stuff and it doesn't you know it's it's not that big of a deal But yeah, no, they're they're super cool about it. Sorry, I got distracted for a second. Um, is this really it? You can upload to stream the file. Uh, if you read the comments in the source code, you can also figure part. Yeah, so, but like, hold on. Wait, what? No, I'm confused. Wait, what? <laughs> Doesn't this buffer the whole thing into memory? Like, seriously? Like, like I'm <laughs> Hold on. So read fi Okay, look, look, look. Okay, perhaps the most basic file reading task is slurping the tiles constants into memory. Read file. Okay, so that's read file. Ah, here we go. Here we go. Okay. You'll want more control over what uh okay, so open does oh uh, wait, what? For those tasks, start by opening a file to contain an OS. Oh, okay. So op okay, so no, no, no. Open just creates a file descriptor. Okay. So that that's what we want. Okay. Okay. So it creates a file descriptor. And then we can start reading from it. So I'm guessing what happens is the open gets read and then the client starts reading it. Okay. So yeah, no, we're okay. We're okay. We're okay. Yeah, it would buffer. Uh, it would it would handle the stream appropriately. The open would handle the stream appropriately the way that we want. Okay, cool. All right. So let's do that. Let's do... Now, one thing I will say is, is I normally don't try and copy too much. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I try and at least get the muscle memory when I search for things like this. So um, yeah. It is a little misleading. Yeah, it is a little misleading. The read all or whatever is, I guess, I guess it's read versus open, right? But it, it is a little misleading. Yeah, I don't disagree. Uh, body error. So FS open, right? FS dot. Dude, what? Oh, it's OS, not FS. Oops. OS dot open. And then we want to open the file path right because we said that this is statable right um but we want to give it the whole path the complete path to open it i don't know if file provides yeah see file just gives us the name of it and like specific file stuff yeah um <laughs> yeah yeah no i was i I work in so many different languages that I mess up the, uh, the name sometimes. Uh, my workmates had a process that took four hours because they were opening and closing. Oh, geez. Yeah, no, you gotta be, dude, you gotta be careful about that. And normally it'll happen to you once, right? Like it all, it all happened. Like that's, that's almost like, like doing something like that is like a, uh, what is it? Like a rite of passage in engineering, right? Where you go like, okay, I now know how to mess with files. I'm never going to DDoS the servers and RAM again. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like it, ha it happens to the best of us. It all it happens once or twice to you know to to all of us. But yeah, that's funny. That I mean that sucks to be honest with you. That's that's a terrible terrible thing to have to deal with. But uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so then we go here and we should just be able to do upload or input just like that. And then look at that chat. We are no longer we don't have any broken stuff in this uh in this thing right here so look so we have our archive run right so what is our archive run doing well it's first checking to see if the file exists if the file exists then uh we move forward otherwise if there's any reason why it doesn't or it can't find the file it kicks out right then and there we then open up an s3 client right and then we create an uploader from that. Now, like, like what I guess I would kind of say is, is like, this can stay here. 
you know i think that's fine all of this right i think all of this could be brought into a a a custom function right like like we could we could bring all of this into like a like basically have this return the uploader right with the file content and everything ready so that we could just do uploader dot uploaded and be done with it you know what i mean so i think i think this is a good thing to eventually refactor right now i'm not i'm not super worried about it though um cool and then uploader dot upload now so we've got manager upload output and error so i guess what we could do is we could say output error right like that say if uh again tab nine coming in coming in hot giving us that sweet auto completion we love uh return error look at that tab nine even knows that i want to return the error um now output i would love to know okay so result open result file uploaded to so how do you do the next thing i want to know is how do you do and go yeah 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 no we're not we're not going to be running this because i don't want to i don't want to affect the, the the stream right now i'm, I'm going to run this off stream <laughs> um yeah no i i we have we have fiber but i still have to send it through one 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 ethernet so yeah i need to be careful about that i could start running it and then immediately just start destroying the stream <laughs> um so up output so what is this output supposed to be? I'm wondering. Request charge values. Oh, so this is like the complete complete list of parts that were uploaded and the checksums. So this doesn't seem to really give us anything related to the actual ongoing thing. So let's see if maybe. Hmm how do we process or how do we get this like all we really need now is just the status right like we just want to know wait what oh that's a different answer i was like what the heck you probably just need the id to retrieve it later yeah possibly um i keep like going to the the main uh, like uploader thing and then just closing it because i'm a big old dummy um aws sdk v2 uh, S3 manager go. <laughs> there we go. Look at that. I found it first time, chat. I'm a friggin' Google magic person. Um, <laughs> with, with uploader request options. No, that doesn't seem right. Mm, 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 mm. Mm. let's go to the actual source code i want to see the repository uh it's neovim oh here it is okay so let's do this let's say manager progress Providing mechanism. Oh my gosh. Uh, okay. A similar issue was open in 2006 against V1 issue, but never properly addressed. Consider a situation where upon a device wants to upload a rather small amount of data um, over a slow network. We can use the manager for this, which handles unbound uh, as a body type. The customary method of measuring the process on the side will not be helpful outright. The uploader will simply read the entire data of the part buffer and then spend some long time writing this data onto the network, keeping the user in the dark regarding on the process. Yeah. Oh man. Seriously. Oh, did that not wait? What is it? Vim? What do, do I, do we really not have a editor? Oh, I guess we don't have an, a Neo Vim thing <laughs> um oh man dude this was this is a year old bro <laughs> come on goku come on man you're, you're you're representing goku here bro oh it's neo vim thank you thank you there we go it's neo vim uh also python api does it properly <laughs> of course so i'm gonna be real with you chat this is where i would be like python's better um 
you know, I'm trying to solve a problem of automation here. I don't really massively care about the language that it's in, right? But I do care about having the good, you know, the best support that I can possibly have for like, you know, being able to upload things that like all this stuff. Now it sucks because like, it kind of means that like my language is a bit dependent on what packages and stuff I'm using, but like, it's kind of true, you know, like this sucks that like, okay. So how do like, how am I, why would I want to code with this pain? Yeah, no, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Like I'm, I'm being honest with you. Like it's, it's a total flip of the, you know, it's a total flip of the coin. Um, this is a scenario where Python would actually probably be easier because Python's probably got way better support for all this crap and whatever. Um, okay. With not, yeah, look, look with non Golang SDKs, we support a callback function to get the data that's sent. Uh, we'd like to be able to do the same thing. Dang, that sucks, dude. That actually sucks. Um, can I try implementing a similar issue? Please implement this. I mostly C sharp. Don't even mind. No, dude. I mean, here's the thing, right? What, like, listen, chat, write what you like. Seriously. If you are in the engineering business because you want to be sought upon as somebody who is like prolific or whatever, for starters, you're in it for the way wrong business. If you care about what anybody actually thinks about your editor or your configure, like basically if they care about anything but the, the output that you're doing, then they really just need to shut the f up. Like it seriously, like it's just, that's the reality of the things that are really important in engineering. Like if I go up to my manager and I'm like, Hey, I'm going to use Vim instead of NeoVim. And he just look at me like, okay, I don't care. <laughs> like, uh, are you doing a good job? Okay, cool. You know, like that's, that's the reality of business. Now we like, you know, compare, you know, things, uh, because we like are competitive and stuff and nerds and whatnot. But like, seriously, every single person in this, in this, you know, chat needs to, be able to also put that sword down for a second and be like, no, it's actually about building good software. <laughs> it's not about editors and, you know, uh, other crap like that. Like if you can't do that, then I don't really know if I can call you a good engineer. Uh, interesting. Current with the go, the only option is to wrap the reader APIs to do a wrap the reader APIs to do, uh, uh, calculation based on purely local speeds oh that sucks uh i do it for getting more yeah no listen and that's the equipment but like here's the thing and i'm going to be fair with you on this one zachary same thing with me right like i'm using nix right i'm using neovim what does that make like what is that equivalent for me it means that i'm like a dad hanging out in his garage like working on his car like i'm serious like that that like yes there are people who go that in depth with building cars right but some people don't. Some people work at a garage or at a you know at an auto body shop and they go home and don't work on cars. Some people do. Like it's it's the exact same thing. It's the exact same thing. You know, just use what what works best for you. You know, and if you want to keep hacking on that car, you know, keep you know customizing it and all, then then yeah, do it. But they both drive. You know what I mean? Like you don't need a Ferrari to cross the street, man. I guess you could have one if you wanted, but. Seems like a lot of work just to get to a car. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And again, it's fun to like, you know, whatever, uh, and, and, you know, bring up these fun convert. Cause you know, again, like a lot of, a lot of the stuff, like you guys see me using Nick's and the all go like, Ooh, wow. You know, like, and it's just like, it's cool. Like, cool. I'm, I'm glad to hear you're interested in it, but that doesn't mean like you should use it, you know? Like, like, you know, prime, hopefully, hopefully, I hope he doesn't, to be honest with you, because I, it is a time sink. Nick's OS is a time sink. I sank a lot of my time getting my, sh my stuff moved over and like neglected quite a bit of other things <laughs> to do it. So, you know, like, yeah, it's like, you don't need to do that. If you've already got something that works like my dot files, my automation dot files, right? Like this thing here, the Ansible one is a perfect solution. It's totally fine. And it will easily solve every problem that, oh, why did that go out twice? That's interesting. Hmm. We're getting two, we're getting two 
messages. Uh, hang on. Okay, I don't know why the bot's duplicating messages, but I'm gonna have to figure out later because I guess for some reason I don't have the uh, context to my current Kubernetes cluster. So I'll have to do it in a minute when I get offline. Um, all right, well, shit. This is a bit of a bummer. There is, even in this S3 manager, which again, does do what I want it to, I, it appears I do not have a way of getting the status easily at least um that is a big issue <laughs> uh it's not a massive issue but it's it's definitely a challenging one um dude it, this is two years old are you kidding me how does stuff like this go by okay so i gotta be real the only thing i can think of here is is that people are making decisions to not use this software Right? Like, we've all got to be on the same page with that, right? How does something go like this, especially like where, like, something as simple as status callbacks not being fixed in two years, bro? Like, seriously? Don't worry about the double command. It's bugged right now. So you're good. That's not you. Like, how, how is this possible? Like, I, like, listen, I'm somebody who manages their own open source. How do you make the beep? What do you mean? Like that? <laughs> um, it's just a beep button. I have a beep button. Uh, I use a Go XLR. So yeah, I'm just really good at bleeping myself because you know sometimes, man, you just got to be really good at that before you realize that you might be off words. You know what I mean? Uh, can you use a different lib? <laughs> uh, maybe. I mean, maybe. I, or I could write it myself, right? That that would probably like, but then that just means I'm rebuilding the manager. Oh, Linode time. No, 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 chat. No, 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 no. Um, damn it. Dude, there's already so much work that's been done writing this thing. Like, here's the thing. There's actually, I shouldn't say that. There's not been a lot of work that's been done writing this in Go. Like, if I wanted to, I could move this to Python. I'm not even kidding. I'm just thinking about moving it to Python or Node. Um, because you got to remember, chat, what is, like, what is the real problem here, right? I need to make sure that I'm building a CLI that fully supports what I need, right? Now, I don't want to, like, switch the language underneath the hood, but the only reason why I'm even open to the idea is because it's not a lot of code. Right, like realistically, this command line is just these files here, right? Setting up the CLI and its arguments. That's not that difficult. And then it's like, like, look, look, it's it's uh, four files here, and then like one file in each of these folders. Um, I I want to, I want to. It's just like, I, honestly, Litany. The only challenge here is I've already been working on this for a week. I need to get this done now. And again, part of my job is knowing how to build things effectively quickly. And I'm failing right now and not building this quickly. I need to get it done quicker than I wanted to. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the challenge here is, is like, you know, if I keep it in go, I'm really just building it for myself right now. Unless I, again, unless, I, unless I implement this, right. Unless I implement this which like i don't know if i have time to do that right now it sucks that there's multiple issues about this open and i almost um oh, yeah dude look at this provide mechanism add upload bytes to output uh could we do uh yeah they're all just linking to each other <laughs> uh they're all just linking to each other i'm migrating da, 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 using s3 man oh you know what i think we could use this you need to be confident with dumping a lot of work if you realize you're stuck. Yeah, no, you you definitely do, but you we might be okay actually. I forgot about MinIO's Go Live, so we might be able to use Min. We might might chat be able to use theirs, right? So this could probably be our. <laughs> I love that how they put in like fake stuff here. Um, 
I think this is our only really other option. Again, or making it custom. I'm going to be real. There's not a massive value of keeping this in, in Go at, at the moment. There's a lot of reasons why I put it in Go, but there's not really a lot of math. But again, if we could do something like this, then I think we'd be okay. Compromise solutions in my company. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So yeah, so there's a solid chance we could use this. AWS S3 new. Okay, yeah, yeah, look, 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 look. Okay, so we can at least connect to S3 via this way. Dude, I bet you, <laughs> you know what would be hilarious? Is if, uh, <laughs> is if this is just a better Go project. <laughs> put object, copy object, remove. Okay, so what if we go to put object? Put object uploads that are less than two, uh, uh, are in a single. Op oh, dude, look at this, dude. Look at this. Oh my god. All right, so we're probably gonna need to use the min IO one. Look at this. For objects that are greater than 120 megabyte, put object seamlessly uploads these into 121. Oh, you guys can't see this. There you go. Right here. Look at this. Look at this. Put object. Look at this. Does exactly already seamlessly uploads to 128 megabits or more, depending on the actual size, and the max file size is five terabytes. Yeah. Now can we progress? <gasps> okay, we're keeping it in go. We're good. We're good. We're just going to use this client instead of the terrible AWS one. That sucks, man. That that's a bit of a bummer. Yeah, okay. So we'll just use the minio one. Yeah, we'll use the minio one and then we'll just get it from there. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. All right, guys, I got to call it. We've been going for five and a half hours, almost six hours. Um, I hope today has been enlightening. I hope you guys have been able to learn some cool stuff. As always, I'm going to give you guys what I normally do, which is the agenda for today. So remember, if you are new to our community, be sure to check. Okay, you're going to get double commands here. So, whoa, we're getting triple. Oh, God, I'm going to spam chat right now. I apologize. I'll fix that later. I don't know what's going on. I'm guessing Twitch is doing like deployments. I bet you Twitch is doing 5 p.m. deployments on a Friday, dude. Now my services are getting kicked and getting all disconnected. And <laughs> um, but if you're new to our channel, be sure to check out that little blurb right there. We are a variety channel hosted by myself, BG, as well as my good friend, Atota. If you'd ever want to hang out with us in the off air, we have a fantastic community in our Discord. You can click any of the three links that you just saw. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you're well, if you'd like to, we have many program or many different channels here around our community. Whether you want to hang out and do real life stuff or talk about DevOps programming, technology, we've got Vim, all that good stuff as well. So feel free to check out that, be a part of the community. Um, I also have the wiki. Remember, we have the wiki as well. This is a place where I put the VODs at the end of each stream so that you guys have what we did and you can go back through it. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to post today's agenda. Go here, input table of contents. Uh, the name of it was this. All right. Reviving recording pipeline part three. And then the last thing we need to do is grab our VOD from today. Don't worry, we're going to raid somebody chat. So be sure to stick around while I can... Well, I can set this up for you. Remember, I give you guys this at the end of every stream so that you can immediately get any of this content for you. Um, remember as well, we also do upload our VODs to YouTube. So we do have a couple YouTube channels. Our main YouTube, oh, our main YouTube channel is for all of our educational content, all of the content that really is just for YouTube. So if you haven't, be sure to check out the dot files video I showed on how to automate your dot files setup, uh, as well as our whole complete series on our Azure cloud migration. Uh, there might be some future sponsored streams coming here soon chat. So get excited for that. And let me put it to you this way. No, this time it's not going to be Microsoft. <laughs> we have been talking to a few other com or a few other companies as well, which we're pretty excited about. So yeah, get get hyped on that stuff. Um, outside of that chat, I think we're pretty good to go. Uh, let me just do this really fast. Boop. Let me save. Oh, oops. Hold on. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. How did I do that? Okay, here we go. Create topic. Today's the 10th. Today's the 10th, right? Yep. All right, chat. Here you go. Here is the 
wiki article from today. If you guys want to catch the VOD or anything like that, be sure to check out that wiki article. Like I said, these do get, <laughs> once we have our recording pipeline back online, uh, these do get uploaded to YouTube as well. So be sure to check out the YouTube uh, if you want to, if you want to see any of our past VODs. Again, that is the Alta for Archives. Um, and then we also have some social media. So if you ever want to chat on social media, hit me up, ask me anything, be sure to to check us out on the uh, the tweeters. But uh, all right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and call it here. That should be everything. I am leaving you with what essentially we have done today. Again, we also had some Nick's conversations and stuff like that. So be sure to check out the VOD for all of that. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we stream three times a week normally. I try and stream Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays if possible. Um, but there are times where I'm not able to. So we stream you know, intermittently throughout the week. Um, yeah, be sure to check out the Discord. You'll know when, you know, when when I'm going live and all that good stuff. Um, but yeah, let me find us uh, somebody to raid here. Just give me one second. Um, let's see here. Who can we raid? Uh, is there anybody doing DevOps? That's the first question I have to ask myself. <laughs> anybody doing DevOps? Mm -mm -mm. Why is nobody ever doing DevOps but me, man? I'm the only person who ever does DevOps. Ah, uh, farts. Okay. All right. Let's see who else we can raid here. Have a lovely rest of your street. You as well. You guys have a fantastic rest of your weekend. Again, I hope to see you in the Discord. All that good stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know who to raid. So we're just going to go raid Large Data Bank. If you guys don't know who Large Data Bank is, he's an awesome, awesome, awesome person. He works in the database sector. If you guys have ever heard of a sweet little uh, database called Cockroach uh, DB, he actually works on that. And he's in Go. He's working in Go. So if you guys want to go see some more Go stuff, let's go raid Large Data Bank. You guys have a fantastic rest of your evening. Again, be sure to join the Discord. I hope to see you guys in there. We can chat about all sorts of good stuff as well as the YouTube and the social. Sorry for spamming our channel. I have no idea what's going on. I'll fix that later. Have a great weekend, guys. Love you. Enjoy it. Enjoy Large Data Bank stream. Adios.